17. Gideon Sullivan should give lessons on payback, Cleo decided. He should write a goddamn book on it. How to make your lover feel like slime in ten easy lessons. But there was no way she was going to break. He could be cold, she'd be colder. He could speak in monosyllables. Well then, she'd communicate in grunts. If he thought the fact that he'd chosen to sleep on the stupid roof rather than share a piece of the bed with her hurt her feelings, he'd miscalculate it. She wished it had rained buckets. They used the subway, which was, Cleo thought, the perfect venue for a stony silence. She sat with her well-developed New York stare into middle distance while he read a tattered paperback edition of Ulysses. Guy should lighten up, she thought to herself. Anybody who chose of his own free will to read James Joyce for pleasure wasn't her type anyway. He probably figured she'd never cracked a book in her life. Well, he was wrong. She liked to read as much as the next guy, but she didn't choose to spend her spare time wading through some metaphoric jungle of depression and despair. She'd just leave that to Slick, who was so goddamn Irish he probably bled green. She got to her feet at their stop. Gideon simply marked his place in the book and shuffled off the car with her. She was too busy sulking to notice how his gaze swept over the others who got off, or the way he angled his body to shield hers. He followed her through the tunnels to the crosstown train. He stood patiently on the platform while she tapped her foot, shifted her weight. Don't think we were followed, he said quietly. She nearly jolted at the sound of his voice which irritated her enough that she forgot to grunt in response. Nobody knows where at is, so they can't follow us. They may not know where at is, but someone might be watching her building. I wouldn't want to lead them to her or let them scamper along after us. He was right, and it reminded her she'd led someone to Mikey. Maybe I should just throw myself in front of the next oncoming train. Maybe that would be enough penance for you. That's a bit over the top and self-defeating. At least until you get the statue out of the bank. It's all you ever wanted, anyway. The platform vibrated with the sound of the crosstown train. It must comfort you to think that. She shoved herself blindly into the subway car, all but hurled herself into a seat. He took one across from her, opened his book, began to read, and kept reading when the ride bumped and juggled the words on the page. There was no point in arguing with her, he reminded himself, every reason not to do so in public. The priority was to get to the bank, retrieve the fate, get it back to Tia's, quietly and unobtrusively. After that, a good shouting row might be in order, though he could hardly see what good it would do. Despite the enforced intimacy, they were at the base strangers, two people from different places with different ideas and different agendas. If he'd let himself think of them as more, had let his feelings for her tangle up with the reality of things, that was his problem. His primary quest, so to speak, had been Lachesis, and so shortly that part of the journey would end. He wished he could go back to Cove, back to the boatyard and work off some of this excess energy and heat by scraping hulls or some damn thing. But the second fate was only one of three and he had a feeling it would be some time before he saw home again. He felt her move, caught the flash of the blue shirt she'd borrowed from his brother as she rose onto those endless legs of hers. He got up, shoved the book in his jacket pocket. She strode onto the platform and away as if she were in a great hurry. But then, as everyone else did the same, Gideon doubted anyone would take notice. She practically flew through the streets as he scurried after her. When she reached for the door of the bank, he forgot his vow not to touch her, and his hand closed over hers. You walk in there ready to chew a hole in somebody's neck. People are going to notice. This is New York, Slick. Nobody notices nothing. Chill it down, Cleo. You want a round with me? Then we'll have one. But right here and right now, chill it down. She decided, right there and right then, that the one thing she hated most about him was that he was able to cut through the crap and maintain. Fine. She offered him a frozen smile, all chilled. I'll wait out here. He stepped back from the door. He watched the traffic, cars, and people. He saw no one who appeared to be interested in him, and had just reached the conclusion that anyone who opted to live in a place with so many people and so much noise was either brain-damaged or would be before it was done when Cleo came out again. 
She nodded to him, tapped her fingers lightly on her shoulder bag. He moved in so the bag and its most recent contents were tucked between their bodies. We'll take a cab back. Fine, but we're making a stop. Tia lent me two hundred. I need some damn clothes. This isn't the time to shop. I'm not shopping. I'm buying. I'm desperate enough to settle for the gap, and that's going a ways for me. We can hike over to Fifth. She was already heading in that direction, giving him no choice but to follow. Then we'll be sure nobody's telling us. I grab a couple of shirts, some jeans. We catch a cab and we're home. Then I might just burn the clothes I've been stuck with since Prague. He might have argued, but was a man who knew how to weigh his options quickly. He could drag her into a cab, then sit on her until they got back to Tia's, or he could give her a half hour to do what she felt she needed to do. I hate it in here. She muttered the minute they were inside. It's so pert. She headed for Black. He kept so close to her side. Cleo was tempted to grab something and head to a dressing room just to see if he'd come in with her. She wouldn't put it past him. Trust was obviously not the word of the day. She got what she considered the absolute bare essentials: two T-shirts, a long-sleeved tee, jeans, one sweater, one shirt, all black. Then watched the total ring up to two hundred twelve dollars and fifty-eight cents. Arithmetic isn't your long suit, is it? He asked when she swore under her breath. I can add, I wasn't paying attention. She dug out what she had and was still eight dollars and twenty-two cents short. Give me a break, will you? He gave her a ten, then held out his hand for the change. It's less than two bucks. She slapped the money into his hand, swung the bag over her free shoulder. I'm busted. Then you should take more care with how you spend what you have. Mind you, take the eight and twenty-two off what I owe you for the air bobs. I'll spring for the taxi. You're a real sport, slick. If you want to be kept by a man, you'll have to look elsewhere. I'm sure you'll have no problem finding one. She said nothing to that, could say nothing over the ball that lodged in her throat. Instead, with him gripping her arm, she marched to the curb and shot out a hand for the cab. I'll apologize for that. Shut up, she managed. Just shut up. We both know what you think of me, so just drop it. When her head was clear again, she'd thank whatever god of the despairing had a free cab veering to the curb at her feet. She climbed in, snapped out Tia's address. You don't know what I think of you, and neither do I. He let that be the last of it during the ride. She'd have walked straight into her temporary bedroom when they entered the apartment, but Gideon stopped her. Let's see the statue first. You want to see it? She shoved her purse into his stomach hard enough to knock the breath out of him. Go ahead. She made it halfway across the room when she stopped dead. Look, Cleo. She held up a hand, shook her head frantically. His stomach, already suffering, took a fast dive as he imagined her weeping. But when she turned, her wide, foolish grin had him narrowing his eyes. Quiet. She hissed it out in a whisper, jerked a thumb toward Tia's bedroom. They're in there. Who? Visions of Anita Gay or one of her muscle men burst in his brain. Cleo had to leap in front of him. Jesus, Slick, open your ears. He heard it then, the quick, strangled cry that could only mean one thing. When dumbfounded curiosity sent him a few steps closer, he caught the unmistakable sounds of a mattress squeaking. Well, Christ! He dragged a hand through his hair and had to swallow a laugh. What the hell are we supposed to do now? He whispered it, finding himself grinning back at Cleo. I can't just stand out here listening to my brother going at it with Tia. It's mortifying. Yeah, mortifying. Snickering, she all but pressed her ear to the bedroom door. I think they've got a ways to go yet, unless your brother's one of those get on, get in, get off, get out sort of guys. I wouldn't have any way of knowing, and I'd as soon not find out. We'll go up on the roof for a bit. Go, Tia, Cleo murmured. As they headed toward the front door, she managed to hold off the laughter until they were safely in the elevator heading up. Do you think they heard us? I don't think they'd have heard a nuclear blast. Cleo caught her breath and walked out with him to take the steps to the roof. She walked into the sunlight, 
dropped into a chair and kicked out her long legs, then felt her mood dip again when Gideon opened her purse. The moment of shared amusement was over, and it was back to business. He pulled out the fate, held it up so it glinted and gleamed. Not much of a thing, he commented. Pretty and often canny, too, when you take a moment to examine the details. You've let it get tarnished. It was a lot worse before. It's still only one of them. His gaze shifted, studied the sun flash on her dark glasses. It's one Anita doesn't have, and we do. The middle one, the one who measures. How long would this life be, she might think? Fifty years, five, eighty-nine and three quarters? And what will be the measure of this life, indeed? Do you ever think of that? No, thinking about it doesn't change it. Doesn't it? He turned the statue over in his hand. I think it does. Thinking about it, pondering over what you'll do, what you won't, those are layers to a life. And while you're thinking about it, you get run over by a bus, and so what? He leaned back against the wall, studying her as she sat among pots of flowers, pots of greenery. Is that why you didn't tell me you had it? Because it's nothing more than a means to an end to you, without any meaning at all. You plan to sell it, don't you? We do. But it's not just money I'm holding in my hand. Now more than ever, it's not. I'm not going to talk about Mikey. Her voice went thin and quivered before she clamped down and steadied it. And I'm not going to apologize again for playing it the way I did. You got what you wanted out of me, and some heat in the sheets. Besides, you've got no complaints. He stood, fate curled in his hand. And what did you get, Cleo? I got the hell out of Prague. She leaped to her feet. I got home, and I've got the potential for enough money to keep the wolf from my throat for a good long time. Because whatever you think, I'm not looking to whore myself so some guy will pave the way for me. I stripped, okay, but I didn't turn tricks. And I'm not stupid enough to let some guy fuck me over and leave me broke and stranded again like I was after Sydney. Who's Sydney? Just another bastard in the perpetual lineup I seem to attract. Can't blame him though, since I was the one who was stupid. He came on to me and I fell for it. Told me how he was part owner of this theater in Prague, how they were putting together a show and looking for a dancer, an American dancer who could choreograph and was willing to invest. What he wanted was a patsy and some free nookie. With me, he got two for one. She tucked her thumbs in her front pockets because what she wanted to do was hug herself hard and rock. He wanted to get back to Europe, and I was his ticket. I sprang for the freight because what the hell? I wanted to try something new. I wasn't making a name for myself here, so I'd make one over there. The more bullshit he pumped out, the more I bought. Were you in love with him? Yeah, you're a bone deep romantic. She tossed her hair back, walked to the wall. Dark hair streaming back, eyes shielded by sunglasses, lips curled in a cynical twist. He was great to look at, and he had a real smooth line. Lines always sound just a little smoother with an accent. I was gone over him, which is different from being in love. And I was all wrapped up in the idea of someone giving me a shot at choreography. A shot at something she thought now she could be good at. So I lived the high life in Prague for a few days, then woke up one morning to find he'd cleaned me out. Took my money, my credit cards, left me with a whopping hotel bill I couldn't pay until I pawned the watch and couple rings I was wearing. Did you go to the police, the embassy? Jesus, Gideon, what color is the sky in your world? He was gone, long gone. I reported the credit cards stolen, packed up, and got a job. And I learned a lesson. When something sounds too good to be true, it's because it's a big fat lie. Lesson number two: Look out for number one. First, last, always. Maybe you should learn one more. He turned the fate so its face shone like the sunlight. If you don't believe in something, in someone, what's the fucking point? Downstairs in the apartment, Tia snuggled up against Malachi and thought about taking a nap. Just a short one, a cat nap, as she felt very like a cat at the moment, one with a belly full of cream. You have the loveliest shoulders, he told her. They should always be naked. You never want to cover these up with clothes or hair. 
Anita said, men like long hair on a woman. The name spoiled his dreamy mood and had his mouth tightening. Don't think about her just now. We'd best get up and see if Gideon and Cleo are back. Back? She sighed, started to stretch. Back from where? Oh, my God. She sat up straight, too shocked to think about snatching sheets to cover herself. It's eleven o'clock. Something must have happened to them. What were we thinking? She scrambled out of bed, picked up her hopelessly wrinkled blouse and stared at it, mildly horrified. If you come back here a minute, I'll show you what we were thinking. This is completely irresponsible. She pressed the blouse to her breasts and back toward her closet for a fresh one. What if something's happened to them? We should go out and look for them, or... She broke off when her bell rang. That must be them now. Relief was so huge, she grabbed a robe rather than her blouse and bundled hurriedly into it as she dashed for the door. Thank God, I was so worried. Mother. Tia, how many times have I told you, even when you look through the peephole, you should always, always ask who's there? She aimed a kiss an inch above Tia's cheek as she sailed in. You're ill. I knew it. No, I'm not ill. Don't tell me. She pressed a hand to Tia's forehead. Flushed and in your robe in the middle of the day. Your eyes are heavy, too. Well, I'm on my way to the doctor, so you can come with me. You take my appointment, dear. I'll never forgive myself otherwise. I'm not sick. I don't need to see the doctor. I was just... Lord, good Lord, she thought. What could she say? We'll just get you dressed. I have no doubt, none whatsoever, that you picked up some strange foreign virus while you were traveling. I told your father as much this very morning. Mother. Tia hurtled over a footstool, and with the skill of a tight end, did a fast lateral rush in front of the bedroom door. I feel absolutely, perfectly well. You don't want to miss your appointment, do you? You look a little pale. Have you been sleeping well? When have I ever? Alma smiled her martyr's smile. I don't think I've had more than an hour's rest at a time since you were born. Why, it took all my reserves just to get dressed this morning. I'm sure my platelets are low. I'm just sure of it. You tell the doctor to test them, Tia urged, as she pulled her mother to the door. What's the point? They won't tell you when you're really sick, you know. I need to sit down a while. I'm getting palpitations. Oh, then I, I think you should hurry to the doctor. I, I think you need to... She broke off, sagged when the door opened to Gideon and Cleo. Uh, well, hmm, you're back. These are associates of mine, Mother. Associates? She scanned the faded jeans, the gap bag Cleo still carried. Yes, yes, we're working on a project together. In fact, we were just about to... You're working in your robe? Alma demanded. Busted, Cleo said under her breath but one of Alma's many complaints wasn't her hearing. Just what does that mean? Just what is going on here? Tia, I demand an explanation. That's a bit delicate. Malachi stepped out of the bedroom. He, too, wore jeans and a smile that could have melted an iceberg at twenty yards. He'd tossed on a shirt, then deliberately left it unbuttoned. There were times he'd calculated the truth served best. I'm afraid I distracted your daughter while our associates were out. He crossed over, took Alma's hand, and shook it gently. Completely unprofessional of me, of course, but well now, what could I do? She's so lovely. I see now where she gets it. He lifted the hand he still held to his lips while Alma stared at him. I've been completely undone by your daughter, Mrs. Marsh, since first we met. He draped an arm over Tia's stiff shoulders and kissed her lightly on the cheek. But I'm embarrassing her, and you as well. I'd hoped to meet you and Tia's father under less awkward circumstances. Alma's eyes rushed from Malachi's face to her daughter's, and back again. Almost any would be less awkward. He nodded, adding as much sheepishness as he could manage. Can't argue with you there. Hardly a good beginning to get caught with your pants down by the lady's mum before you've exchanged how-do-you-do's. I can only tell you, I'm enchanted by your daughter. As gracefully as possible, Tia slipped out from under his arm. Maybe you could step into the kitchen for a moment, all of you, so I could have a word with my mother. 
if you like. Malachi cupped her chin, lifted it, until their eyes met. It should be as you like. He touched his lips to hers, lingering over it before he followed the others into the kitchen. I demand an explanation, Alma began. I think an explanation is superfluous under the circumstances. Who are those people and what are they doing in your apartment? Their associates, mother, friends, were working together on a project. And having orgies every morning? No, that was just today. What's come over you? Strangers in your home, strange Irishmen in your bed in the middle of the morning? I knew nothing good would come of your running off to Europe. I knew there would be terrible consequences. No one would listen to me, and now look. Terrible consequences. Mother, what's so terrible about me having friends? What's so dire about there being a man who wants to go to bed with me in the middle of the morning? I can't get my breath. Alma clutched at her chest and dissolved into a chair. There's a tingling down my arm. I'm having a heart attack. Call 911. Stop it. You can't call an ambulance every time we disagree, every time I take a step away, every time... She added, crouching at her mother's feet. I do something just for me. I don't know what you're talking about. My heart. Your heart's fine. You've got the heart of an elephant, and every doctor you find tells you the same thing. Look at me. Mother, can't you just look at me? I cut my hair, Tia said quietly. You haven't even noticed because you weren't looking. All you see when you look at me is a sickly little girl, someone who can keep you company at the doctor's and give you an excuse for a nervous disposition. What a horrible thing to say. Shock had Alma forgetting all about the possibility of cardiac arrest. First you take up with some strange man, and now you say horrible things to me. You've joined a cult, haven't you? No. Unable to help herself, Tia lowered her head to her mother's knee and laughed. No, I haven't joined a cult. Now I want you to go downstairs. Your driver's waiting for you. Go to your appointment. I'll come see you and father very soon. I'm not sure I'm well enough to get to the doctors on my own. I need you to come with me. I can't. Gently, Tia drew Alma to her feet. I'm sorry. If you want, I'll call father and ask him to meet you there. Never mind. Wrapping martyrdom around her like a stole, Alma walked to the door. Obviously, nearly dying in childbirth and devoting my life to your health and well-being aren't enough to have you give me an hour of your time when I'm ill. Tia opened her mouth then swallowed the placating, agreeable words. I'm sorry. I hope you feel better soon. Boy, she's good. Cleo came out of the kitchen the instant she heard the front door close. I mean, she's the champion, hey. She walked over to hook an arm around Tia's waist. You've got to shake it off, honey. She was doing a number on you. I could have gone with her. It would only have taken a little time. Instead, you stood up to her, a better choice if you ask me. What you need is some ice cream. No, but thanks. She took a deep breath, felt it catch near her sternum, but resolutely pushed it out, then turned so she could face all of them at once. I'm embarrassed, I'm tired, and this time I do have a headache. I'd like to apologize for the entire business all at once, and I'd like to see the fate, examine it, hopefully verify it before I take some medication, get dressed, and go downtown to see my father. Malachi held up a hand and showed her the statue his brother had given him in the kitchen. Without a word, Tia took it into her office to the desk. There, with her glasses perched on her nose, she studied it under a magnifying glass. She felt them hovering behind her as she continued her studies. We'd be more certain if my father could examine it, or, better yet, give it to an expert. We can't chance that, Malachi told her. No, I certainly won't risk my father by connecting him. These are the maker's marks, she said, tipping the base up. And, according to my research, they're correct. You and Gideon are the only ones here who've seen Clotho. I've only seen photographs and artist's renderings, but stylistically, this is a match. And you see here? She tapped the tip of her pencil on the notches right and left on the base. These slots connect her, the middle sister 
with Clotho on one side, Atropus on the other. She glanced up, waited for Malachi to nod. She took a tape measure out of the drawer, noted down the exact height, width. Another match. Let's check weight. She took it into the kitchen, used her scale. It's exact. Down to the gram. If it's a forgery, it's a careful one, and the odds of that, given its connection through Cleo, are small. In my not-so-considered opinion, we have Lachesis. We'd have the second fate. She set it on the counter, slipped her glasses off, and set them beside the statue. I'm going to get dressed. Tia, damn it. Give me a minute, Malachi said to Gideon, then went after her. I need to take a shower, she told him, and would have closed the door in his face if he hadn't just pushed it open. I need to change and figure out what I'm going to tell my father and what I'm not going to tell him. I'm not as skilled in this game-playing as you are. Are you embarrassed we made love? Are embarrassed your mother knows of it? I'm embarrassed, period. She turned into the bathroom, took a bottle of pills out of the medicine cabinet. She took one of the bottles of water she kept in the linen closet and downed Xanax. I'm upset that I had an argument with my mother and sent her away unhappy with me. And I'm trying not to imagine her collapsing on the street because I was too busy and disinterested to go with her to her doctor's appointment. Has she ever collapsed on the street before? No, of course not. She got out another bottle of pills and took two extra-strength Tylenol for the headache. She just mentions the possibility of it often enough so the image is always fresh in my mind. With a shake of her head... She met his gaze in the mirror. I'm a mess, Malachi. I'm 29 years old, and I've been in therapy for 12 years next January. I have regular appointments with an allergist, an internist, and a homeopathic healer. I tried acupuncture, but since I'm phobic about sharp implements, that didn't last long. Even thinking about it made her shudder a little. My mother's a hypochondriac, and my father's disinterested, she continued. I'm neurotic, phobic, and socially inept. I sometimes imagine myself suffering from a rare, malingering disease or being lactose intolerant, neither of which is true, at least up until now. She braced her hands on the sink because saying it out loud, hearing herself say it out loud, made it all sound so pathetic. The last time I went to bed with a man, other than this morning, was three years ago in April. Neither of us was particularly delighted with the results. So... What are you doing here? First, I'd like to say that if it'd been over three years since I'd had sex, I'd be in therapy as well. He turned her to face him, then kept his hands lightly on her shoulders. Second, being shy isn't being socially inept. Third, I'm here because here's where I want to be. And finally, I'd like to ask if when we've got all this business done with, you'd come back to Ireland with me for a bit. I'd like you to meet my own mother, under less touchy circumstances than I met yours. Now look what you've done, he said when the bottle she held slipped out of her hand and hit the floor. You've got those little pills everywhere. 18. Anita considered the possibility of flying to Athens and personally interrogating every antique dealer and collector in the city. Though there would have been something satisfying in this hands-on approach, she couldn't expect another fate to simply fall into her lap. Moreover, she wasn't willing to go to quite that much trouble on the vague memory of a bumbling fool like Tia Marsh. No, as much as she craved action, it wouldn't do. She needed direction. She needed leads. She needed employees who could follow both, so she wasn't required to shoot them in the head. She sighed over that. She'd been vaguely disappointed that her former employee's murder had warranted no more than a few lines in the New York Post. Really, that said quite a bit about the world, didn't it? She mused. When a dead man garnered less press than a pop singer's second marriage. It only proved that fame and money ran the show. Something she'd known all her life. Those two elements had been her goal even when she'd been moldering in that lousy three-decker walk-up in Queens when her name had been Anita Gorinsky, when she'd watched her father work himself to a nub for a stingy paycheck her mother had struggled to stretch week by week. She'd never belonged there, inside those dingy walls her mother had tried to brighten with flea market art and homemade curtains. 
She'd never been a part of that world, with its rooms that smelled forever of onions and its tacky hand-crocheted doilies. Her mother's wide, fresh scrub face and her father's scarred, working man's hands had been an embarrassment to her. She detested them for their ordinariness, their pride in her, their only daughter, their joy in sacrificing so that she could have advantages had disgusted her. She'd known, even as a child, she'd known she was destined for so much more. But destiny, Anita thought, often needed a helping hand. She'd taken their money for schooling, for clothes, and had demanded more. She'd deserved it. She'd earned it, Anita thought. Every penny of it she'd earned with every day she'd lived in that horrid apartment. And she'd paid them back in her way, by seeing that their investment in her produced considerable dividends. She hadn't seen her parents or her two brothers in more than eighteen years. As far as the world she now lived in was concerned, as far as she herself was concerned, she had no family. She doubted anyone from the old neighborhood would recognize little Nita in the woman she'd become. She rose and walked to the giltwood pier glass that reflected the spacious sitting area of her office. Once her hair had been a long fall of mink brown her mother had spent hours brushing and curling. Her nose had been prominent, and her front teeth had overlapped. Her cheeks had been soft and round. A few nips, a couple of tucks, some dental work, and a good hairstylist had changed the outer package, streamlined it. She'd always known how to enhance her better assets. Inside, she was exactly as she'd always been, hungry and determined to feed her appetites. Men she knew were always willing to set a full plate in front of a beautiful woman. As long as the man believed the woman would pay with sex, there was no end to the variety of meals. Now she was a very wealthy widow who could buy her own. Still, men were useful. Think of all the contacts her dear departed husband had put at her disposal. The fact was, Paul was handier dead than he'd been alive. Widowhood made her even more respectable and available. Considering, she went back to her desk and opened her husband's burgundy leather address book. Paul had been very old-fashioned in some respects and had kept his address book meticulously up to date. In the last years, when his hand hadn't been quite so steady, she'd written in the names herself, the dutiful wife. She paged through until she found the name she was looking for, Stefan Nikos. Sixty-ish, she recalled, vital, wealthy. Olive groves or vineyards, perhaps both. She couldn't quite recall. Nor could she recall if he currently had a wife. What mattered was he had money, power, and an interest in antiquities. She unlocked a drawer, drew out a book of her own. In it, she'd noted down everyone who'd come to her husband's funeral, what flowers they'd sent. Mr. and Mrs. Stefan Nikos hadn't made the trip from Corfu or Athens. They had homes in both places but had sent an offering of five dozen white roses, a mass card, and, best of all, a personal note of condolence to the young widow. She picked up the phone, nearly buzzed her assistant to make the call, then reevaluated. Best to make it herself, friend to friend, she decided, and was already practicing the words and tone as she dialed. She wasn't put through right away, but she held the line and her temper, so that when Stefan picked up, her voice was as warm and welcoming as his. Anita, what a wonderful surprise. I must apologize for keeping you waiting. Oh, no, you didn't. I'm the one who's surprised I'd be able to reach a busy man like you so easily. I hope you and your lovely wife are well. We are, we are, of course. And you? Fine, busy, too. Works a godsend to me since Paul died. We all miss him. Yes, we do. But it's wonderful for me to spend my days at Morningside. He's here, you know, in every corner. It's important for me to, well... She let her voice thicken just slightly. It's very important to keep his memory alive and to know old friends remember him as I do. I know it's been a very long time since I contacted you. I'm a bit ashamed of that. Now, now, time passes, doesn't it, my dear? Yes, but who knows better than I that one should never let people drift away. 
And here I am, Stefan, calling you after all this time for a favor. I nearly didn't. What can I do for you, Anita? She liked the fact that a hint of caution had come into his voice. He'd be a man accustomed to hangers-on, to old acquaintances hitting him up for favors. Yours was the first name I thought of because of who you are and your friendship with Paul. You are having difficulties with Morningside. Difficulties? She paused, then let embarrassment, even a touch of horror, color her tone. Oh no, no, Stefan, nothing like that. Oh, I hope you don't think I'd call this way to ask for any sort of financial. Oh, I'm so flustered. She twirled gleefully in her desk chair. It concerns a client and some pieces I'm trying to track down at his behest. Honestly, your name popped into my mind—a kind of shot in the dark, as the pieces are Greek images. I see. Is your client interested in something in my collection? That would depend. She tried a quiet laugh. You don't happen to own the three fates, do you? The fates? Three small silver statues, individual that are apparently linked together by their bases to make a set. Yes, I've heard of them, but only as a kind of story. Statues forged on Olympus that will, if complete, grant the owner anything from eternal life to untold fortunes. Even the fabled three wishes,、uh, one for each fate. Legends increase the value of a piece. Indeed, they do. But it was my impression that these pieces were lost, if they ever existed in the first place. I believe they existed, she said, running a fingertip over the statue of Clotho, which sat now on her desk. Paul often spoke of them. More to the point, my client believes it. To be frank, Stefan, he's piqued my interest enough that I've made some inquiries, started considerable legwork. One source, which appears to be valid, insists that one of the statues, the third one, is in Athens. If this is so, it's not come to my ear. I'm tugging on any line at this point. I hate to disappoint a client. I was hoping you could make some discreet inquiries. If I can possibly get away in the next few weeks, I'd love to take a trip to Greece myself. Combine business and pleasure. Of course, you must come and stay with us. I couldn't impose. The guest house here in Athens or our villa on Corfu are at your disposal. Meanwhile, I'd be happy to make those discreet inquiries. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. My client is somewhat eccentric and very much obsessed just now with these pieces. If I could locate even one, it would mean a great deal. I know Paul would be so proud to know that Morningside had a part in finding the fates. Pleased with herself, Anita made a second personal call. She glanced at her watch, flipped through her daybook, and calculated when she could most conveniently squeeze in the meeting she intended to set up. Burdett Securities. Anita Gay for Jack Burdett. I'm sorry, Miss Gay. Mr. Burdett is unavailable. May I take a message? Unavailable, she thought. Stupid twit! Don't you know who I am? Anita set her teeth. It's very important I speak with Mr. Bidet as soon as possible. Instantly, she thought, she had a second-tier plan to put into motion. I'll see he gets your message, Ms. Gay. If you give me a number where he can reach you, I'll. He has my numbers, all of them. She slammed down the phone. Unavailable, her ass. He'd best make himself available and soon. She wasn't about to let Cleo Tolliver and the second fate slip through her fingers. Jack Burdett was just the man to run them down for her. He was on the phone himself. In fact, Jack had spent most of the transatlantic flight on the phone or on his laptop. For herself, Rebecca watched two movies, actually one and a half, as she'd fallen asleep during the second, and had yet to forgive herself for wasting a single minute of the flight in sleep. She'd never flown first class before, and had decided it was a method of travel she could easily grow accustomed to. She wanted to use the phone herself to call her mother, to call her brothers, but she didn't think the current budget would swing for that sort of expense, and she could hardly ask Jack to pay for it. At the rate they were going, she was a little concerned he'd think she was only interested in his money. 
That was hardly the case, though she didn't consider his money a strike against him. She'd liked watching him with his great-grandparents. He'd been so sweet and so gentle with them. Not sappily so, she thought now. So many, to her mind, treated the elderly as if they were children, or inconveniences, or simply oddities. There had been none of that with Jack. It said something about a man, in her opinion, when he had an easy and natural way with his family. Of course, he was a bit too bossy for her usual taste, but she had to be honest enough to admit that men who fell in line whenever she snapped her fingers annoyed the very hell out of her. He was a pleasure to look at as well, and that was no more a strike against him than his wallet. And he was smart. More, he was canny. Since she was trusting him with a great deal, it helped knowing she'd put her faith in a canny sort of man. She shifted, started to speak to him, and saw he was making yet another call. Although a bit annoyed, Rebecca promised she wouldn't point out he'd barely said two words to her in more than five hours. "'Message from Anita Gay,' Jack said suddenly. "'What? She called you. What did she want?' "'She didn't say. Are you ringing her back?' "'Eventually. Why don't you do it now so we know?' Let her stew a while, that's one. Second, I don't want her to know I'm on a plane and we're about to start the final approach with all the accompanying announcements. If she's calling, she wants something. We'll just let her want it for a while longer. New York was a thrill, and though Rebecca didn't want to behave like a slack-jawed tourist, she intended to enjoy every minute of it. There were important things to do and vital business to attend to, but that didn't mean she couldn't hug the excitement of being there of finally being somewhere, tight against her. It was everything she imagined. The sleek towers of buildings, the acres of shops, the fast and crowded streets. To see them for the first time while being whisked along in a limousine, a genuine limousine as big as a boat, with seats of buttery leather and a uniformed driver complete with cap, was the most delicious of adventures. She could barely wait to call her mother and tell her about it. And oh, how her fingers itched to flip and fiddle with all the little switches. She sent Jack a sidelong look. He was sitting, legs stretched out, dark glasses in place, and his hands folded restfully over his stomach. She started to reach up to the panel, snatched her hand back. Perhaps he was sleeping and wouldn't see, but the driver might. Go ahead and play with them, Jack murmured. She flushed, shrugged. I was just wondering what everything did. She reached up, idly, she thought, and toyed with the various light schemes. Then the radio, the television, the sunroof. It wouldn't be so hard to put all this in an ordinary car, she concluded. Certainly you could have it in a caravan, and people would feel very plush while they traveled. She eyed the phone, thought of her family again. I need to get in touch with my brothers. I don't like not being able to just ring them and tell them I'm here. We'll go by and see them in person shortly. The limo glided, quiet as a ghost, to the curb, and Rebecca had her first look at Jack's building. It didn't seem like much, she mused as she stepped onto the sidewalk. She'd expected a man with all his wherewithal to live in some glossy place with fancy touches and one of those soldierly doormen. Still, it seemed a sturdy sort of place to her, and pitted with character. She was neither surprised nor disappointed when he used both key card and code to gain entrance into the narrow lobby, and yet another card, another code to access the elevator. I would have thought you'd lived alone, she began as the elevator started up. I do. No, I mean to say not in a flat with neighbors. I do, he said again. I have the only apartment in the building. It seems awfully big not to make use of the other space. I make use of it. The elevator stopped. He disengaged locks and alarms, then opened the door into his living space. Well, she stepped inside, onto a floor with wide, dark planks, scanned the biscuit-colored walls, the bold art, the wide windows. You've made use of this space right enough. There were gorgeous old rugs. She didn't know enough about such things to recognize Chinese deco, but she liked the blend of colors and the way they accented the deep hues and deep cushions of the sofas, the chairs, even the heavy polished wood. She wandered through, noting first it was tidy, then that it was tasteful, and last that it was stylish. 
She liked the wavy glass blocks that separated the kitchen from the living space, and the framed arches that led to what she supposed were hallways and bedrooms. It seems a lot of room for a single man. I don't like to be crowded. She nodded, turned back. Yes, she thought, it suited him. A clever and unusual space for a clever and unusual man. You can be sure I won't crowd you, Jack. Is there a place I can put my things? Maybe have a wash and change before we go see my brothers. Two bedrooms down the hall. Mine's on the right, spares on the left. He waited a beat, watching her. Take your pick. My choice is it. She let out a careful breath as she lifted her duffel. I'll take the spare for the moment, and I have something to say to you. Go ahead. I want to sleep with you, and I don't generally have that kind of want for a man on such short acquaintance. But I'm thinking it might be better if we're a bit careful with each other for a while yet, until we're both perfectly sure that the sex isn't some sort of payment on either side. I don't take sex as payment. That's good. And you'll be sure if it's offered, it isn't meant as such. I won't be long. She carried her bag through the arch and took the room on the left. He jammed his hands in his pockets, paced to the window, then turned and had taken two strides after her. When his office line beeped, he listened to his assistant relay the message that Ms. Gay had called again. Maybe he'd let her stew long enough. He passed through another archway and into the small office he kept in the apartment. Before he placed the call, he checked the phone for tampering, ran a brief systems check, then engaged his own recording device. Some might have called him paranoid. He preferred thinking of it as standard operating procedure. Anita. Jack. Oh, thank God! I've been trying to reach you for hours. He lifted a brow at the frantic tone in her usually unruffled voice and made himself comfortable in his desk chair. I've been out of reach. What's wrong, Anita? You sound upset. I am. I'm probably being foolish, but I am very upset. I need to speak with you, Jack. I need help. I'll leave her home right now if you can meet me there. Wish I could. Not going to be too easy, honey. He thought. I'm not in New York. Where are you? He could hear the hardening in her voice. Philadelphia. He decided. Quick job check. I'll be back tomorrow. Tell me what's wrong. I don't know who else to call. I just don't know anything about this sort of thing. It's about the fates. Remember, I mentioned them to you over dinner. Sure. But what about them? I told you I had an interested client. I've mentioned it to others, made some inquiries, though I'll admit I didn't think anything would come of it. But it has. You found one. He opened his carry-on, took out the protective bag. That sounds like good news. I might have found one. That is, I was contacted about one, but I don't know what to do. Oh, I'm rambling. I'm so sorry. Take your time. He unwrapped Atropus. Turned her to face him. All right. She took an audible breath. A woman called me, claimed she had one of the statues and was interested in selling it. Naturally, I was skeptical, but I had to follow through. Even when she insisted on meeting me outside the office, she insisted I come to the observation deck at Empire State. Get out. I know. I was amused, actually. It seemed so film noir. But she behaved rather oddly, Jack. I think she must have a drug problem. She demanded an exorbitant amount of money, and she threatened me, physically threatened me, if I didn't pay. A faint frown moved over his face as he turned Atropus around and around on his desk. It sounds like you should talk to the police, Anita. I can't afford the publicity. And in any case, what point is there? They were only threats. She had a picture. I think it was a scanned print of what might very well be one of the fates. Interesting, he considered. More and more interesting. If it was, you know, computer images can be generated easily. Sounds like a standard con. Well, yes, but it looked genuine. The detailing on the statue. I want to pursue this, but I'm. I confess, I'm more than a little shaken. If I go to the police, I'll lose this contact for my client. How did you leave things? She wants to meet me again, and I've stalled her. Frankly, she frightens me. 
Before I arrange any sort of meeting with her, I need to know who I'm dealing with. Right now, I only have a name, the name she gave me. Cleo Tolliver. If you could find her. I'm not a detective, Anita. I can give you the name of a good firm. Jack, I can't trust this to a stranger. I need a friend. I know it's going to sound crazy, but I'm sure I'm being followed. Once I know where she is, who she is, I'll know if I should try to negotiate this deal or take some sort of legal action against her. I need a friend, Jack. I'm very unnerved by all this. Let me see what I can do. Cleo Tolliver, you say? Give me a description. I knew I could count on you. You'll keep this off the record, won't you? A favor for a friend? He glanced at the recorder. Naturally. In under an hour, Cleo let out a whoop of joy. That's got to be the Chinese food. The thrill of pot stickers might have had her leaping to the door herself if Malachi hadn't intercepted her. Let's just have Tia take a look and be sure. With some regret, Tia set aside Wiley's journal and walked out of the spare room to the front door. One look through the peephole had her gasping in surprise. It's Jack Burdett, she hissed. He's got someone with him, but I can't really see her. Let's have a look. Malachi nudged her aside, looked for himself, then let out his own whoop. To Tia's surprise, he flipped locks, pulled open the door, then yanked the redhead into his arms. There's my girl! He spun her once, kissed her hard, then dropped her back on her feet. What the hell are you doing here? He demanded, in a lightning change of mood. What the hell are you doing with him? I'll tell you if you give me two seconds to get a breath. Instead of answering, she turned to launch herself at Gideon. Isn't this a wonder? The three of us in New York. I'd like to know why we are, Malachi continued, when you should be home. So you and Gid can have all the fun. Bollocks to that. Hello, you must be Tia. Smiling broadly, she stuck out a hand, grabbed Tia's, and shook hard and fast. I'm Rebecca, and sorry to confess, I'm sister to these two heathens who can't be bothered to tell you who's walked in your door. It's such a lovely place you have here. It is Cleo. She turned to the brunette, who leaned lazily against the back of the couch. It's a pleasure to meet you. This is Jack Burdett, as Tia already knows, and we've brought considerable news with us. The bell rang again. That better be the Chinese, Cleo said, and let's hope he brought extra egg rolls. Becca. Gideon drew her aside, lowered his voice, as Tia dealt with the delivery. You've no business running off this way with a strange man. Why not? Cleo demanded. I did. Tia, I'm going to open some wine, okay? Yes. Because her head was spinning, Tia leaned back against the door, her arms full of Chinese takeout. Her apartment was full of people, and most of them were talking at once in very loud voices. She was going to eat food loaded with MSG and would probably die young because of it. Her mother was barely speaking to her. There was a priceless Auger d'Ar hidden behind the 2% milk in her refrigerator, and she was sharing her bed with a man who was currently shouting at his sister. It was exhausting. It was wonderful. Been a busy little bee, haven't you? Jack commented. Here, let me give you a hand with those. Anybody order pot stickers? I did. Cleo wandered over to him with an open bottle of wine. I might share if you can manage to shut those three up. I can do that. He angled his head, took a good long look at her. She didn't do you justice. Didn't figure she would. Oh, who? Anita Gay. The name, as he'd expected, dropped the room into silence. She called about an hour ago, asked me to find you. Cleo's fingers tightened on the neck of the bottle. Looks like I'm found. Why didn't you tell me? Rebecca demanded. Easier to tell at once. She gave me the impression you're a dangerous character, he said to Cleo. Bet your ass. Good. Let's break out these pot stickers and talk about it. Her living room was a mess. Correction, Tia thought. Her life was the mess. There was a voice inside her head lecturing her to clean it up this very minute. But it was a little hard to hear it with all the voices going on outside her head. She now had connections to thieves and murderers and two precious Auger d'Art in her apartment. Cunningham, 
Malachi said, as he studied the two statues. It just figures. If you think about it all, if you believe the way life spins around, it just figures. There's two of them. He looked at his brother. There's what we were after. We were, Gideon agreed, at the start of it. We're not at the start of it anymore. Cleo surged to her feet, rage trembling through her. That one's mine, and don't you forget it. I'll see it melted down into a puddle before that bitch gets her hands on it. Calm yourself down, Cleo, Malachi advised. The hell I will. The three of you want to pay her back. That's your business. But it stopped being about money when she had Mikey killed. He's worth more than money. Of course he is. For the first time in days, Gideon touched her, gently, just a brush of his hand against her leg. I'm sorry about your friend. Rebecca set down her wine glass. I wish there was a way to make it right again. It's clear enough we have to think of something else. None of us plan for anything beyond skinning her for money once we found these two. Christ knows why we thought we ever would, and still we have. That must count for something. I won't sell it to her, not for any amount. How about selling it to me? Jack used chopsticks expertly for another bite of pork fried rice. So you can turn around and sell it to her? Cleo demanded. I don't think so. I'm not going to sell anything to Anita, he said icily. If you think she'll sell you the one she has, you're nuts. Disgusted, Cleo stretched out on the floor again. I'm not buying anything from her either. They only achieve their true value as a set, Tia pointed out. If you're not going to negotiate for the set with Anita, the only way to get the first one back is to steal it. Jack nodded as he topped off two of the glasses still on the coffee table. There you go. Oh, I like that way of thinking. Pleased, Rebecca sat up straight, shot Jack a warm, approving look. Still, you have to remember that if it's stolen back, it was stolen from us to begin with. Or, I suppose, stolen from Tia in a way, then from us. It's complicated, but it comes down to it being mutually owned, wouldn't you say? Tia blinked rapidly, pressed a finger on what felt like a muscle tick just under her left eye. I don't know what to say. I do. It's not enough. Cleo shook her head. Even if you pull it off, she loses a thing. A thing that wasn't hers to begin with. It's not fucking enough. No, it's not, Gideon agreed. Not any longer. You want justice? Jack lifted his glass, skimmed his gaze around the room. That's right. Gideon laid a hand on Cleo's shoulder, then looked at his brother, at his sister, back at Jack when they nodded. That's what has to be. Okay, justice makes it a little trickier, but we'll work it out. 19. Nothing, Malachi decided, was going to be solved during this first disorganized and impromptu meeting. They needed time to let it all settle in. Time, as Tia had said, to define their direction and their goal. As usual, the brainy and delightful Dr. Marsh had cut through to the heart of the matter. The six people currently scattered around her apartment had a variety of agendas and styles. The outside force of Anita Gay had only one. To win, they would have to meld those six individuals into one single unit. That required more than cooperation. It would demand trust. Since they had to start somewhere, Malachi decided to explore the new element, Jack Burdett. He wasn't entirely sure he cared for the way the man looked at his sister. That bit of personal business he intended to wind through the rest of it as soon as possible. In any case, Tia was looking more than a little shell-shocked. She did better to his way of thinking, when she had some time inside her own head. So the first order of the day was to clear out the apartment and give her a bit of room. We all need to chew on this for a while. Though he didn't raise his voice, the chatter quieted. It was something Jack noticed and filed away. Fine with me. Jack got to his feet. Meanwhile, I've got something for you, Tia. Something for me? Consider it a hostess gift. Thanks for the Chinese. He dug into his bag and came out with a phone. It's secure, he told her. And so will the line be once I hook it up. You can use this line to make and receive calls you don't want our eavesdropping friends to hear. I don't imagine I have to tell you not to give the number out. No, but doesn't the phone company have to... Never mind. He flashed a grin at her. Where do you want it? I don't know. She rubbed her fingers between her eyebrows, tried to think. 
Her office was out, as long as Cleo needed it for a bedroom. Her own bedroom seemed wrong, somehow selfish. The kitchen, she decided. Good choice. I'll take care of it. Here's the number, he added, taking a small card from his pocket. Do I memorize it, then eat the paper? You're all right, Doc. With a chuckle, he hefted the bag and headed toward the kitchen, then stopped. Seems like you're a little crowded in here. I've got plenty of room. Rebecca's staying at my place. Do you think so? Malachi's voice was dangerously soft. Stop it, was all Rebecca said, and she said it under her breath. I can take one more if anyone wants to relocate. That evens things up. I'll go. Cleo rolled up off the floor, careful not to look at Gideon. But Jack looked at him, saw the start of surprise, the quick, baffled anger. Fine. Saddle up. This won't take me long. I don't have much. She shot Tia a grin. You might actually get some work done this way. She walked off into the office, and Malachi sent his sister a fulminating look that only made her yawn. You think I'm letting you take up with a man this way? What way would that be, Malachi? She fluttered her lashes at him, and the eyes behind them were cold steel. We'll just see about all this. He lurched to his feet and strode off into the kitchen after Jack. I'm going to need a word with you. Figured that. Just let me take care of this. Malachi frowned as he watched him work. He had no idea what the man was doing with the little tools and bits of equipment, but it was very clear Jack knew. Hand me the small Phillips head bit out of the kit there, Jack asked. You screwing this into the wall? Malachi handed over the bit, watched Jack fit it onto a mini cordless drill. She won't care for that. Little sacrifice is big payoff. She's already swallowed more than a couple of holes in the wall. He fixed the phone jack in place, ran the line, then, taking what looked like a palm-sized computer out of his bag, ran a series of numbers through it. You can use this to contact your mother, Jack said conversationally. But I wouldn't mention to the doc that the phone company's getting stiffed on the long-distance calls. She's a straight arrow. Your mother's phones are clear, or were when I was there and checked them out. I showed her what to look for, and she'll be doing a check twice a day. She's a sharp lady. I don't think they'll get past her. You form impressions quickly. Yeah, this is set. Reach out and touch someone, he added, and packed up his tools. Then why don't we step into my office, Malachi suggested, and grabbed a couple of beers out of the refrigerator. From her seat on the sofa, Rebecca had a clear view of small dramas. She watched her two angry brothers split off into opposite directions, Gideon into the little room to the right where Cleo had gone. The door slammed smartly behind him, and Malachi out the front door of the apartment with Jack. That door closed with ominous control. It seems everyone's gone off to argue without us. She stretched, yawned again. The flight had tired her out more than she'd realized. Why don't I help you tidy up this disaster we've made of your home? You can tell me what's brewing with my brother and Cleo, and what's brewing with my other brother and you. Tia looked blankly around the room. I don't know where to begin. Pick your spot, Rebecca told her. I'm good at catching up. What do you mean you'll go? Gideon demanded. Makes sense. Cleo stuffed clothes into her bag. We're crowded here. Not that crowded. Enough that you're sleeping on the goddamn roof. She heaved the bag onto the daybed and turned. Look, Slick, you don't want me here in your face. You've made that crystal. So splitting off makes it easier all around. It's that easy for you. The man says I've got room and you jump over to him. Her cheeks went ice white. Fuck you. She grabbed her bag again, and so did he. For ten bitter seconds, they waged a fierce tug of war. I didn't mean it that way. He wrenched the bag free, heaved it aside. What do you take me for? I don't know what I take you for. Despite Malachi's earlier advice, she'd had no intention of using tears on him, and she was furious that they were blurring her vision. But I know what you take me for. A liar and a cheat, and a cheap one at that. I don't. Damn it all to bloody hell, Cleo. I'm angry with you. I've a right to be. Fine. Be as pissed off as you want. I can't stop you. But I don't have to have it shoved down my throat every day. I screwed up. I'm sorry. End of story. She started to shove by him to retrieve her bag, but he caught her arms, tightening his grip when she tried to jerk away. Don't cry. 
I didn't mean to make you cry. Let go. Tears were spurting out faster than she could blink them back. I don't blubber to get my way. Don't cry, he said again, and his grip gentled to a caress. Don't go. He drew her in, rocked her in his arms. I don't want you to go. I don't know what I want altogether, but I know I don't want you to go. This isn't ever going to go anywhere. Stay. He rubbed his cheek against hers, transferring tears. And let's see. She sighed, let her head rest on his shoulder. She'd miss this. God, she'd miss just this simple connection so much it ached in the bones. You can't go soft on a woman just because she drips on you slick. Just makes a sap out of you. Let me worry about that. Here now, here. He skimmed his lips over her damp cheek, found her mouth and sank in soft and slow. The tenderness of it had her muscles trembling and her belly doing one long, lazy roll. Even when he deepened the kiss, it was all warmth, without any of those edgy flashes of heat she expected, she understood. For one of the first times in her life, she stood poised on absolute surrender, with a man in total control of her, heart, body, mind. It terrified her, and it filled her. Don't be nice to me. She pressed her face into his shoulder as she struggled for balance. I'll just screw it up. Not as tough as she pretended, Gideon thought, and not nearly as sure of herself. Let me worry about that as well. You've only one thing to do at the moment, he added, and tipped her face back to his. What? He smiled at her. Unpack. She sniffled and hoped to get a little of her own back. Is that how you get what you want, by being nice? Now and then. Cleo. He cupped her face in his hands, watched the wariness come back into those deep, dark eyes. He didn't mind it. If she was wary of him, she was thinking of him. You're so beautiful. Seriously beautiful. It can be a bit disconcerting. Unpack, he said again. I'll tell Burdette you'll be staying here with me, he added. You're with me, Cleo. That's something we both have to deal with. On the roof, Jack took stock. One way in and out, he considered. That made this area either a trap or a solid defense. It might be wise to set up a few measures here. If a man didn't anticipate a war, he always lost the battle. Hell of a view, he commented. Got a smoke. No, sorry, never picked up the habit. I quit. Malachy rolled his shoulders. Some time ago. I'm regretting that right about now. Well then, let's have first things first. That would be Rebecca. Malachy acknowledged this with a nod. So it would. She shouldn't be here in the first place, but since she is, she can't be staying with you. Shouldn't, can't. Jack turned his back on the view and leaned on the safety wall. If you've used those words with her very often, I bet you've gotten some interesting scars. True enough. She's a perverse creature, our Becca. And she's smart. I like her brain. I like her face, Jack added, eyes direct on Malachy's. I like the whole package. That's a problem for you, her being your sister. He took a pull from the bottle of harp. I've got one of my own, so I get that. Mine went off and married some guy despite the fact that, in my opinion, she had no business even knowing what sex meant. She's got two kids now, but mostly I like thinking she found them under a berry bush probably in the same patch where my mother found us. Amused, Malachy dipped a hand in his pocket. You grow berries in that apartment of yours? Let's put it this way. She's taken the spare room, her choice. It stays her choice, either way. I gave your mother my word I'd take care of her. I don't break my word. Not to someone I respect, anyway. Malachy was more than a little surprised to find himself relaxed. More yet to realize he believed Jack was as good as his word. Maybe, just maybe, they'd forge that unit. I suppose this saves me from a bloody battle with Rebecca. But the fact remains, she's an impulsive, headstrong girl who... I'm in love with her. Malachy's eyes widened. His thoughts scattered. Jesus Christ, man. That's fast work, isn't it? It only took one look, and she knows it. That gives her the advantage. He paused. She'd use an advantage when it comes to hand. She would, Malachy agreed, not without sympathy, if need be. 
What she doesn't know and what I haven't figured out is what I'm going to do about it. I'm not a fatalist. I think people drive the train. So do I. He thought of Felix Greenfield, of Henry Wiley, and a sunny afternoon in May. But we don't always choose the tracks. Whatever the tracks, we've got our hand on the switch. If that wasn't the way it worked, I'd believe that those statues, the circle they've made, have something to do with what happened to me when I looked at Rebecca. Since I don't, I'll just say I'm in love with your sister. So you can stop worrying that I'll let anything or anyone hurt her, including myself. That do it for you? I'm just going to sit down here a minute. He did so, drank contemplatively, then set the bottle on the little iron table by his chair. He bounced his palms off his knees while he studied Jack. Our father's gone, and I'm the oldest, so it falls to me to ask you. He trailed off, dragged his hands through his hair. You know, I'm just not ready for it. Let's have part two of this particular discussion at some later date. Jack tipped back his beer again. Works for me. You're a cool one, you are. Better for her that you are. So let's move on to another area, the fates. You've been in charge. Malachy leaned back, cocked a brow. This is a family affair for us, Jack. Never said different, but you're in charge. When push comes to shove, the others look to you for the answer. That goes for Tia, too. Probably Cleo, though she's the wild card. She's had a rough go, but she's steady enough. You have a problem with what you see as the pecking order here? I might have, except I get the impression you know how to delegate and how to let everyone play to their strengths. I know what mine are. I don't mind taking orders, Sullivan, if I agree with them. And I won't mind telling you to fuck off if I don't. Bottom line, I owe you. Felix Greenfield, he continued. And I want the fates. I'll work with you so we all end up with what we want. Next on the bill, he added. It's a little too loose for my liking to keep Cleo's fate in Tia's refrigerator. My apartment's got the best security money can buy. I want to keep it in my safe there along with mine. Picking up his beer, Malachy passed the bottle from hand to hand as he thought it through. Trust, he thought. Without it, they'd never solidify. I won't argue with the practicality of that. But to say you'd then have two of three in your hands... What's to stop you from going after the other on your own, or even negotiating with Anita? No offense. None taken. Going after the other alone would be tricky logistically. Not impossible, but tricky. Moreover, Rebecca wouldn't like it one damn bit, and that matters. And finally, I don't double-cross people I like. I especially like the Doc. His grin was fast and wolfish. As do I. Yeah, that comes through clear. As for dealing with Anita... I don't negotiate with sociopaths, and that's just what she is. She gets the chance she'd take any one of us out, cold blood, then go have her weekly manicure. Malachy settled back again, drank again. Agreed. So we won't give her that opportunity. We've all got some pondering to do. Why don't we take 24 hours? Then we can give Tia a break and meet at my place tomorrow. All right? Malachy got to his feet, held out a hand. Welcome aboard. You and Mao were involved in your private and manly discussion for some time. Rebecca angled in the seat of the tank-like SUV Jack had driven uptown. What was it about? This, that, the other. You can start with this, move along to that. It comes to mind that if we'd wanted you in on the discussion, we'd have asked you up on the roof. I'm as much a part of this as anyone. Nobody says different. He turned off fifth, headed east to Lexington, watching his rear-view mirror as a matter of course. And as such, I've a perfect right to know what the two of you had your heads together about. This is a team, Jack, not a group made up of roosters and hens. It has nothing to do with the way you button your shirt, Irish. So cool the feminist jets. That's insulting. He headed south a while, then jogged east again. No tail, he decided, and no surveillance on Tia's building that he could spot. That could change, but for now it was handy. He let Rebecca stew while he wound his way back home. He circled the building, keyed in the code for the garage he'd had built to his personal specs. The reinforced steel door rose and he guided the SUV inside. He had his Boxster stored inside as well, along with his Harley and his surveillance van. A man, he thought, had to have some toys. Storing them in a public garage had never been an option for him, 
and not simply because the yearly rate would have outstretched the cost of sending a kid through Harvard Law, but because he wanted them close, and under his own system. He climbed out, reset the locks and alarms on the door on the SUV, then uncoded the elevator. You coming up? He asked Rebecca. Or do you want to sulk in the garage? I'm not sulking. She sailed by him, crossed her arms over her chest. But it would be a natural enough response to being treated like a child. Treating you like a child's the one thing I don't have in mind. Okay, take a pick. You want the rundown of this, that, or the other? She tipped her head up, wishing she wasn't amused. I'll take this. This would be your brother expressing his concern that you're staying here with me. Well, it's none of his flaming business, is it? And a nerve he has too. When it's plain, he's cozied up himself with Tia. And I hope you told him so. No. Jack pulled open the elevator door so she could stomp into the apartment. I told him I was in love with you. She stopped dead, spun around. What? What? Which seemed to ease his mind more than it eases yours. I've got some things to do. Be back in a few hours. Back. As if to catch her balance, she threw her arms out. You can't just leave after you've said such a thing to me. I didn't say it to you. I said it to your brother. Stretch out, Irish. You look beat. And with this, he closed the door, locked her in, and left her stammering curses at him. He didn't go far. It was only one flight down to the base he kept in the building. He worked from there when it was convenient, or when he was simply restless in his apartment upstairs and wanted a distraction. Right now, he wanted both the convenience and the distraction. It was a comfortable space. He'd never seen the purpose in Spartan work areas when there was a choice. There were deep chairs, good lighting to make up for the lack of windows, the antique rugs he favored, and a fully equipped kitchen. He went there first, started coffee, and while it brewed, accessed the messages that had come through on his various lines. He booted up one of the computers ranged over a long L-shaped counter, called up his email, and listened to the electronic voice read it out while he fixed the first cup of coffee. He answered what couldn't wait, put aside what could, then shifted to the personal messages. The email from his father made him grin. The aliens, having performed hideous medical experiments of an embarrassingly sexual nature on us, have returned your mother and me to Earth. You can hear all about it on Larry King. Now that I have your attention, maybe you could spare five minutes to get in touch. Your mother sends her love. I don't. I like your sister better. Always did. Guess who? With a laugh, Jack sat down at the keyboard. Okay, okay. He wrote, "Sorry to hear about the alien experience. Typically, they insert tracking devices in their abductees. You may want to chew on tin foil while having any personal conversations, as this is known to jam their frequencies. Just FYI. Recently, back in New York." I'm keeping gorgeous Irish redhead prisoner in my apartment. Possibility of exotic sexual favors from same may keep me busy for the next couple weeks. Love back to mom, none to you. I'm not even sure you are my father. You guess who? Knowing his father would crack himself up reading the post, Jack hit send, then got down to work. He ran a modified check on Cleo, enough in his estimation to placate Anita. On a separate computer, he started a background check on her for himself. He'd already come to the same conclusion as Tia, as Malachi. The six of them were going to have to work together as a single entity. He had no problem with teamwork, but he wanted to know all there was to know about the team. While the data scrolled, he rolled over to the monitors and, telling himself it was best all around if he kept an eye on Rebecca, engaged the cameras he had installed in his own apartment. She was in his office, at his computer, and she looked steamed, curious. He turned on audio. Bugger you, Jack! If you think I can't get by your bloody passwords and blocks. If you can, Irish, he replied, I'm going to be very impressed. He watched her a while, noting the rapid streak of her fingers over the keyboard, the curl of her lip as she met another obstacle. Most women, in his experience, when left to their own devices in a man's space, would poke in drawers, closets, examine the contents of the medicine cabinet or the kitchen cupboards. But she'd gone straight for the information highway. It did his heart good. He muted the audio, 
then busied himself writing a report on Cleo that would convince Anita he was doing her a favor and offer her nothing helpful. That'll set you on the boil, he thought aloud. He rolled away again to let it simmer before he read it over one last time and picked up the phone. Detectives Bureau, Detective Robbins. The man with the badge. The man with fraudulent ID. Not me, pal. You must be thinking of someone else. How's the crime-fighting world? Same old. How's it going in Paranoiaville? No complaints. Wondered if you wanted to take that 20 I owe you and go double or nothing on the Angels and O's tonight. Are you intimating that I, a public servant, gamble? I'll take the O's. You're on, sucker. Now that the pleasantries are over, what are you after? Now you've hurt my feelings. But since you ask, I got some descriptions to run by you. Muscle, probably freelance, certainly local. Thought maybe you could run them through the system for me. See if anything pops. Maybe. You got names? No, but I'm working on it. Bachelor number one. White male, 40 to 45, brown hair, thinning, no eye color, pale complexion, prominent nose. About 5'10", 170. A lot of guys fit that, including my brother-in-law. Worthless fuck. My information is he likes to use his fists and isn't long on brains. Yeah, that's my brother-in-law. Want me haul his ass in and kick him around? Up to you. Your brother-in-law take any recent trips to Eastern Europe? He doesn't move his white dimpled butt off his recliner to go to the corner deli. You looking for a world traveler, Bedette? I'm looking for an asshole who's recently back from a little trip to the Czech Republic. That's a coincidence. We've got a corpse on ice, fits your general description. Had a passport in the pocket of his fancy suit. Had two stamps on it, one Praha. That's my erudite friends. Tell me, Prague, Czech Republic. The other was New York, about ten days old. Bullseye, Jack thought, and swiveled back to a keyboard. Can you spare the name? Don't see why not. Carl Dubrowski, Bronx boy. Got a pretty yellow sheet on him. Mostly assault. An escape on a man one. What do you want with our dead guy, Jack? Jack plugged in the name and started a search of his own. Tell me how he got dead. It was probably the four holes a twenty-five caliber put into him. He turned up stiff in an empty warehouse in Jersey. Let's have a little quid pro quo here. I've got nothing right now, but I'll hand it to you when I do. He switched computers, ready to start a second search. Got an address on that warehouse? Jesus, why don't I just fax you the file? Would you? At Bob's rude response, Jack grinned and noted down the address. When he'd finished on the phone, he typed up meticulous notes on all the data he'd generated. He was getting to his feet, coffee on his mind, when he glanced at the monitors. The maniacal gleam in Rebecca's eyes had him moving closer, switching the audio back on. Not so smart, are you? She was muttering. Not so bloody clever. You are, he commented, surprised and, yes, impressed that she'd gotten past his security. Admittedly, he didn't keep anything confidential on that unit, and the blocks were moderate. But they were there, and it had taken a hacker with considerable skill to cut past them so quickly. Just as I thought, he said to her image. We're made for each other. He got another cup of coffee and went back to work while she raided his hard drive. Twenty minutes later, he'd done all he felt he needed to do for the moment. And so, he noted as he looked toward the monitors again, had she. She switched the computer off, stretched, then, looking pleased with herself, wandered out of the room, across the living space and down the hall. Jack shifted his attention to the next monitor, watched her roll the stiffness out of her shoulders, pull the band out of her hair and shake it out. When she started to unbutton her blouse, he reminded himself he wasn't a peeping Tom. He ordered himself to switch off the cameras and he tortured himself by watching her peel the blouse away. When she reached behind for the bra clasp, he ground his teeth and hit the kill switch. He got a beer instead of coffee and spent the next half hour filing away his work and wondering how the hell he could be expected to concentrate. By the time he walked into his apartment again, he had a number of very interesting fantasies going, none of which involved finding her fully dressed but for her pretty bare feet in his kitchen with fragrant steam puffing out of a pot. What are you doing? Why, I'm climbing the Matterhorn. What do you think I'm doing? He stepped in, took another good sniff of the pot, of her. It looks suspiciously like cooking. The shower and change, as well as the session on his computer, had revived her. 
but while fatigue wasn't a factor any longer, temper was still in play. As I had no idea how long you intended to keep me locked in here, I wasn't about to sit around and starve to death. You've no fresh fruit or vegetables, by the way, so I'm making do with canned and jarred. I've been out of town. Write down whatever you want and I'll get it for you. I can do my own marketing. I don't want you going out alone. She slid a carving knife out of the wooden block, idly checked its tip with her thumb. Her mother's daughter, Jack thought. Both knew how to make their point. You've no say where I go or when. You use that on me, you're going to be really sorry after. Her smile was every bit as thin and sharp as the blade. You'd be sorrier, wouldn't you? Can't argue with that. He opened the fridge, took out a bottle of water. Let me rephrase. I'd prefer you didn't go out alone until you know the lay of the land. I'll take your preferences into consideration. And one more thing. If you think that saying you love me is going to have me leaping joyfully into your bed, don't push that button, Rebecca. His tone had gone hard, very hard and very cold. You won't like the result. She angled her head. She found it interesting that drawing the knife had barely made him blink, but she'd ruffled him quite a bit by mentioning love and sex. I don't like you winging something like that out at me, then closing the door in my face. I closed it in my face. She considered that, accepted it. I'm capable of doing that, if and when I want. With her left hand, she picked up a spoon, stirred the pot. I don't know what I want just now. When I do, you'll be the first to hear about it. Meanwhile, don't shut me up in here like a parakeet in a cage again. If you try, I'll break all your pretty knickknacks, rip your clothes to rags, stop up your toilet and various other unpleasant things. And I'll find the way out as well. Okay, fair enough. When do we eat? She huffed out a breath, slid the knife back into its slot. An hour or so. Enough time for you to go out again and fetch back some French or Italian bread to go with this meal. And something sweet for after it. She tossed her hair back. I was pissed off, but not enough to bake. Twenty. It was, Tia told herself, a foolish child who was nervous about walking into her parents' home. But her palms were damp, and her stomach churned as she stepped into the dining room of the Marsh townhouse. It was 8.45. Her father sat down to his breakfast every morning, seven days a week, at precisely 8.30. He would now be on his second cup of coffee and have moved from the front page of the New York Times to the financial section. He'd have finished his fruit and would have moved on to the next course which, Tia noticed, was an egg-white omelette today. Her mother would take her herbal tea, her freshly squeezed juice, and her first of the daily dose of eight glasses of bottled water, using them to wash down her morning complement of vitamins and medication in bed. With it, she'd have a single slice of whole wheat toast, dry, and a cup of seasonal fruit. At 9.20, Alma would come downstairs, regale Stuart with whatever physical complaint she might have that morning, ramble off her appointment and task schedule, while he checked his briefcase. They would kiss goodbye, and he would walk out the door at 9.30. It was, Tia believed, as reliable and exact a schedule as that of a Swiss train. There had been a time when she'd been part of that schedule, or, she thought, had been worked into it. Was it their fault or hers that she'd been so unable to do anything, anything at all, to interfere with its precision? Their fault or hers that even now the idea of doing so made her queasy. Stuart glanced up as Tia entered, and his creased brow lifted in mild surprise. Tia, did we have an appointment? No, I'm sorry to interrupt your morning. Don't be foolish. But even as he said it, he glanced at his watch. Would you like some breakfast, coffee? No, thank you, nothing. She stopped herself from linking her restless fingers together and sat across from him. I wanted to speak to you before you went into work. All right. He spread a thin layer of butter on lightly toasted whole wheat bread, then blinked. You've cut your hair. Yes. Feeling foolish, she lifted a hand to it. A few days ago. It's very flattering, very chic. Do you think? She felt her color rise. Foolish again, she decided, to be so flustered by a compliment from her own father. But they came so few and far between. When Mother saw it, I don't think she was pleased. I imagine she'd have told you. She may have. 
He smiled a little as he continued to eat. I don't always listen, particularly when she's in a mood. She has been. It's my fault and one of the reasons I wanted to see you this morning. Mother dropped by my apartment on her way to a doctor's appointment. It was an awkward moment. I was with someone. She drew a long breath. I was with a man. I see. Stuart hesitated, frowned, stirred his coffee. Do I see to you? I'm involved with someone. He's staying with me at my apartment while he's in New York. I'm working on a project with him and some other people just now. And I'm... I'm having an affair with him. She finished on a rush and fell into miserable silence. Stuart contemplated his coffee another moment. It was a toss-up which of them was more uncomfortable. Tia, your personal relationships aren't my business or your mother's. Naturally, I assume anyone you're involved with is suitable and appropriate. I'm not sure you'd find him so either, but I do. Surprisingly, she rushed on. He thinks I'm interesting and attractive, which makes me feel interesting and attractive. And I like it. In any case, Mother was, and I imagine is, very upset. I'm not sure I can smooth things over with her, but I'll certainly try. I'm going to apologize in advance if I'm unsuccessful. I can't and, and won't order my life to suit her needs, or yours, so I'm sorry. Well, Stuart set down his fork, drew air through his nose. Well, he repeated. I never expected to hear that from you. You're saying that though your mother and I may disapprove, may even be angry, you'll do as you please? She knew the pain in her stomach was tension, but couldn't help wondering if she had a tumor. In a nutshell, I suppose that's it. Good. It's about goddamn time. She forgot all about the possibility of stomach cancer. Excuse me? I love your mother, Tia. Don't ask me why, as I haven't a clue. She's a pain in the ass, but I love her. Yes, I know. I mean, I know you love her. Not that she's... I always knew you loved each other. She finished. You say that as if you weren't part of the equation. She started to make an excuse, then simply let the truth spill out. I don't feel I am. Then we're all at fault. She's never been able to cut the cord with you. Perhaps I cut it too easily, or too quickly, and you tolerated both actions. I guess I did, but you've always been a good father to me. No, I haven't. He set his coffee down, studied her astonished face. And I can't say I gave the matter much thought or attention since you were, uh, twelve or so. But I have since the day you came to ask for Henry Wiley's journal, and I brought it down to you. And you were sitting, waiting for me, and you looked so unhappy. I was unhappy, and surprised now that I noticed. He lifted a hand, then picked up his cup again. It surprised me as well, and made me wonder how often I hadn't noticed. I made you unhappy. Tia stated, by not being what you wanted. Yes, and my way of dealing with that was to leave you to your mother, as it seemed you had a great deal more in common with her than with me. Strange, I've always considered myself a very fair man, but that was remarkably unfair to all involved. The best thing for you and your mother, in my opinion, is you're cutting the cord yourself. You've let her push you around your entire life. Whenever I try to interfere, and I can't claim I tried particularly hard, one or both of you circumvented that effort. You gave up on me. You seemed content enough the way things were. Children leave home to you. If one's committed to a marriage, then one lives with another person most of one's life. I've structured mine in a way that satisfies and pleases me. You come from two very self-absorbed people. And what are your phobias and nervous disorders but another sort of self-absorption? She stared at him, then let out a half-laugh. I suppose you're right. I don't want to stay that way. I'm almost thirty. How much can I change? Whether or not you change, you're still almost thirty. What difference does your age make? Nearly speechless, she sat back. You've never talked to me like this before. You never came to me before. He moved one shoulder, elegantly. It's not my habit to go out of my way or vary my routine. Speaking of which... He checked his watch. I need a favor, Tia said quickly. This is quite the red-letter day in the Marsh household. It concerns the three fates. The vague impatience that had crossed Stuart's face faded. 
You've developed a significant interest in them recently. Yes, I have, and I'd like that interest to stay between you and me. Anita Gay also has a significant interest. She may ask you about them again. Try to pick your brain for any detail you might have through Henry Wiley's connection to them. If and when she does, I wonder if you could remember vaguely, casually, some mention of the third fate being seen or reputed to having been seen in Athens. Athens? Stewart sat back. What game are you playing, Tia? An important one. Anita isn't a woman who would scruple to break rules if doing so was profitable. I'm more aware of that than I can tell you. Tia, are you in trouble? For the first time since she'd entered the house, she smiled. That's something you've never asked me, not once in my life. If I am in trouble, I'm determined to handle it, even enjoy it. Can you find a way to mention Athens to her? Easily. And not under any circumstances to mention Wiley's journal or my relationship with the man Mother met at my apartment. Why would I? Tia, do you have a line on one of the fates? She wanted to tell him, wanted the thrill of seeing pride and surprise in his eyes. But she shook her head. It's very complicated, but I'll tell you everything as soon as I can. She got to her feet. One last question. As a dealer, what would you pay for them? It would depend. Speculatively, up to ten million. If I had an interested client, I'd advise him to go upwards of twenty, perhaps a bit more. Contingent on testing and verification, of course. Of course. She walked over, kissed his cheek. I'll go upstairs and try to make things up with Mother. While Tia was stroking Alma's ruffled feathers, Jack dropped in on the detective's bureau. He'd have preferred leaving Rebecca in his apartment, but since locking her in was the only way to be sure she stayed there, he'd brought her along. He didn't care to risk coming home to a trashed apartment, and had no doubt she'd make good on that threat. Bringing her had the added benefit of watching her absorb and file every detail of the cop shop. He could almost hear the wheels turning in her head as they climbed the stairs to the detective's bullpen, just as he had the satisfaction of seeing cops give her the same once over. He saw Bob at his desk, phone cradled on his shoulder, and watched his friend's gaze shift over, scan Rebecca, then sweep up. There was a question in them when they met Jack's, and the warmth of humor and appreciation. Hang here just a minute, Jack told Rebecca, then strolled to Bob's desk. He sat on the corner, exchanged a few nods of greeting with other cops, while Bob finished his call. Hubba hubba, Bob said. Where'd you get the sexy little redhead? How's your wife? Smart enough to know when I stop looking at sexy little redheads, it's time to shovel the dirt over my cold dead body. What do you want? More information about the cold dead body we discussed yesterday. I gave you what I had. I need a photo. Why don't you just ask for my badge? Thanks, I can get my own. I might be able to shake something loose on it for you, but I need to ID him first. Let's try this. You tell me what you know. Then maybe I can find a picture of the stiff. Want to meet the redhead? Bob laid his fingers on his own wrist, nodded. Yeah, I've still got a pulse. What do you think? With a grin, Jack motioned Rebecca over. Detective Bob Robbins, Rebecca Sullivan, the woman I'm going to marry. Bob's jaw dropped, then he was on his feet. Well, damn, Jack, damn, nice job. Hey, good to meet you. Rebecca smiled as Bob pumped her hand. Jack has delusions of grandeur. At the moment, we're in the way of being business associates. She's a tough sell, but I'm working on it. Irish, why don't you tell our speechless friend here what you found out about the warehouse in New Jersey? Of course. Doing a bit of digging last night, it came to light that that particular property, which most recently was the scene of a murder, was sold the day before the unfortunate event by Morningside Antiquities. And that should interest me because... Let me show the picture to a couple of people, Jack continued. If my hunch plays, I'll have an interesting answer to that question. You got a lead on an open homicide, Jack. You don't dick around with it. Follow up on Morningside. Anita Gay, Rebecca said clearly, and had both men scowling at her. Fortunately, I don't have any testosterone muddling my ego. Anita Gay of Morningside Antiquities. You might want to take a look at her, Detective Robbins. There's no point in going further until we've shown the picture and verified that the man who was killed is indeed the one we think he is. She shot Bob a brilliant smile. 
We're all after the same thing in the end, aren't we, Detective? But if you don't trust this one here... She jerked a head toward Jack. I'll figure you have good reasons not to. I'm still working on whether I trust him or not myself. Bob sucked air between his teeth. I'll get you a picture. Ever heard about keeping an ace in the hole? Jack grumbled when Bob walked away. I have, yes. As I've heard about laying cards on the table when it's time to deal, and my way worked. She scooped her hair back, studied his face. You throw marriage around pretty freely, Jack. No, I don't. You're it. Get used to it. Why, that's so flaming romantic. I feel I might swoon. I'll give you some romance, Irish. Just pick the time and place. Not quite as sure of herself as she wanted to be, she folded her arms over her chest. Just be keeping your mind on the job. Consider it multitasking again, he said, then eased off the desk when Bob came back with a file. Tia did the best she could with her mother. A thorough stroking would have taken two or three hours at least, and she just didn't have the time to spare. She had one more stop to make. If she didn't keep on schedule, Malachi and the others would worry and wonder. There was an odd comfort in that, she realized. Having someone worry about you. She supposed, if she were honest, she'd let herself fall into that comfort zone with her mother, always. Though the truth was, Alma didn't worry about her daughter nearly as much as she worried about herself. That was her nature, Tia told herself as she stepped out of the cab on Wall Street. All the therapy sessions with Dr. Lowenstein had never pushed her into understanding and accepting that one fact. It had taken an Irishman, three silver statues, and an odd mix of new friends to clear her vision and stiffen her spine. Or maybe, in some strange way, it had taken Anita Gay. When all was said and done, and her life got back to whatever passed as normal, she'd have to thank Anita for thrusting her into a situation that forced her to test her own abilities. Of course, if things worked out as she hoped, Tia doubted Anita would appreciate the gratitude. She hummed as she rode up the elevator in the brokerage firm. Tia Marsh, she thought, scheming, plotting, having regular sex, and all without chemical aids. Well, hardly any. She felt rather smug, almost confident, and secretly powerful. It was even better when she stopped by Carrie's assistant's desk and realized the man didn't recognize her. Tia Marsh, she said, flustered, and delighted when she saw him blink in surprise. Does Ms. Wilson have a minute to spare? Dr. Marsh, of course. He stared at her as he reached for his phone. I'll just let her know you're here. You look wonderful today. Thank you. She was going shopping, Tia decided, at the first opportunity, for an entire new wardrobe to go with the hair and the attitude. She was going to buy something really, really red. Tia! Carrie hurried out of her office. She looked sharp and smart and very rushed. We didn't have an appointment, did we? No, I'm sorry. I just need a few minutes if you can manage it. A few is what I've got. Come on back. Todd, I'm going to need the analysis on the Brockway accounts by noon. He didn't recognize me, Tia commented as Carrie led her into her snazzy corner office. What? Oh, Todd? Carrie laughed, shot a look at the computer screen where she'd been working, then headed to her coffee pot. Well, you do look different, honey. Fabulous, really. She poured a cup, didn't bother to ask Tia if she wanted any, as it was real coffee, then took a good look at her friend as she sat. Really fabulous. Not just the hair, either. She set the mug aside, got back to her feet, scrutinized Tia's face. You've had sex. Carrie, for heaven's sake. Tia closed the office door quickly. You've had sex since I saw you. Carrie wagged a finger. Spill it. I didn't come here to talk about that, and you've only got a few minutes. To settle the matter, Carrie simply strode to her desk, snatched up her phone. Todd, hold my calls and tell Minlow I may be a few minutes late for our ten o'clock. There. She hung up the phone. Talk. I want details. Names, dates, positions. It's complicated. Tia gnawed on her bottom lip. It was like being Clark Kent, she decided, and not being able to tell anyone you were really Superman. She couldn't stand it. You can't tell anyone. What am I, the town crier? It's Carrie, Tia. I already know all your secrets, or I did. Who is he? Malachi. Malachi Sullivan. The Irish guy? He came back? He's staying with me. He's living with you? I'm going to cancel my ten o'clock. No, no. 
Tia pushed her hands through her hair and laughed. I don't have time, really. As soon as I can, I'll tell you everything. But he... We're... It's amazing. I've never felt so... Potent, she decided, and unable to keep still, wandered around the office as she spoke. That's a good word, potent. He can barely keep his hands off me. Isn't that something? And he actually listens to me, asks my opinion. He makes fun of me, but not in a mean sort of way. He makes me look at myself, Carrie, and when I do, I'm not so stupid, so clumsy, so inept. You've never been any of those things, and if he's letting you see that, I'm disposed to like him. When do I meet him? It's complicated, as I said. Oh, Christ, he's married. No, no, nothing like that. It's a project we're working on. Tia, just let me get this out of the way. Is he asking you for money for an investment of any kind? No, Carrie, but thanks for worrying. You're in love with him. Probably. She took a deep breath as her stomach fluttered. I'll think about that later. Right now I'm in the middle of something that's exciting, sensitive, and very likely dangerous. Now you're scaring me, Tia. I mean to. She thought of Cleo's friend. Because it's vital you don't tell anyone what I've said to you. You don't mention Malachi's name. She reached in her purse and took out a slip of paper. If you call me about anything that has to do with this discussion, use this number. My phones are tapped. For God's sake, Tia, what's this guy dragged you into? I dragged myself, that's the wonder of it. And I need you to do me a favor that might be somewhat unethical. It could be illegal, I'm not sure. I can't even think of a response to that. Anita Gay. Tia leaned forward. Morningside Antiquities. I need to know how much she's worth, personally and with the business. I need to know how much liquid cash she can get her hands on quickly. And she can't know you're looking. That's essential. Is there a way to get the information without it coming back to you? As if to anchor herself, Carrie braced her hands on the arms of her chair. You want me to look into someone's financials and pass that data on to you? I do, but only if you can do it without anyone knowing you're involved. You're not going to tell me why. I'm going to tell you there's a great deal at stake, and I'm going to use the information you give me to try to do something important and right. I'm also going to tell you that Anita Gay is dangerous and likely responsible for at least one death. Holy God, Tia, I can't believe I'm having this conversation. Not with you. If you believe this about her, why aren't you talking to the police? It's complicated. I want to meet this Sullivan character, judge for myself. As soon as I can manage it, I promise. I know what I'm asking you, and if you can't do it, I'll understand. I need to think about it. Carrie let out a long breath. I need to really think about it. Okay. Use the number I gave you when you call. Tia got to her feet. She's hurt people, Carrie. I'm going to see she pays for it. Damn it, Tia, you be careful. No, she stated as she walked to the door. Not anymore. Give her a few more minutes, Gideon urged. What good will it do for you to go running around the city looking for her? She's been gone over two hours. For more than half that time, Malachi had been sick with worry. I should never have let her go out alone. How did the woman get so hard-headed so fast? When I met her, she was pliable as putty. You want a doormat? Go buy one. Malachi spun around, burned Cleo with one hot look. Don't piss me off. Well, stop pacing around like an overprotective daddy whose little girl is past curfew. Tia's not stupid. She'll handle herself. I never said she was stupid. But as for handling herself, she's no experience doing that, has she? If she'd answer her bloody mobile, I wouldn't have to pace. We agreed not to use the mobile except for emergencies. Gideon reminded him. They're like radios, aren't they? This is a fucking emergency. I'm going to find her. He strode to the door, wrenched it open. Tia all but spilled into his arms. Where have you been? Are you all right? He nearly lifted her in the bag she carried off the ground. Worry war here was about to call out the Marines. Is that food? Cleo demanded and strolled over to snag one of the bags. Hot damn lunch. I stopped at the deli, Tia began. I'm not having it. I'm just not having it. Malachi pulled the other bag out of her hands and shoved it at Gideon. How much money have you got? He asked his brother. About twenty American. Let's have it. Malachi dug into his own pocket. We're not living off you this way like a bunch of leeches. Malachi, the money doesn't matter. It's just... Tia stopped when he cut her off. So far it's mostly been yours, hasn't it? 
Well, that stops. I'll have to get in touch with Ma, have her wire some funds over. You will not. When Tia set her jaw, planted her feet, Gideon wagged a thumb toward the kitchen. Both he and Cleo slid silently out of the range of fire. I'm not living off a woman under any circumstances, but I'm damned if I'll live off one I'm sleeping with. We agreed you'll pay me back. And if you're so sensitive about me fronting the money while we're sleeping together, then we can just stop sleeping together. You think so? Riding on fury, he grabbed her arm and dragged her toward the bedroom. You stop it. Stop it right now. She tripped, came right out of her left shoe. What's wrong with you? You're acting like a maniac. I feel like one. He slammed the bedroom door behind them, shoved her back against it. I'm not giving you up, and that's that. He crushed his mouth down on hers, and she could all but taste frustration and wounded pride. And I'm not having you pay for every crust of bread I swallow. She managed to catch a breath. I bought potato salad, smoked turkey and cannolis. I forgot to pick up a crust of bread. He opened his mouth, closed it again, then just laid his brow on hers. This isn't a joke to me. It should be. There's a lot more at stake than a grocery bill, Malachy. If you have your mother wire money, it might be traced. It's just foolish. She ran her hands over his back, kneading the tense muscles through his shirt. I have money. I've always had money. What I've never had is someone who cares enough about me to be embarrassed to take it. I couldn't stand it if he thought I'd take you for granted. I don't. Wanting him to see, to know, she framed his face with her hands, lifted it. You make me feel special. You were gone so long I was half mad with worry. I'm sorry, it's all so strange, all so strange and wonderful. She touched her lips to his, lightly, then again when she felt his heart leap against hers. Power, she thought, was a lovely thing. She slid her arms around his neck, walked him backward toward the bed. I'm going to seduce you. She nipped lightly at his jaw. It's my first attempt, so you'll have to forgive any missteps. She angled her head, rubbing her lips teasingly over his. How am I doing so far? Spot on. She nudged him down to sit on the bed, then straddled his lap. About the money, she whispered as she unbuttoned his shirt. What money? She laughed, spread his shirt open, then ran her hands possessively over his chest. I can always charge you interest. All right, whatever. And penalties, she said, then scraped her teeth over his shoulder. She eased back, peeled off her jacket, but when he reached for the buttons of her blouse, she brushed his hands away. No, let me, you just watch. I want to touch you. I know. She loosened the blouse slowly. I love knowing it. She shrugged off the blouse, rose onto her knees to unhook her trousers. Lie back, she urged, nibbling at his lips once more. She let her mouth roam, imagining his body as a lovely private feast. When her tongue slicked over his belly, she felt his muscles tremble. He was already hard, already desperate, and he knew she wanted to lead the way. He struggled to lie passive as she undressed him, not to simply grab and take, as she slowly stripped him. When she used her mouth, he choked back a groan and fisted his hands in the bedspread. His mind emptied, then filled with her. Soft skin, hot mouth, eager hands, and that subtle quiet scent he would always associate with her. The combination flooded him with need for her. At the sounds of pleasure that purred out of her throat as she nibbled on him, Heat washed into his blood, dewed his skin. She slid over him, around him. He was drenched in her, drowning. She could feel his heart galloping, almost taste the frenzied beat as she skimmed her lips over his chest. It was a marvel to see how his body quivered even as he clung to control, as he held himself back so she could do the taking. It was a revelation to know she could take what she wanted, as she wanted, as long as she wanted. She could hear his breath going ragged, feel the tension in his muscles as she touched and tasted, teased and tortured. All the while she felt so fluid, so agile, so potent. When he gasped out her name, she rose over him, then leaned down to pleasure them both with a deep and drugging kiss. No one ever wanted me like this, or made me want like this. 
A sound, almost a purr, rippled in her throat as she lowered, took him inside her. When his hands came to her hips, fingers digging in, she shuddered. She rocked, moaning when the pressure built inside her, then rolled through her in a glorious rising swell that gushed heat and light and need. She took him, took herself, slowly, savoring each ripple of pleasure. When their eyes met, she smiled and, smiling, watched his go blind. On a long sigh of triumph, she let her head fall back, let her body rule, and slid silkily under. Part 3. Cutting We are spinning our own fates, good or evil, and never to be undone. Every smallest stroke of virtue or of vice leaves its never-so-little scar. William James 21. That's him. Cleo stared at the photocopy image. He was one of the guys in Prague, the shorter one, she said, glancing up at Gideon for confirmation. The second guy was taller, broader, and he came after us on foot while this guy went for their car. The bigger guy was the one who I spotted tailing me after I met with Anita. She took a deep breath to relieve the pressure in her chest as she studied the bland black-and-white photo. This is the one who must have gone after Mikey. This is the one who killed him. Gideon laid a hand on her shoulder, left it there in a light, comforting weight. We got a pretty good look at them in Prague. We'll have Bob run his known associates, see if we get a line on the second man. Jack took the photo, pinned it to a board he'd set up. They were in his building on what he thought of as the business level. His name's Carl Dubrowski. Most of his accomplishments run to assault and larceny, hired muscle, low on brains. He was found in an empty warehouse in New Jersey, the unhappy recipient of four twenty-five caliber bullets. Do you think his partner killed him? Tia asked. Not with the twenty-five. A guy carries a gun like that, he's going to get laughed out of the kneecappers union. Anita. Malachi walked over to the board. Jack had a photo of Anita, pinned there as well. She wouldn't have been pleased he stirred up the air by killing Cleo's friend and getting nothing out of it. I didn't realize until now that I believed her capable of murder, by her own hand. But of course she is, isn't she? I'd say. The man was cool, Jack decided, as he studied Malachi, and steady, someone he could work with. The warehouse had just been sold by Morningside. My friend on the force will be having a talk with Anita shortly. What do you think her reaction will be to that? It'll piss her off, Malachi said, then dipped his hands in his pockets and rocked lightly on his heels. Then it'll please her. Add a bit of spice to the game. She'd never believe herself vulnerable. It stops being a game when people die. Rebecca waited until her brother looked at her. Cleo's lost a friend, and the man responsible for that is dead as well. Are any of us here willing to go that far? Willing to kill over a few pounds of silver? That's not what it's about, Becca. Gideon left his hand on Cleo's shoulder. It's long since gone beyond being about the value of the thing. For you, she agreed. For Mal. For you, Cleo, she asked. I want her to pay. I want her to lose. I want her to hurt. Rebecca crouched in front of Cleo's chair, stared hard into her eyes. How far will you go for it? He was a sweet, harmless man. I loved him. How far will I go? All the way. Rebecca let out a breath and got to her feet, turned to Tia. And you? You've been scooped up into this thing, had your life tumbled around. If we move forward from here, there's no going back. But you could walk away now and pick up your life as it was before we charged into it. Could she? Tia wondered. Could she go back to tiptoeing through her life, afraid someone might notice her? Could she bury herself again in the deeds of gods and never have the courage to do, to be? Oh, she hoped not. I've never done anything special in my life. Nothing that really mattered. I've never stood up for myself, not really, not when it became uncomfortable or easier to fade back into a corner again. No one who knows me expects me to, except the people in this room. She has our property, she said, nodding at Malachi. Yours and mine, and she doesn't deserve it. The three fates belong together, and I... She trailed off, flushing a bit when she realized everyone was looking at her. No, Malachi watched her. Go on, finish it out. All right. She steadied herself, as she'd learned to do before a public lecture. Everyone here has a connection to the fates, and because of them, to each other, it's like a tapestry. 
The fate spun, measured, cut the threads of Henry Wiley, Felix Greenfield, the Cunninghams, even the White Smiths. The design, the pattern they made, has already begun. You're saying it's all been ordained? Jack began, but she shook her head. It's not as simple as that. Fate isn't black or white, right or left. People aren't just plopped down and made to follow one route in life on the whims of the gods. If that were true, we'd have to say Hitler was only a victim of his own destiny and therefore blameless. I I'm getting off track. Uh-uh, Cleo disagreed. You're going under it. It's cool. Well, I suppose what I'm trying to say is we have decisions to make, actions to take, good ones and bad ones that make up the texture of our lives. Everything we do or don't do matters, she said to Jack. Everything counts at the end of the day. But the tapestry that started with the people who came before us isn't finished. Now we're the threads, Malachi said. Yes, we've begun to choose the pattern, at least individually, that we hope to make. We've still to agree on to decide the pattern we want to make together. I believe there's a reason we've come together like this, a reason we have a pattern to make. We have to see it through, try to find a way to complete it. I believe we're meant to try, however foolish that sounds. It doesn't sound foolish. Malachi stepped toward her, kissed her brow. Here we have the heart of the thing, he said. No one cups the heart of the thing in her hand quite like you do. You didn't ask me what I'd do, Jack commented, and Rebecca turned to him. I'll speak to this one, Tia. You've set your sights on the goal, and that's it for you. You're a single-minded man, Jack. That's how you've gotten where you are in the world. Good call. Now that we've got that settled, we can move on to how we intend to reach that goal. That wasn't meant to be an actual compliment. I got that, too, he said to Rebecca. These are photographs of Morningside and Anita's house. Burdette handles security upgrades on both locations. That's handy, isn't it? Interested, Malachi moved over to study the photos. That's quite the place she's got there. Marry a rich fool old enough to be your grandfather, wait it out till he keels over and pull in the big pot. Jack shrugged. Paul Morningside was a good man, but he was deaf, dumb, and blind when it came to Anita. And to give her credit, she played the role perfectly. You don't want to underestimate her. She's a smart woman. Her weakness is greed. Whatever she has, it's never going to be enough. That's not her biggest one. Tia nearly jumped when she realized she'd interrupted. I'm sorry. I was thinking out loud. Jack angled away from the board. What's her biggest weakness? Vanity. Well, ego, really, of which her vanity plays a large part. She sees herself as smarter, more clever, more ruthless, more everything than other people. She stole the first fate from Malachi. She didn't have to. She could have bought it from him. She could have doctored an analysis to convince him the piece was of little value or some variation of that. She stole it because it was more fun and it fed her ego. Look, I can take this right out of your hand, and there's nothing you can do about it. She gets what she wants, and she hurts and embarrasses someone. That adds a shine for her. That's an excellent psychological profile for a mythologist, Jack commented. You spend your life getting walked on. You learn to recognize the tread. Greed is a flaw, but her ego is her true Achilles' heel. Notch the arrow, aim for the ego, and she'll stumble. Isn't she a marvel? Grinning, Malachi grabbed Tia's hand, kissed it lavishly. Snatching the fate from under her nose ought to hit her ego dead center, Jack agreed. There are a number of steps we have to take before going there. First is to determine whether she's keeping it here, he tapped the photo of Morningside's entrance, or here, in the front-on view of her townhouse. Since we can't be sure, at least at the moment, we'll have to work out how to get to it in either place. Gideon moved over to give the board a closer look. None of us has any experience breaking into a place. You're forgetting the time we broke into the basement of Hurley's pub and tapped into that keg of harp, Malachi reminded him. I've worked to forget it for more than ten years as I came out of it with a head big as the moon. And when Ma found out, Rebecca put in, she knocked your big stupid heads together, dragged you by the ears to the priest for confession. Then we spent the whole of that summer at Hurley's beck and call. Malachi finished. We paid for that logger ten times over. He sent Jack an easy smile. Not a very good foundation for thievery, I'm afraid. That's all right, I'll teach you. At Rebecca's steely stare, he sat, stretched out his long legs. When you make your living putting up obstacles for thieves, you have to understand the criminal mind. 
and have a certain amount of respect for it. We'll need to break in to both places, he added with a nod to Gideon, to set her up for the full fall. We'll need to do both. Duper, Malachi concurred. Set her up, then put a nice pretty frame around her. With his fingers, he traced a box around Anita's photo. I like the sound of it. It sounds awfully complicated, Tia put in. Who wants a bland tapestry? We'll have to plan each level, Jack went on, and connect them. To start, there are four safes in the townhouse. Double that at Morningside. It'll take some time and effort to circumvent the security, get in, open each safe if necessary, get the fate, get out, and reestablish the security. I've got some ideas on how to use Morningside to narrow the field. But when we go for the gold, we'll need a little more time and space. If we can get her out of the way for a few days, we minimize the risk. I, um, think she might go to Athens. Tia cleared her throat, and they all turned to her. I asked my father if he might casually mention the Athens connection to her. He doesn't know what's going on, but I think he'll do it for me. He seemed sort of intrigued that I asked. Jack sat back. Good thinking. And when I give her my report and tell her one Cleopatra Tolliver booked a flight to Athens, that should nail it. We've got a lot to do before we hammer that home. We're going to want to be ready to move on the fate as soon as she's at cruising level. She didn't go to Prague after Cleo, Rebecca reminded him. Why would she go to Athens? She could send one of her pie-faced goons. They failed, Malachi sat on the arm of Tia's chair. And if she's the one who killed the guy in the warehouse, she's up the stakes considerably. She won't send an underling this time. At least not if she's convinced she may be able to scoop up both remaining fates in one go. All right, that's logical. Rebecca pursed her lips, studying the board. We want to have her keep the fate in her home, I'd think. Far too many places to secrete something in a place like Morningside. And I'd have to assume the security would be tighter there. It is. It pleased Jack that their thoughts aligned. We'd want her to have a concern, then, that Morningside isn't safe enough. Gideon angled his head. Do we lift something from there? Think of it as a dress rehearsal. Jack told him. There was considerable discussion, some argument. There were diagrams and schematics and more printouts to be pinned to the board. Tia absorbed it all. They were planning to break into one of New York's cultural landmarks, and they were planning to do so for the sole purpose of misdirection. It was fascinating. If we get into the bloody place, why don't we just look for the bloody statue? Frustration honed Rebecca's voice to an edge. We won't get that far. Not without a lot more time in preparation. We can take the time in the prep, he added. But if we do a simple B&E, snag the statue, we won't be hanging anything on her. Rephrase, Cleo spoke coolly, hanging her. If we work it right, Jack agreed. The house is doable on short notice. Morningside isn't, not with amateurs. Oh, now we're amateurs. Well, Beck. Gideon put his hands on her shoulders, gave her a little shake. We are that. Why don't you speak for yourself? I could use some tea. Tia spoke up, got to her feet. Is it all right if I use the kitchen? Help yourself, Jack told her. Wouldn't mind some coffee while you're at it. There are better facilities upstairs, Rebecca suggested after catching Tia's annoyed expression. Why don't we go up and put something together? Cleo? Even as Cleo started to protest, she caught Tia jerking her head toward the door. All right, but we take shifts on the domestic duties. When they were safely in the elevator heading up, Rebecca turned to Tia. You wanted to get away from that lot? For a few minutes. It occurs to me that this is new territory for all of us. We hardly know each other. I just don't like their superior attitude. You mean Jack's superior attitude? Cleo said as Rebecca jabbed in the code and strode out of the elevator into the apartment. In particular, he didn't even tell me he had that place down there. Before we talk about them, let's talk about us. Cleo dropped into a chair, swung her legs over the arm, and settled in. Any wine around here? She added. There is, Rebecca answered. But put a hold on that tea and coffee. Let's have a drink and see what the three of us think of each other before we go on with this business. We really should go back down. Tia bit her lip as Rebecca topped off all three glasses. Again. They don't need us at the moment. Rebecca bit into a pretzel, studied it consideringly. 
Let them huddle over their blueprints and diagrams for a bit. I can take a look at them later. Those deal with technicalities and are easily refined. That's if you know one end of a blueprint from another. Tia sipped. I don't. You won't have to. It'll be put into words for you, and those you understand very well. Maliki thinks you're brilliant. Oh, well, he's... Toast, Cleo said, and scooped up dip with a ridged potato chip. Guy's nuts about you, but he's not a moron. You are brilliant. I never got along with brains before. Your kind of brains, she explained. The academic sort? I spent most of my time in school figuring out what kind of trouble I could get into next and disliking girls just like the two of you. She grinned as she popped another chip in her mouth. Funny how things work out. Gideon wouldn't be wasting time with you if you didn't have a brain. He'd have gone for the package, Rebecca added. But once he'd unwrapped it, he'd have lost interest quickly enough if all you had to offer were nice breasts and long legs. She thanks us. Well, after all, he saw you unwrapped, so to speak, straight off, didn't he? And while we're on that subject, what's it like? Cleo only picked up her wine glass, sipped. Oh, be a sport, Rebecca complained. It's a natural curiosity, isn't it? Tia, aren't you wondering what it's like to strip down bare-assed in front of a room full of men? I never thought about... She trailed off, pinned by a smirking look from Rebecca. Maybe, she admitted. But I don't mean to offend you, Cleo. You don't. She's a lot nicer than you are, Cleo said to Rebecca. She is that. But I wasn't after offending you either. Don't you think that at some point in her life, a woman fantasizes about being built and beautiful and tormenting a lot of men by sliding out of her clothes in public? Knowing they want her but can't have her? It's powerful. It can be. It can be powerful or demeaning and exploitive. It can be fun or it can be humiliating. Depends on how you look at it. How did you look at it? Tia asked. As a paycheck, bottom line. Cleo shrugged and dug into the chips again. Modesty's not a big issue for me. Most of the men, they don't see you anyway. They just see tits and ass. For me, it paid the rent and gave me a chance to choreograph and dance. I had some pretty sharp numbers. I'd love to see some time. Not the stripping part. Tia said, going beet red when Cleo laughed. The dancing. See, she's really nice. You know what I think? That stuff you said before about all of us being meant to come together? That rings for me. The three of us would never be sitting here like this otherwise. That's cool. Now I've got a question for you, she said to Rebecca. You banging Jack yet or what? Cleo? Oh, like you don't wonder? She tossed back dismissing Tia's appalled whisper. Not yet. Rebecca lifted her glass. But I'm thinking about it. And now that we've brought up sex, I'd like to continue that area as pertains to Anita Gay. The boys downstairs, they can play with the toys, study the maps and make manly noises over the technology of the thing. But they don't understand what she is inside. It takes a woman for that. It takes a woman to really see that sort of female ruthlessness. No matter what they say, a man's always going to imagine a woman's just a bit weaker, softer, easier than he is. We're not. She's not. She's cold, Tia said quietly. All the way through, I think. It, it makes her more dangerous because she doesn't care, not on any level, about anyone but herself. She wouldn't hesitate to hurt someone to get what she wants. She probably thinks she deserves it. I'm getting analytical again. She apologized. All those years in therapy, and suddenly I'm a psychologist. I think you make sterling sense, Rebecca agreed. And I haven't met the woman as yet. I'm getting a clearer picture of her from you than I did from Maliki. His description was colored with his own embarrassment, I think, and his anger. Once she knows we've outwitted her, as by God we will, what do you think she'll do? She'll try to take it out on at least one of us. Your family, Tia said because it started with Malachi. Cleo, you agree with that? Yeah. She blew out a breath. Yeah, I do. As do I. So, we have to make certain she can't reach us. Whatever happens, we have to expose her for what she is and take away her power. I've sort of started working on that. Tia rose, walked into the kitchen to finally start the coffee. Money gives her power. 
and if you look at her marriage, you have to conclude money is vital to her. I thought it might be helpful to find out how much she has. Then we'd have an idea how much we need to. What's the word? She stopped with the coffee scoop in one hand. Hose her for her. Is that right? She asked Cleo. Isn't she great? Amateur, my ass. Tia, honey, I think you could make a living out of this. Downstairs, Gideon jiggled the loose change in his pocket. They're taking a lot of time putting together coffee and tea. Jack glanced at his computer clock, shrugged. They went up there to huddle, but he turned to his monitors, danced his fingers over a keyboard, and engaged the apartment cameras. When the women appeared on screen, Malachi let out a low whistle. You've spy cameras in your own flat. Does the word paranoia have any personal meaning for you? I prefer to think of it as thorough. They've crisps up there, Gideon pointed out. Should have known Cleo would nose out crisps. Almost looks like a party. Christ, they make a pretty picture, don't they? Classy blonde, gorgeous redhead, sexy brunette. Jack scanned the screen. Covers all the bases. Take a good look because we're going to have to decide how far into this we're going to take them. I don't see as we have much choice, Gideon commented. There's always a choice. You're meaning we can hold things back from them. Malachi had leaned closer to the screen and now straightened. Keep certain parts of the plan from them, tucking them up as it were to protect them from Anita. She's responsible for two deaths so far. She's got no reason to quibble about a third. It won't do, Jack. Malachi watched Tia pour milk into a small pitcher. They'd figure it out in any case. Rebecca would, I can guarantee that. Too right, Gideon agreed. Moreover, I started this thing lying to Tia. I don't want to lie to her again. They deserve the full truth of the matter. We'll just have to find a way to protect them despite it. I could keep them in that apartment for a week. Locked in, cut off. A week's about all we need if we move fast and move right. They'd be pissed off when they got out, but they'd be safe. Are you serious about my sister? Jack shifted his gaze from the screen, from Rebecca, and looked at Malachi. Down to the ground, serious. Then take my advice and put thoughts like that out of your head. She'd peel the skin off your face for it, and when she was done, Gideon, she'd walk away, erase you from her life the way you do letters on a chalkboard. And as for me, I won't cut Cleo out. She lost a friend and deserves taking part in avenging him. If we make a mistake, even one mistake, someone could get hurt. Jack tapped a finger on the screen. It might be one of them. Then we won't make a mistake, Malachi said. They're coming back down. I'd turn off those monitors if I were you, unless you want your coffee poured down your crotch. Good point. He blanked the screen, then swiveled in his chair. So it's the musketeers thing? All for one, Malachi began. And one for all, Gideon finished. Jack nodded, then disengaged the lock so the women could get in. As he did, the phone rang. He glanced at the light blinking on his multi-line unit. Upstairs, office line. Behind him, Tia nearly bobbled the coffee when she walked into the sound of Anita's voice. Jack, Anita Gay, I expected to hear from you by now. The answering machine picked up the irritation in her voice. It's urgent. This Tolliver woman is harassing me, and I want it to stop. I'm counting on you, Jack. There was a pause. Then the tone of her voice changed, became soft, shaky. You're the only one I can count on. I feel very alone, very vulnerable. Please, call me as soon as you can. I feel so much better if I knew you were looking out for me. And the Oscar goes to... Cleo dropped into a chair. What a load of bullshit. Oh, Jack. She hitched up her voice, fluttered her lashes. I feel very alone, very vulnerable. She stretched out, gave Jack a considering look. Did you ever do her? Cleo, you can't... No. Rebecca waved off Tia's flustered protest. I'd be interested in the answer to that. Both Malachi and Gideon became extremely busy with the coffee pot. So much, Jack thought sourly, for all for one. Thought about it, 
for about five seconds. Kept getting this image of one of the vegetable slicers. You know, he made quick, chopping motions with his hand. And her running my dick through it. Not real appealing, he added as both other men winced. Why do you work for her? First, I don't work for her. Her husband hired my company as security consultants. I liked him. Second, a job's a job. Do you only take people on your tour boat who you approve of? Fair enough, Rebecca decided, and offered him the bowl of chips as a peace offering. Are you going to call her back? Tia asked him. Eventually. We'll let her stew and steam a while. I figure my pal Bob will pay her visit tomorrow. That'll give her more to stew and steam about. She won't like being questioned by the police. Then tomorrow night, we'll give her the first real kick in the teeth with a break-in at Morningside. Tomorrow? Tia sat down heavily. So soon? How can we be ready? We'll be ready, Jack assured her, since we're going to fail. Or at least, it'll look like we did on first glance. You're going to take the first step tomorrow morning. I am? Tia listened, stupefied, as her assignment was explained to her. Why, Tia? Rebecca demanded. Of the six of us, I'm the only one Anita or one of her monkeys hasn't seen. You can't be sure of that, Jack corrected. It's very likely she's seen photos of you. Besides, we need you here. Next to me, you're the best tech. Tia knows how to think on her feet, Malachi added, and had the woman in question gaping at him. I do? And best, he said, taking her hand. She doesn't even know she's doing it. She's a way of making herself invisible and seeing what's around her, remembering what's around her. And if she's seen and recognized, no one will think too much of it. He squeezed her hand. I'm the one who suggested you for this part, Malachi told her. I know you can do it. But you have to agree. If you don't want to take it on, we'll find another way. You think I can do this? Darling, I know you can. But you have to know it as well. It was the strangest thing, Tia realized. For the first time in her life, she was the object of someone's complete confidence. It wasn't scary at all. It was lovely. Yes, yes, I can do it. Okay, Jack rose. Let's go over the steps. It was after midnight when Jack and Rebecca stepped into his apartment again. He knew she wasn't completely satisfied by the developing plan. He'd have been disappointed in her if she had been. Why do you and Cleo get to be cat burglars? He knew that was one of the sticking points for her and was pleased to detect the faintest hint of what he liked to think was jealousy in her voice. Or maybe it was wishful thinking on his part. First, to make it look like a genuine attempt at a break-in, I need more than two hands. Want a drink? No, I don't. Why Cleo's hands and not Mal's or Gideon's? They'll be patrolling the area, watching out for cops or bystanders and so on. Sure you don't want a brandy? He asked as he poured himself a snifter. Yes, that doesn't explain not finished yet. He swirled, sipped, watched with deep affection as her eyes heated at his interruption. Despite great strides in equality, a woman wandering the streets of New York in the middle of the night is more likely to get hassled than a guy. So, your brothers take the street watch, you run tech in the van with Tia, and Cleo and I do the job. It was too sensible to argue with, so she picked another angle. Tia's nervous about the morning. Tia's nervous about her shoe size. It's part of her makeup. She'll be fine. When push comes to shove, she comes through. Besides, she'll make it work because Mal believes she'll make it work, and she's in love with him. Do you think she is? Something softened inside her. In love with him. Yeah, it's going around. She kept her eyes on his as she stepped forward, took the snifter from him for one short sip. Well then, we've a busy day ahead of us. I'm going to bed. Good idea. He set the brandy down took her arms and backed her slowly against the wall. Alone. Okay. He kept his eyes open and on hers as he lowered his mouth to hers, as he took the kiss from a teasing brush of lips into quiet urgency. When her eyes began to blur, when her hands gripped his hips, he shot them both into turbulent heat, 
He felt the tremor run through her, through himself, heard the strangled moan that caught in her throat. And still he knew she held back. Why? He jerked her back. Tell me why. The ache for him was almost a pain. Because it matters. Because it matters, Jack. She laid her cheek on his. And that scares me. She turned her head, just enough to trace her lips over his cheek, then, easing away, walked down the hall and into her room. 22. It was a perfectly beautiful September morning, with the first hint of fall brisk in the air. At least Al Roker had said so during one of his cheerful reports outside Fifty Rock. But when you were caught in the vicious war of pedestrian and vehicular traffic, had already stepped on gum, and were on your way behind enemy lines, sparkling air wasn't a major concern. She felt guilty. Worse, Tia was certain she looked guilty. At any moment, she expected the people who crowded the sidewalk and street to stop and point their fingers at her. She stopped at the corner, stared hard at the don't walk signal just to keep herself focused. She had a desperate urge for her inhaler, but was afraid to dig in her purse for it. There was so much else in there, so much illegal else. Instead, she counted her own breaths, in, out, in, out as she joined the flood that poured across the intersection an instant before the signal changed. Half a block more, she said to herself, then flushed when she remembered she was wired. Tia Marsh, she thought incredulously, was wearing a wire. And everything she said, or that was said to her, was being picked up on the equipment in the van that was even now parked in a lot two blocks south of Morningside. She resisted clearing her throat. Malachi would hear her and know she was nervous. If he knew, then she'd be more nervous. It was like a dream. No, no, it was like sliding into a television show. Her scene was coming up, and for once in her life she was going to hit her cue and remember her lines. Okay, she said it quietly and purposefully this time. Here we go. She opened the door of Morningside's main showroom and stepped inside. It was more formal than Wiley's, and lacked, if she did say so herself, Wiley's quiet charm. She was aware that security cameras were recording her now. She knew precisely where they were located, since Jack had gone over the diagram with her again and again. She walked over to stare blindly at a display of mint in China, until she calmed herself. "'May I help you, madam?' Tia considered it the height of willpower that she didn't simply leap out of her shoes and cling by her fingernails to the ornately plastered ceiling at the inquiring voice. Reminding herself there wasn't a flashing guilty sign on her forehead, she turned to the clerk. No, thank you. I'd like to look around a bit. Of course, I'm Janine. Please let me know if you need any help or have any questions. Thank you. Janine, Tia noted, as the clerk slipped discreetly away, was dressed sharply in a black suit that made her look skinny as a snake and nearly as exotic. And quick as that snake, she'd summed up and dismissed Tia as beneath notice. It stung a bit, even though Tia reminded herself that was the point. She'd worn a dull brown suit and a cream-colored blouse, both of which she intended to throw out as soon as she got home, because they helped her fade into the woodwork. She wandered to a rosewood secretary and saw out of the corner of her eye that the other clerk, male this time, was as disinterested in her as Janine. There were other clerks, of course. She had the layout of Morningside flipping through her mind as she wandered. Each showroom on each floor would be manned by at least two eagle-eyed clerks, and each floor would have a security guard. They would all be trained, just as they were at Wiley's, to separate the customers from the browsers and to recognize the signs of a possible shoplifter. She remembered enough of her own training to have geared her wardrobe and her mannerisms for the job at hand. The expensive and unflattering suit, the good practical shoes, the simple brown purse, too small for serious pilfering. They gave her the look of a woman with money but no particular style. She didn't linger long at any display, but moved from spot to spot with the vague and abstracted air of a browser killing time. Neither the clerks nor the guards were likely to pay more than minimal attention to her. 
Two women came in, a mother and a daughter by the look of them, Tia decided. Janine pounced. Tia gave her points for speed and smoothness as she'd scooped up the two potentials before the mail clerk had gotten off the mark. While attention was focused across the room, Tia slipped the first listening device out of her purse and stuck it under the front lip of a secretary. She waited for alarms to sound, for men with guns to burst through the door. When the blood stopped pounding in her ears, she heard the women discussing dining room tables with Janine. She continued around the room, giving a pas de verre paperweight, in the shape of a frog, a long study, and attaching another bug to the underside of the George III refectory table on which it sat. By the time she'd worked the first floor, she felt so competent, she began to hum. She plugged another bug under the railing as she walked up to the second level. She brought Jack's diagram back into her mind, located the cameras, and did her job. Each time a clerk approached, she smiled wispily and declined their help. When she reached the third floor, she saw Janine showing her customers a Duncan Fife dining room table, seating for twenty. None of them so much as glanced at her. She had one bug left, contemplated where it would do the most good. The Louis XIV sideboard, she decided. Angling her body away from the camera, she opened her purse. Tia, it's Tia Marsh, isn't it? The word eek sounded clearly in her head, nearly fell off her tongue as she spun around and stared at Anita. I, um, oh, hello. Casing the joint. The blood that was pounding between Tia's ears drained into her toes. Excuse me? Well, you are the daughter of a competitor. Anita chuckled, but her eyes were sharp as sabers as she slid an arm around Tia's waist. I don't believe I've ever seen you in Morningside before. In the van, Malachi had to be forcibly restrained from charging out the door. Hold on, Jack snapped. She's fine. She'll handle it. She knows this was a possibility. I haven't been, Tia managed, and felt a smile try to wobble onto her face. Use it, she ordered herself. Use your fumbling ineptitude. It seems so odd, you know, never having been inside. I had an appointment a few blocks away, so... Oh, where? With my holistic therapist. The lie brought a blush to her cheeks and gave the claim perfect credence. I know a lot of people think alternative medicine is hoodoo, but honestly, I've had such good results. Would you like her name? I think I have a card. She started to open her purse again, but Anita cut her off. That's all right. I'll just call you if I have a need for hoodoo. Actually, well, that was just an excuse. I came in because I thought I might run into you. I had such a nice time at our lunch the other day, and I... I hoped we might be able to do it again. How sweet. I'll check my calendar and give you a call. I'd really like that. I I'm free most any time. I usually try to schedule my medical appointments in the morning so I can... She trailed off, cleared her throat, took a couple of labored breaths. Oh, dear. Do you have a cat? A cat? No. A reaction. Something... She began to wheeze until customers and clerks looked nervously in her direction. Allergies. <sighs> Asthma. The wheezing and gulping air made her lightheaded, so that her stumble was genuine and effective. She dragged the inhaler out of her purse, used it noisily. Come on, come with me, for heaven's sake. Anita dragged her into the elevator, jabbed the button for the fourth floor. You'll upset the customers. I'm sorry. Sorry. She continued to suck on the inhaler, while the thrill of success jolted through her system. If I could sit down a minute. Glass of water? Yes, yes. She dragged Tia through the office suites. Bring Dr. Mart a glass of water. She called out, then all but tossed Tia into a chair. Put your head between your knees or something. Tia obeyed and grinned. In Anita's manner was all the impatience and irritation the sturdily healthy feel for the sickly. Water? She croaked it, then watched Anita's gorgeous shoes march across the gorgeous carpet. 
Bring me a damn glass of water now. By the time she spun back into the room, Tia had the last bug firmly attached to the bottom of her chair. Oh, I'm sorry. So sorry. Easing up, Tia let her head fall back weakly. Such a bother, such a nuisance. Are you sure you don't have a cat? I ought to know if I have a goddamn cat. She grabbed the water from her assistant's hand and thrust it on Tia. Of course you would. It's just usually cats that cause this quick and violent a reaction. She sipped the water slowly. Then it, again, it could be pollen from the flower arrangements, which are lovely, by the way. My holistic therapist is putting me on a program that combines herbs and、um, med meditation and subliminal reinforcement and weekly purges. I'm very hopeful. Great. Anita looked meaningfully at her watch. Are you feeling better? Yes, very. Oh, you're busy, and I've taken up so much of your time. My father hates his workday interrupted, and I'm sure you're the same. I hope you'll call about lunch soon. I, my treat. She added, and knew she sounded pathetic. To thank you for your help today, I'll be in touch. Let me walk you to the elevator. I hope I didn't disrupt your day, Tia began, then stopped as Zanita's assistant got to her feet. Miss Gay, this is Detective Robbins, NYPD. He'd like to speak with you. Tia controlled a hysterical urge to laugh. Oh my, well. I should get out of your way. Thank you so much. Thank you for the water," she said to the assistant, and hurried to the elevator. She bit the inside of her cheek until it hurt. Kept right on biting until she'd gotten to the main showroom and out the door. New Yorkers were too used to lunatics to pay any attention to a drably dressed blonde giggling hysterically as she ran down the sidewalk. You were brilliant. Malachi all but hoisted her into the back of the van, then caught her in a rib-crushing hug. Bloody brilliant! I was. She couldn't stop the giggles. I really was, even though I nearly wet my pants when Anita spoke to me. Then I thought, if I can just get into her office for a minute, I can put the last little mic there. But I kept wanting to laugh. Nervous reaction, I suppose. I just somebody shut me up. Happy to. Malachi closed her mouth with his. If you kids would settle down, you might want to hear this. Jack switched the audio on, took off his headphones. Understand what a police detective might want with me? Would you like some coffee? No thanks, Miss Gay, and we appreciate your time. It concerns a property you owned, a warehouse just off Route 19, south of Linden, New Jersey. Detective, my husband owned a number of properties which I inherited. Oh, you said owned. I recently sold a New Jersey property. My lawyers and accountants handle most of those details. Is there some problem with the sale? I haven't heard anything to indicate it, and I know the deal was finalized earlier this month. No, ma'am, no problem that I'm aware of. There was a slight rustling sound, a pause. Do you know this man? He doesn't look familiar to me. I do meet a lot of people, but no, I don't recognize him. Should I? Miss Gay, this man was found inside the warehouse in question. He was murdered. Oh my God! There was a creak as Anita sat. When? Time of death is often hard to determine. We believe he died very close to the date you sold the warehouse. I don't know what to say. That property hasn't been in use for. I'm not completely sure.、Uh, six months, perhaps eight. This should have been brought to my attention. I'll have to contact the buyers. This is dreadful. Miss Gay, did you have access to the building? I did, of course.、Uh, my representative was given all the keys and security codes, which would have been turned over to the purchasers. You'll want to contact my real estate representative, of course.、Uh, let me have my assistant get you his information. I'd appreciate it. Miss Gay, do you own a gun? Yes. Three. My husband, detective. Another pause, longer. Am I a suspect? These are just routine questions, Miss Gay. I assume your three guns are registered. Yes, of course they are. I have two at home: one in my office, one in my bedroom, and I keep one here. 
It would help if you turned the guns over to us. For elimination, we'll issue a receipt. I'll arrange for it. Her voice was stiff now and frigid. Could you tell us where you were on September 8 and September 9? Detective, it's beginning to sound as if I should contact my lawyer. That's your right, Ms. Gay. If you want to exercise that right, I'll be happy to interview you with your attorney down at the station. The fact is, I'd just like to cross my T's here and let you get back to work. I'm hardly going to be dragged into the police station to be questioned about the murder of a man I don't even know. There was the slapping sound of paper against paper as she flipped through her desk calendar. She rattled off times, appointments, business and personal time. You can verify most of this with my assistant, or if need be, my domestic staff. I appreciate that, ma'am, and I'm sorry to bother you. I know it's upsetting. I'm not used to being questioned by the police. No, ma'am. case like this, you got to look at all the angles. It's a puzzler why this guy would go all the way out to New Jersey to get shot. And in that building. Well, thank you for your cooperation, Ms. Gay. Some place you got here. First time I've been inside, some place. He reiterated. My assistant will show you out, detective. Right, thanks. There were footsteps, the sound of a door closing. Then, for several long seconds, nothing but silence. Asshole! It was a vicious whisper and made Jack grin. Stupid bastard idiot! The nerve, the fucking nerve of him coming here to question me like a common criminal. Do I have a gun? Do I have a gun? Something fragile broke with a sad tinkling of glass. Didn't I leave the goddamn murder weapon behind where a ten-year-old could find it? But he comes here interrupting my day, insulting me. Bingo, Jack shouted, then sat back. She did it. Tia shuddered as she lowered herself into one of two chairs bolted into the van's floor. On audio, she could hear Anita snap at her assistant to call her lawyer. I know we believe she did, even knew it on some level. But to hear her say it just like that, annoyed, because she's being inconvenienced... It's horrible. They listened as Anita swore at her assistant when she reported the lawyer was in a meeting. Our Anita is having a bad day. Jack turned in his chair. And we're going to make it worse. You still in? He asked Tia. Yes. She was pale, but the hand she lifted to Malachi's was steady. More than ever. Gideon watched as Cleo bundled her hair under a black watch cap as she stepped back, turned in the mirror to study herself. What do you think? She did a quick pirouette. It's the latest in nighttime B&E fashion. You've plenty of time yet. Yeah, but I wanted to check out the look. Dressed in black jeans, black sweater, black sneakers, she gave her reflection one more hard stare. It works on me, the gap. Who'd have thought it? You're not nervous. Not particularly. How hard can it be not to break into a place? She did a couple of deep plies to check the give of the jeans. Too bad there wasn't time to hunt up a catsuit. When he didn't respond, she straightened. What's up, Slick? Come here a minute. Willing to oblige, she crossed to him and was surprised when he drew her into his arms, hard. Wow, what's this about? There's always a chance something will go wrong. There's always a chance a satellite will fall out of the sky and land on my head. Doesn't keep me hiding in the basement. When I dragged you into this, I didn't know you. Nobody drags me anywhere, got it? I didn't care about you then. I care about you now. That's nice. Don't start making me all squishy. Cleo, you don't have to do this. Wait, he said when she started to pull away. Let me finish. Tonight's not such a big step until you look at the hole. If things work, we'll be taking it up a level. A very big level. The next time you put on that cap, it'll be to break into Anita's house to take something from her she'll kill to keep. Something that doesn't belong to her. That's not the point. You heard her on that tape. She killed a man. And now she won't hesitate to kill another. She knows who you are. She knows who I am anyway. Listen to me. His fingers tightened on her arms. Jack could get you out of this. He'd know the way. People, papers. You could disappear with the money he'd give you for the statue. She'd never find you. Is that what you think of me? 
The rat who deserts the ship even before it starts to sink? She pushed away. Thanks a lot. I don't want her to touch you. I won't have her touching you. The restrained violence in his tone, the bubbling frustration under it, diffused her own temper. Why? I care about you, damn it. Didn't I say so? Give me another four-letter word. He opened his mouth. His tongue felt thick. Hell. She made a buzzing sound, snapped her fingers. Wrong answer. Care to try again? You can still win the trip for two to San Juan and the complete set of Samsonite luggage. This isn't easy for me. I don't like being in this position. He jammed his hands in his pockets, paced restlessly in the confined space of Tia's little office. I don't know what I'm supposed to do about it. A man doesn't have time to think under these conditions. Yeah, yeah, blah, blah. She pulled off the cap, shook out her hair. I think I'll grab a snack before we head out. He stopped her by snagging her hair, wrapping it around his hand and using it as a rope to yank her back. God damn it, Cleo, I love you, and you're going to have to deal with that. Okay. And that slow, liquid warmth inside her became a fast flood as she put her arms around him. Okay, she repeated, nesting into him. Okay. Here she thought, at last. Okay, if that's the best you can do. Shh. She wrapped her arms tighter. Quiet. This is like a hallmark moment here. He let out a sigh. I don't know what you're talking about half the time. I'll make it easy for you. I love you back. She eased away so their eyes could meet. You get that? Yeah. His grip on her hair gentled until his fingers were stroking through it. That I got. He brought his lips to hers, slid them both into a long, sumptuous kiss. We'll need to talk about this eventually. You bet, she said and locked her mouth to his again. I want to tell the others we need to find another way. No. Now she pulled free. No, Gideon, I do my part just like Tia did hers this morning. Just like we're all doing. I owe Mikey that. And it's more, she continued before he could speak. I'm going to be straight with you. I'm a bust. What the devil does that mean? As a dancer, I'm a bust. That's not true. I've seen you. You saw me strip she corrected. A three-minute number where I shake it, peel it, and sell it to the crowd. Big fucking deal. She dragged her hair back, huffed out a breath. I'm a good dancer, but so is every second kid who ever took dance class. I'm not great and never will be. I like being part of the company when I could get the gig. I like being part of something. I never had that with my family. Cleo, this isn't some deep philosophical confession of my unhappy childhood. I'm just saying I liked dance. I liked being with other dancers because we could make something together. Sort of like that tapestry Tia was talking about before, you know? Yes. He thought of his world in Cove, family, the business, and the need to hold both together. I know. I spent nearly ten years as a gypsy, and the only real friend I made was Mikey. I gotta figure one of the reasons for that is I was never involved enough. I get bored. Same show, same routine, same faces, night after night and twice on Wednesday. He traced a finger along her eyebrow, over the little mole at its tip. You needed more. She shrugged. I don't know. But I do know that when you're a good dancer with a mediocre singing voice, you better have plenty of drive and ambition if you expect to make a living on stage. I didn't. So when that bastard dangled the idea of the theater in Prague, the chance to choreograph, I jumped. Look where I landed. I had a lot of time to think when I was scraping bottom in Prague, kept focused on getting back to New York, even though I didn't have a clue what I was going to do once I did. I guess I know now. She picked up the watch cap, twirled it. I'm part of something now. I've got friends, Tia, especially Tia. I guess I've got family, and I'm not walking away from it. She blew out a long breath. And that concludes the true confessions portion of our entertainment. He said nothing for a moment, then took her cap, snugged it down over her head. It looks good on you. The back of her eyes stung, but her voice was cocky. You got that backwards, Slick. I make it look good. 
They took shifts monitoring Morningside. After seven, when the place locked down for the night, it was a boring, thankless job. But they would continue monitoring, listening for any change, any sound, until the job was finished. At three, Malachi had heard Anita's assistant, whom they dubbed Whipping Girl, remind her boss of a salon appointment and her evening's dinner engagement. Anita had left ten minutes later, after haranguing her attorney over the phone and hadn't come back. At midnight, Rebecca was manning the listening post, from the rear of the van. When Jack climbed in the back, all she could drum up was a scowl. My brains are going to start leaking out of my ears if I have to do this much longer. We leave in an hour. He leaned down, his head close to hers, to study the readouts, then sniffed the side of her neck. What's the perfume for? To drive you mad with frustrated desire. Could work. He turned his head so his lips skimmed over hers, came back to linger. Definitely could work. Do the run for me, sector by sector. Could work, she realized, both ways. I've done it for you five hundred times already. I know what I'm doing, Jack. You've never worked this equipment before. Practice makes perfect, Irish. She muttered curses but obeyed. I like the way you kiss me. That's handy, because I plan on spending fifty years or so at it. When I give a man an inch, that doesn't entitle him to run the mile. Sector one. Alarms. Silent and audible. Up. Motion detectors up. Infrared up. She keyed in codes she knew by heart now and scanned the readouts on her monitors. Exterior and interior doors. Secured and online. She continued through the sixteen sectors that comprised Jack's security system for Morningside. Shut down alarms in Sector five. Shut them down. Practice, baby. Take Sector 5 down for ten seconds. She let out a breath, rolled her shoulders. Shutting down Sector 5. He watched her fingers moving smoothly, briskly over the keyboard. There's a beeping inside the sector. Should I... That's normal. Keep going. Sector's down. She watched the clock now, counting off the seconds. At ten, she keyed in another sequence and watched the system come back up. Alarms up in Sector 5. I told you ten seconds. It was ten. No, it took four to bring the system back up fully, so that's fourteen seconds. Then you should have said. I said ten, so ten's what I needed. He patted her head. Success is in the details. She frowned while he opened his bag to give his portable equipment a final check. If the whole place was shut down, how long to bring security back online? Now there's a question. Standard alarms, exterior doors and windows are instantaneous. Motion, infrared, interiors come on level by level. Four minutes, twelve seconds to bring it up to full scope and capacity. It's a complicated system with multi-layers. That's too long, you know. There's a way to shave it. Probably. I wager I could shave a full minute off that 412 had I access to the entire system and the time to play with it. Looking for a job, Irish? Just saying, she replied, as she angled her chair away from him. Timing matters, after all, in all manner of things. Is that your way of saying my timing's been off with you? It's my way of saying I like picking my own time. Wouldn't hurt my feelings if you shaved some of that off. I'm going to get the others. Twenty-three. A parking place on the street, Upper East Side. Jack shook his head. He was driving the van with Cleo riding shotgun. We'll have to take it as an omen. He maneuvered the van between a late model sedan and an aging SUV. She ducked down to look through the windshield at the street light. Kinda in the spotlight here, aren't we? Your city taxes at work. Yours, maybe. I'm not getting a paycheck these days. Her eyes widened when he pulled a gun from under his seat. Whoa, big guy, you didn't say anything about armed beanie. In for a penny, he said. Sit tight. He climbed out, walked casually down the sidewalk, then, turning, shot out the streetlight with a muffled pop and a musical tinkle of glass. BB gun, he told her, when he slid back into the van. He reached behind him, knocked three times on the partition that separated the cab from the back of the vehicle. Seconds later, the van shifted and the rear door opened, closed. 
In her side-view mirror, Clea watched Gideon and Malachi step onto the sidewalk. Gideon headed east, Malachi west. And they're off, she mumbled. They waited three long minutes in the dark, in silence, before Jack's walkie-talkie hissed. For a city that never sleeps, Malachi said. It's damn quiet out here. Clear on the east as well, Gideon reported. Stay on this channel. Jack knocked twice on the partition, looked at Cleo when he heard the answering rap from the back. Ready? As canned ham. They got out on opposite sides. Jack slung his bag over his shoulder and, when he reached Cleo, slung his arm over her shoulders. Just a couple of urbanites out for a stroll. Cops tend to do a lot of drive-bys in Tony neighborhoods like this, she commented. Just how many years in the pen can you get for what you're carrying in that man purse? It's a bag, just a bag. Three to five, he decided, if the judge is a hard case. Suspended, I've got connections. He palmed his walkie-talkie. Crossing Madison at 88th. Good to go. From Malachi. And here. From Gideon. Base copies that. Rebecca reported. Jack took her hand as they walked by the entrance of Morningside, turned the corner. They worked their way around to the delivery entrance. As rehearsed, Cleo took out her walkie-talkie while Jack opened his bag. Ground zero, she said quietly. James Bond here is breaking out his toys. I'm at, what is it, uh, 89th between 5th and Madison, Malachi said. Looks to be a party in a flat here. A number of people fairly well pissed are coming out. I'm heading back from Park Avenue. Gideon checked in. Saw a few street people in doorways and a goodly amount of traffic for this time of night. No problems. Ready to go up? Jack asked. She nodded, craned her head to study the four stories. There's this really good door here. I just want to point that out. Odds are she has the fate in her office safe. It'll make her more nervous if the break-in targets the upper floors. He aimed what Cleo thought of as a harpoon, shot out a three-prong hook and length of rope. Harness, he said, and shot the second line while she shrugged into her harness. He clicked the safety, attaching her, then repeated the steps with his own. On three, he told her. You were square with me about your weight, weren't you? Just count, pal. One, two, three, Jack said, and pressed the mechanism on his harness. They went up smoothly and a bit more quickly than Cleo had anticipated. Jesus, what a rush! Keep your eyes on the roof. If that's like telling me don't look down, it's exactly the wrong... Oh, shit. She whispered as she did indeed look down. Teeth gritted, stomach flopping, she fumbled for the ledge skidding a little as her palms had sprung with sweat, and heaved herself over with no grace whatsoever. You okay? Yeah, yeah, just threw me for a minute. Four stories looks a lot higher when you're up there. Without a floor under you, I'm cool. She remembered her next step and pulled out her two-way. Base, we're on the roof. Copy that, Rebecca answered. Shutting down alarms in Sector 12 in 60 seconds. Mark. Mark, Cleo echoed as Jack depressed the timer on his watch, nodded. He tucked the two-way back in his bag, fixed on a headset. All units copy? He nodded again when he got affirmative responses. Got your breath back? Jack asked Cleo. Yeah, I'm solid. He gave his line, then hers, a last testing tug. She eased off the ledge, took one huge breath, then let herself slide into the air. The breath rushed out of her lungs, but she steadied the bag for him as they dangled. Following his directions, she braced her feet on the wall of the building, relaxed her knees. Jack's watch beeped quietly, and Rebecca's voice came through his headset. Sectors down. Five minutes. Mark. A cab drove by on the street below, turned at the corner, and headed up Madison. He attached a portable scrambler to the window glass punched in a code, and waited while the numbers ran. When the display glowed green, he detached it, handed it off to Cleo. Window backup system offline. Silent alarm killed. He fixed suction cups to the window, held out his hand like a surgeon. Cleo slapped the glass cutter into his hand. 
Despite the chill, a line of sweat dribbled down her back. Four minutes thirty, she announced, while he meticulously cut through the reinforced glass. The wail of a siren had her choking back a startled yelp. You steady? As Gibraltar. Take your end. She gripped the wire from the suction cup in her gloved hands while Jack mirrored the gesture with the second. At his nod, they lowered the pane inch by inch inside the building until it rested on the floor. Going in, he said quietly, and boosted himself inside the window. Three minutes thirty, Rebecca warned him. He unhooked his harness, stepped carefully around the glass, then moved fast through the office area. Cleo rolled in after him and sprinted in the opposite direction. Crouched at Anita's office door, Jack took out a lockpick. It took him nearly as long to make what would appear to be a botched attempt at picking the lock as it would have to succeed. At the top of the steps, Cleo debated briefly between a baccarat wafer dish and a lalique vase. With no regret, she tipped over the vase, stepping clear as it shattered on the floor. Two minutes, Jack. Cleo, move out now. Copy. They met back at the window, but this time Jack brought his heel down deliberately on the edge of the window pane to crack it. He attached his line back through the opening behind her. Down, he said to Cleo. Use your feet. Keep your knees loose. Everybody back to base. He said into his headset. On the descent, he dropped a spare jammer attached to a torn belt loop. Why, it's a clue, Cleo said breathlessly as her feet hit the ground. We got one minute. Start back. No, I leave with the guy I came with. She unhooked her line, shrugged out of her harness, and stuffed it back in the bag as Jack did the same. Then she glanced at the dangling rope. Bet that stuff's expensive. But not that hard to come by. Once again, he draped an arm over her shoulders. They walked, just a bit faster than a stroll. It'll look like the thieves ran into security trouble and had to abort, and fast. Five minute mark, Rebecca announced. Systems rebooting. You've got thirty seconds. What did you break? Some vase scattered a few whatnots around for good measure. Thieves in a hurry drops loot. Works for me. One question. Cleo asked him. You didn't need a sidekick for tonight. Why'd you bring me? The point was to make it look like no less than two involved. I couldn't have gotten to opposite ends of the fourth floor in the allotted time. Knowing there were two should make Anita a little more nervous. One would have made her nervous enough. Yeah, but it'll take two to get into the house, into the safe, and get out again without any hitch. I needed to see how you held up. So this was like an audition. There you go, and you got the part. Wait till I tell my agent. They were a full block away, walking easily now, hand in hand, when the alarms went wild. It was just past 2 a.m. when Jack popped the cork on a bottle of champagne. I can't believe the whole thing took less than an hour. Tia dropped into a chair. I'm exhausted, and I didn't do anything. We're the tech crew. Rebecca reminded her, "That's essential personnel, and we were superb." It's a bit early for backpatting and celebration. Malachi lifted his glass. But what the hell? Just knowing Anita's going to be wakened by the police is cause enough for a round. We've a lot of work ahead of us yet. Don't bring me down. Cleo gulped down the first glass of champagne. I'm still flying. You think Anita'll drag her ass out of bed and go down there? Count on it. The cops will notify her. She'll get there quick, fast, and in a hurry. First thing she'll do: check her office safe, or she will if that's where she stashed the fate. When she reassures herself it's where she left it, she'll do a dance with the cops. Then she'll start calling me. She's going to be seriously pissed with Burdett Securities. But you'll fix that, Malachi said. Yep, because the system held. That's number one. They got in, but didn't have enough time to do the job because the backup system clicked into place as advertised. Then I'll give her my report on Cleo. I bet it's terribly hot in Athens this time of year. Tia mused. Do you think she'll leave soon? If we have two days to put this all together, I'll be satisfied. He winked at Cleo. My partner is a natural. I think we could have gone all the way tonight. Cleo held out her glass for a second round. 
into her office, into the safe, and away with the prize. Maybe, Jack agreed. Be a damn shame if we'd gone to all that trouble and it wasn't there. Yeah, yeah, practicalities. But all in all, you know how to show a girl a good time. That's what they all say. You should go get some sleep, all of you. I'll man the recorder. She's going to be calling me in an hour or so anyway. I could make you some coffee and sandwiches, Tia offered. You're a jewel, you are. And so, two hours later, almost to the minute, while he polished off a ham and cheese on rye, Jack's home line rang. He smiled, let it ring three times. He'd already heard Anita curse him from her office, just as he'd heard her open her office safe, breathe a long sigh of relief. Burdette! Jack! God damn it, Jack! I'm at Morningside. There's been a break-in. Anita? When? Tonight. The, the police are here now. I want you in here, Jack, and I want you in here now. Give me twenty minutes, he said. He hung up and finished his coffee. By the time he arrived, the crime scene unit was busily at work. He figured he'd left them enough to keep them that way. He got a minor hassle from one of the uniforms blocking the entrance of the building and had to flag down a familiar face, then wait to be cleared. Normally, the delay would have been mildly irritating, but in this case, he figured it only gave Anita more time to stew. He found her in her office, verbally skinning one of the investigators who'd been unlucky enough to catch the case. I want to know what you're doing to find the people who violated my property. Ma'am, we're doing everything possible to... If you were doing everything possible, someone couldn't have broken a window and climbed into this building. I'd like to know where the police were when thieves damaged my property and waltzed into this building. That's what I'd like to know. Miss Gay, the first unit responded within two minutes after the alarm. Two minutes is too late. She bared her teeth, and it occurred to Jack that if she worked herself up much higher, she'd use them to bite someone's throat out. I expect the police to protect my property. Do you have any conception of the taxes I pay in this area? I'm not funneling thousands of dollars into this city so the police force can sit on their asses eating donuts while thieves walk off with priceless antiques. Ms. Gay, at this time we can't be sure if any of your inventory was stolen if you'd through no help of the New York Police Department. Now you and your clumsy, fat-fingered colleagues are stomping around my building making a mess of things and you refuse to tell me the status of the investigation. Would you prefer I call the mayor, a personal acquaintance of mine, and ask him to speak to your superior? Ma'am, you can call God Almighty and I'm still not going to be able to tell you any more than I have. This investigation is just over two hours old. I'd be moving that investigation along a lot faster if you'd give me information instead of slinging abuse and threats. Jack figured she hadn't painted and polished herself as carefully as usual, and with the furious color staining her cheeks, it was hardly surprising Anita wasn't looking her best. I want your name and your badge number, and I want you off my property. Detective Lewis Gilbert. Lou was already taking one of his cards out of his wallet. Jack decided to give him a break and distract Anita. He put what he hoped was concern on his face and stepped into the room. Lou! Jack! Lou laid the card on Anita's desk. Got the word the security was Burdett. Yeah. Jack's mouth went grim. Where did they breach? Fourth floor window, rear, far east corner. Did they get inside? Yep. Tripped up somewhere, though. Sprang the alarm. Left some toys behind. They get anything? Lou slid a baleful glance in Anita's direction. Undetermined. I'd like to speak with Mr. Burdett privately, Anita said coldly. Knowing it was likely to make her choke on her own bile, Jack held up a finger and continued talking to Lou. If I could take a look at the breach, I might be able to give you something on it. Appreciate that. I will not be ignored while you... Just hold on. Jack interrupted Anita's newest tirade and walked out with Lou, leaving her vibrating with fury. Piece of work, that one. Lou began. Tell me about it. The shit she was dumping on you won't come close to what she'll dump on me. They walked to the east corner, where the office area opened into an alcove. The chilly early morning air came through the empty window. Crime scene people were measuring, dusting, picking at the window frame for trace evidence. Must have counted on the upper window being most vulnerable, Jack began. 
That glass is reinforced and wired. They had to circumvent the primary alarm system to get this far. Serious tech capabilities required for that. How'd they get up here? Repel lines. Looks like the alarm went, and they took off in a quick hurry. Left the lines behind. Huh. Jack frowned, tucked his thumbs in his pockets. Might be they didn't count on the secondary system. He explained the setup as he and Lou walked downstairs and into the utility area, where the main security panels were installed. I should be able to do a run, see how long the system was down. Maybe how it came to be put down, once you guys are finished doing what you do. But I can tell you just from what I've already seen, they didn't do it from down here. Who knows the system, this particular one? My team? You know how I screen my people, Lou. Nobody who works for me had a part in this. If they did and were stupid enough not to take out the secondary, hell, I'd have to fire them for it. Lou gave a snort, scratched his jaw. Need the names, anyhow. You know how it goes. Yeah, part of the job description. He blew out a breath. I'll have to check, see who worked with me on this job. Original system was put in for the old man, Paul Morningside. I've done some upgrading since. The widow insists on the latest, and not just in her designer shoes. He opened his mouth, then shook his head, shut it again. Spill, Lou demanded. I don't want to influence the angle of your investigation. As if reluctant, Jack dragged a hand through his hair, glanced toward the stairway. I just want to point out that the client knows the system, or its basic makeup. Lou looked decidedly cheered at the notion. Guess she would, wouldn't she? Now I'm going to have to go up and let her bust my balls. Got a next of kin I should notify? Jack spared Lou a sour smile, then headed back up. Anita was just slamming down the phone when Jack walked into her office again. He wondered fleetingly who she'd called to berate at five in the morning, then saw the insurance file open on her desk. The lady didn't waste any time. Have you decided you can spare a moment for me? Her voice dripped, like sugar laced with strychnine. I won't do you any good unless I know what happened. I can't figure out what happened until I see the system and the breach. I'll tell you what happened. You were paid to design and install a security system to protect my business from vandals and thieves. You're paid a monthly retainer to maintain, evaluate, and oversee that system, with additional fees for upgrading as the technology becomes available. I see you read your contract, he said mildly. You think you're dealing with a bimbo here? Her voice spiked as she stalked around her desk. You think because I have tits I don't have a fucking brain? I never underestimated your brain, Anita. Or commented on your tits. Why don't you sit down? Don't tell me to sit down. She jabbed a finger into his chest, and her eyes widened in shock when he closed his hand over her wrist. Watch it. His voice remained level. A cop might have to tolerate a civilian's bullshit, but I don't have to tolerate a client's. Pull yourself together. Do you think you can speak to me that way? And he saw by her expression and the tone of her voice that she liked it. Go figure, he thought in disgust. Slap at me, I slap back. I didn't roll out of bed at four in the morning because you snapped your fingers. I'm here because I stand by my work. Now sit down and calm down. He could almost see the instant she decided to change gears, the moment she opted to turn on the tears. I've been violated. I feel so exposed, so helpless. My ass, he thought, but played the game with her. I know you're upset and scared. Sit down now. He led her to a chair. Do you want me to get you anything? Some water? No, no. She waved a hand. Then dabbed delicately at her cheek with the side of her finger. It's just so difficult, and the police—I can't tell you what it's like. They're so cold, so callous. You understand what morning side is to me. This break-in, Jack, is a kind of rape. You let me down. I depended on you to protect what's mine, and I have. How can you say that? The system failed. No, it didn't. It worked. If it hadn't, you'd be filing a claim for a lot more than a pane of glass. The secondary system kicked in, just as designed. I don't know what they've taken. 
she insisted. I've been too upset to start checking inventory. Then we'll deal with it. I'll be working with the police as closely as possible. Burdett will inspect, evaluate, repair, and replace any and all parts of the system as necessary, at our expense. I'll have a team here as soon as the cops clear the crime scene. The secondary would have taken over five minutes after the primary went offline. Odds of anyone getting much of anything out in that space of time are pretty low. I'd concentrate on checking this floor, and it's uh, mostly office space. He paused, deliberately scanned her office. You've got some valuables in here and in the waiting areas outside. How about your office door? Was it secured? She drew a breath, let it out shakily. Yes, I locked it and set the alarm on it before I left. The police, they think someone tried to pick the lock. He frowned, walked over, and stooped to study the lock himself. Yeah, looks like an attempt, not a very good one. He straightened. I can't see why they'd waste time stripping down an office with what's laid out in the showrooms. A few goodies lying around, but nothing worth the time and trouble. He was watching her as he spoke and he saw her gaze toward the purse that sat on her desk. They'd hardly break into Morningside looking for office equipment, she began and rose. In a casual move, he beat her to the purse by two strides. She froze. I'm going to go over the system, chip by chip, he promised, picking up the elegant and heavy snakeskin bag. I'm sorry you have to go through this, Anita, but trust me, Morningside is as secure as possible. Now... Why don't you fix your face? He handed her the purse, saw her fingers dig possessively into the supple leather. And I'll drive you home, so you can get some sleep before you have to face all this. I couldn't possibly sleep, she began, then reconsidered. No, you're right. I, I should go home. Clear my head. She tucked the bag and its contents firmly under her arm. And I'd feel safer with you taking me home. He was banking on catching a couple hours sleep himself and was surprised to see Rebecca in the living room when he came in. I heard the elevator, she said. I was restless. You've been out. Yeah. He shrugged off his jacket. She called on cue. It went so much as expected, I could have written the script. She's locked the fate in her home safe by now. You're sure of that? As death and taxes. He filled her in, short and spare as he walked into the kitchen, pulled out orange juice, and drank straight from the carton. Rebecca was too fascinated to scold him for it. You were so close to it. I don't know if I could have stopped myself from just planting a fist in her face and walking away with it. It's a thought. I've never hit a woman before, but she'd be a satisfying first. It's nearly as satisfying knowing we've messed with her ahead. He replaced the juice, or as satisfying as what's coming next. We'll go back over in a while, me and my top tech, he added with a wink, to run a system check personally. She took the carton back out of the fridge, shook it to show him it was empty, then tossed it in the trash. And what's my hourly wage? Contingent on performance. How'd you know that was empty? The juice. Because you're a man and I was reared with two of your kind. And after I've completed my brilliance with the security system... I give Anita a report. Then I'll remember about that other little task she asked me to do. He yawned, rubbed his hands over his face. But now I'm going to grab a shower and some sleep. You're working awfully hard for this, Rebecca commented as he walked toward the bath. Risking a great deal as well. He stopped, turned. When something matters, you work for it, and the risks don't count. Alone. Rebecca let out the breath she'd barely been aware she'd been holding. So much mattered, she'd realized. So much, it was almost too much. And the fear of that had held her back. That was foolish, she thought. You could never have too much that mattered. And a woman who continued to step back from love was wasting valuable time. In the shower, Jack turned the water to near blistering, braced his hands on the tile and let the pumping spray beat on his head. The adrenaline that had kept him going for a straight twenty-four hours was used up. His brain felt dull. He couldn't afford to go up against Anita again until he'd had a little time to recharge. Couldn't afford it, especially since he was taking Rebecca in with him. He closed his eyes and let his mind empty. 
Nearly asleep on his feet, he didn't hear the bathroom door open or close again with a quiet click. He didn't hear the soft slither of her robe sliding to the floor. But an instant before she opened the glass panel, an instant before she stepped into the heat and steam with him, he smelled her. His head snapped up, his body jerked to alert. And her arms slid sinuously around him, her breasts pressed, firm and wet, into his back. He looks so tired. Rebecca trailed her tongue up the line of his spine. I thought I'd offer to wash your back. We're naked in the shower because I'm tired? What was that you said earlier about timing? I thought the timing perfect. She slithered around him, slicking her hair back as the spray soaked it, then sliding her gaze down his body. Her lips quirked. And from where I'm standing, you don't look so very tired after all. I think I'm getting my second wind. Let's not waste it. She rose on her toes, then sank her teeth delicately into his bottom lip. I want your hands all over me, Jack, and your mouth. I want mine all over you. I have from the first minute. He fisted a hand in her streaming hair. Why did we wait? Because I wanted you from the first minute. She laid her palms on his chest, spread her fingers. Your brothers mentioned you were perverse. And they should know. Do you want to discuss that now, or do you want to have me? Guess, he said, and lowering his head, savaged her mouth with his. She was breathless, laughing when he let her breathe again. Why don't you give me another little hint? Sure. He pressed her back against the tile wall, took her mouth again while steam billowed and water pulsed, almost brutally hot over them. Then it was just as she'd demanded. Hands and mouths frantic and fast. Flesh sliding wetly against flesh, as each of them tried to reach more, take more. There was a volcano of need in him, bubbling, boiling just under the surface. Recklessly, she wrapped herself around him, clung to him, shuddered, and let herself burn. This is what I want, Jack. With her bones already melting, she bowed back as his teeth nipped down to close over her breast. It was everything, beyond all. Having her reach for him, seeing her surrender, feeling her body quake with passion was everything and more. And he could take her now, give to her now. When he ravished her mouth, she met the assault with equal urgency. Desperate for the heat, he plunged his fingers into her, and her hips pumped to match the frantic rhythm. She came with a fast and frenzied violence that left them both weak. He felt the long, lean muscles of her legs tremble and tense as he gripped her thighs and hauled her higher. The pure ivory skin flushed with rose and sheened with water against the slick white tiles, and water darkened her hair so it lay like fired gold ropes over her shoulders. She looked, he thought, like a mermaid rising up out of a white sea. You're beautiful. He cupped her hips, lifted them. So beautiful, belong to me. She sighed once long and deep. I already do. He slid inside her, filled her, and, with a savage edge dulled, loved her slowly. Long, deep thrusts that thrilled. As she crested, she said his name, lifted her mouth to his, offered. Then she wrapped herself around him cradled his head on her shoulder and rode the thunder of her own heart as he emptied himself into her. 24. They tumbled into bed, still damp, still breathless. I have to dry my hair. In a minute. You catch a chill going to bed with wet hair. But she yawned and snuggled against him. Not only sated, not only satisfied, she'd realized, but saturated. You've a wonderful bill, Jack. Next time, I'd like to feel it on top of me. But you get some sleep first. He tangled his fingers in her wet hair. Why now? She lifted her head. You're tired. And even such a fierce lover needs a bit of rest. 
Why now? He repeated, so she couldn't pretend to misunderstand. All right then. She got up, fetched a towel from the bathroom, and sitting beside him, began to dry her hair. In the shower, you look like a mermaid. You still do. You don't look like a man who'd think or say such poetic and romantic things. She reached out, traced a fingertip over the scar, over the tough lines of his face. But you do. I never thought I had a weakness for the poetic and the romantic, but I do. She eased back, continued to dry her hair. I had a dream, she said. I was in a boat, not a grand ship like the Lusitania, nor one of our tour boats, but a white boat. Sleek and simple, it slid without a sound over blue water. It was lovely, peaceful and warm. And inside my head, I knew I could pilot that boat anywhere I wanted. She shook back her damp hair and used the towel to blot water drops from his chest and shoulders. I had the freedom for that and the skill. I could see little storms here and there, blurred on the horizon. There were eddies and currents in the water, but they didn't worry me. If a sail's nothing but smooth, I thought in my dream, it gets tedious. And in my dream, there were three women who appeared in the bow of the boat. This I decided is interesting. She got up again, went to his dresser, opened the top drawer, and took out a white T-shirt. You don't mind, do you? Help yourself. I know where you keep your things, she said as she pulled the shirt over her head. As I've had no respect for your privacy. Now where was I? You were in your boat with the fates. Ah,、oh, yes. She grinned, pleased he'd understood. The first who held a spindle spoke. I spin the thread, but you make it what you will. The second held a silver tape for measuring and said, I mark the length, but you use the time. And the third, with her silver scissors, told me this. I cut the thread, for nothing should last for ever. Don't waste what you're given. She sat again, curled up her legs, and in the way of dream creatures, they faded away and left me alone in that pretty white boat. So I said to myself, "Well, now, Rebecca Sullivan, here's your life spread all around you like blue water, with its storms and its peaceful times, its eddies and its currents. And where do you want to go with it? What do you want in the time you'll have? Do you know what the answer was? What?" She laughed, leaned over, kissed him lightly. Jack. That was the answer, and I don't mind saying I wasn't entirely pleased with it. Do you know when I had that dream? When? The night I met you. She took the hand he'd lifted for hers and rubbed his knuckles over her cheek. Hardly surprising, it gave me a bad moment or two. I'm a cautious woman, Jack. I don't grab for something just because it looks appealing. I've been with three men in my life. The first time it was hot blood and a raging need to find out what it was all about. The second was a boy I had deep affection for, one I hoped I might spend my life with. But as it happened, he was just one of those eddies in the sea. You're the third. I don't give myself lightly. He sat up, cupped her face in his hands. Rebecca. Don't tell me you love me. Her voice shook a bit. Not yet. My heart went for you so fast. I swear it left me breathless. I needed to let my head catch up. Lie down, won't you? Let me snuggle up. He drew her down with him, settled her head on his shoulder. I won't mind traveling, she said, and the hand he'd lifted to stroke her hair froze. Good. She smiled, pleased that he'd tensed. Some things, some right things, might come easy, but they should never come without impact. I've always wanted to, and I'll expect to know a great deal more about this business of yours. I'm not a sit at home and iron your shirt sort. I send mine out anyway. That's fine then. I can't leave Ireland altogether. My mother. I miss Ma. Her voice went thick. And she pressed her face against his neck. Something fierce, especially now when I'm in love and can't tell her about it. Ah, well, soon enough. She sniffled, brushed a tear away.
Anyway, you can expect me to get my hands into your company. I wouldn't have it any other way. I want you in my life, Rebecca. I want in yours. I have to ask you a question. Why didn't your marriage work? A lot of reasons. That's an evasion, Jack. Bottom line, we wanted different things. Different directions, he thought. Different goals. What did you want that she didn't? He was silent for so long, her nerves began to stretch. Kids. With those words, she all but melted into a puddle of love and relief. Oh, how many do you have in mind? I don't know, a couple anyway. Only two. She made a snorting sound. Piker, we can do better than that. Four should suit me. She tucked the sheet under her chin, shifted, sighed. You can tell me you love me now. I love you, Rebecca. I love you, Jack. Go to sleep a while. I already set your alarm clock for 9.30. She slid into sleep and into dreams, into the white boat gliding over a blue sea, and this time Jack stood at the wheel beside her. Twenty minutes before Jack's alarm rang, Gideon brewed the first pot of coffee for the day. He rooted through Tia's cupboards and found the poppy seed bagels. He was beginning to appreciate the American's fondness for bagels. While the others slept, he tucked the bagel into his jacket pocket, poured an oversized mug of black coffee, and headed to the door. He'd have his breakfast and a morning smoke up on the roof. He opened the door and stared at the attractive black woman who had her finger poised to ring the buzzer. She jumped. He tensed. And when she let out a quick, nervous giggle, he shifted gears smoothly. Gave us both a jolt, didn't it? He offered her a broad smile. Something I can help you with? I'm Carrie Wilson, a friend of Tia's. She shifted her gears as skillfully as he and studied him carefully now. You must be Malachi. Actually, I'm Gideon. Tia's mentioned you. Are you coming in? Her measuring gaze narrowed. Gideon who? Sullivan. He stepped back an invitation just as Malachi came out of the bedroom. That would be Mal. We're just starting to stir. We had a late night. Still on the edge of the threshold, Carrie goggled at both men. Good God, she's got two of you? I don't know whether to be impressed or... I'll stick with impressed. Actually, one of them's mine. Cleo, wearing nothing but a man's T-shirt, strolled out of the spare room. Great shoes, she said after giving Carrie the once-over. Who are you? Rewind. Jaw set, Carrie marched in, shut the door. Who are you? And where's Tia? She's sleeping yet. Malachi aimed a smile that was every bit as potent as Gideon's, and in Carrie's opinion, just as suspicious. I'm sorry, I didn't catch the name. I'm Carrie Wilson, and I want to see Tia right this minute. She set her briefcase down, pushed up the sleeves of her Donna Karen jacket. Or I start kicking some ass. Start with one of them, Cleo requested. I haven't had my coffee yet. Why don't you pour some for everyone, Malachi said. Tea is just sleeping in a bit. We were up late. Move aside. Carrie took a meaningful step closer. Now. Suit yourself. He moved out of her path and watched her stride into the bedroom. I think we're going to need that coffee. The drapes were drawn. All Carrie saw in the dim light was a lump in the middle of the bed. A tongue of fear licked over her annoyance as she thought of all the things a trio of strangers might have done to her trusting, vulnerable friend. There had been a bulge in the dark-haired man's jacket pocket. A gun, she thought. They were drugging Tia, holding her at gunpoint. Terrified at what she'd find, Carrie tore the sheets away. There was Tia, buck naked and curled in a cozy ball. She blinked, sleepily, started to stretch, then let out a thin scream. Carrie! What's going on here? Who are these people? Are you all right? What? What? With a blush rising from her toes, Tia crossed her arms modestly over her breasts. What time is it? What the hell difference does that make? Tia, what's wrong with you? Nothing's wrong with me except... Jesus, Carrie, I'm naked. Give me the sheet. Let me see your arms. My what? I want to check for needle marks. Need Carrie, I'm not on drugs. Keeping one arm tight over her breasts, she held out the other. I'm perfectly fine. I told you about Malachi. 
More or less. You didn't mention the other two. And when my best friend whose toes would fall off if she considered jaywalking asked me to break the law, she's not perfectly fine. I'm naked, was all Tia could think of. I can't talk to you when I'm naked. I have to get dressed. Christ. Impatiently, Carrie stomped to the closet, yanked it open. She sniffed audibly when she spotted the men's shirts hanging beside Tia's clothes. Then she pulled out a robe, tossed it on the bed. Put that on, then start talking. I can't tell you everything. Why? Because I love you. Tia stuck her arms in the robe, dragged it around her, and immediately felt better. Tia... If those people are pressuring you into something, they're not, I promise. I'm doing something I need to do, something I want to do. For them, yes, but for me, too. Carrie, I bought a red sweater. The lecture on the tip of Carrie's tongue fell away. Red? Cashmere, I don't seem to be allergic to wool after all. I've missed my last two standing appointments with Dr. Lowenstein, and I canceled my monthly appointment with my allergist. I haven't used my inhaler in over a week. Well, once, she corrected. But that was pretend, so it doesn't count. And I've never felt better in my life. Carrie sat on the side of the bed. A red sweater? Really red. I'm thinking about getting a wonder bra to go under it. And it doesn't matter to him. He likes me when I wear dirt brown and dull underwear. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Tia, are you doing what you're doing because you're in love with him? No, I started doing it before I fell in love with him. All the way in love, anyway. It's connected, Carrie, but it's not the why. I, I shouldn't have asked you to get that information on Anita Gay. I'm sorry I did. Let's forget it. I've already got the data. With a sigh, Carrie got to her feet. You get dressed. I'm going to have some coffee and decide if I'm going to give you the data. She crossed to the door, turned back. I love you, too, Tia, she said, then closed the door behind her and scanned the trio in the living room. The woman with the legs was sprawled on the sofa, sipping coffee with her feet propped on the thigh of the hunk who'd opened the front door. Hunk number two was leaning against the opening into the kitchen. You, she pointed at Gideon. What's the bulge in your pocket? Bulge? Cleo gave a wicked laugh, then poked Gideon's ribs with her toes. You happy to see me, Slick? It's nothing. Vaguely embarrassed, he dug into his pocket. Just a bagel. Is that the last poppy seed? Cleo straightened, snatched it out of his hand. You were sneaking off with the last poppy seed bagel? That's low. She unfolded herself. Just for that, I'm eating it. No weapons. She added for Carrie's benefit, then strolled into the kitchen. Would you like coffee? Malachi offered. Cream, no sugar. Cleo, be a pal. Cream, no sugar for Miss Wilson here. Work, work, work came the mutter from the kitchen. First question, Carrie began. Tia claims she can't tell me what she's involved in. Is she protecting you? No, she's protecting you. You don't have to ask the second question. I'll just answer it. She matters very much to me, and I'll do whatever needs to be done to keep her from being hurt. She's the most amazing woman I've ever known. Just for that, Cleo said from behind him, you get half my bagel. You're a friend of Tia's? She continued, nodding at Carrie. So am I. You've got seniority, but that doesn't mean I'm less of a friend. Considering, Carrie looked at Gideon. And you? I love her, he said simply, then grinned a little at the looks he got from Cleo and Malachi. In a warm and brotherly fashion. Do I get the other half of the bagel? No. I'm under constant abuse. He got to his feet. I'm going up and having a smoke. If Becca or Jack call, let me know. Becca? Jack? Carrie turned to Malachi as Gideon walked out of the apartment. Rebecca's our sister. Jack's another friend of Tia's. She certainly stockpiled a lot of friends in a short time. I guess I was saving up, Tia said as she came out of the bedroom. Carrie glanced over, sighed again. I told you red would look great on you. Yes. With a little smile, Tia brushed a hand over her new sweater. You always did. Carrie went to her took both Tia's hands, looked hard into her eyes. You wouldn't have asked me to do this if it wasn't important, really important. No, I wouldn't have. When you can, you're going to explain everything. You'll be the first. She nodded, then turned to Malachi. If whatever's going on here hurts her in any way, shape, or form, I'm coming after you, and I'm taking you down. I'll hold your coat, 
Cleo offered and bit into her bagel. Sorry, Mel. We girls got to stick together. I'm probably going to like you, Carrie decided. All three of you. I sure as hell hope so, since I broke several federal laws acquiring the information I'm about to give you. For that, you get a whole bagel. We've got cinnamon, plain, and onion. Carrie offered Cleo her first smile. I'll live recklessly and go for the cinnamon. About the time Carrie was polishing off her bagel and explaining the details of Anita Gay and Morningside Antiquities' financial picture, Anita was having breakfast in bed. Now that she'd had time to think and a bit more rest, she wasn't so upset about the attempted break-in. She'd just consider it a wake-up call. Nobody and nothing was to be trusted. It was true that the security had held, but as far as she knew, that might have been dumb luck or due to some foolish mistake by the thieves. She'd have Jack Burdett and company go over the system inch by inch, and when they were done, she'd call in another consultant and have them evaluate the system. One doctor tells you something's wrong with your body, a smart woman gets a second opinion. Morningside was every bit as vital to her as her own health. Without it, her business and social contacts would start to dry up and her income would suffer a serious shortfall. Anita Gay took care of Anita Gay. She sat back against the pillow, sipped her coffee, and glanced toward the doors of her walk-in closet. Behind the side panel where her daywear suits hung in a meticulous, color-coordinated row was a safe even the household staff knew nothing about. The fate was tucked away now. She was glad the break-in had jolted her into bringing it here. She'd long since stopped thinking of it as an asset for Morningside, but as a personal belonging. For the right price, of course, she'd sell it without a moment's sentimental hesitation. But when she had all three, she would wallow in it for a while, her little secret. And she was considering keeping them for a short time, perhaps putting them on loan briefly and reaping the publicity. Anita Gay, the skinny girl from Queens, would have made the biggest find, successfully executed the splashiest coup of the century. You couldn't buy that kind of respect and power, she mused. You couldn't inherit it from your rich, elderly, and conveniently deceased husband. It was going to be hers, she thought, whatever it took, whoever had to pay. After pouring the second cup of coffee from her favorite Darby pot, she picked up the portable phone on her bed tray and called Jack's cell phone. Burdette. He was drinking coffee himself and nibbling on Rebecca's fingers. Jack, Anita. She worked tears into her voice. I want to apologize for my behavior this morning. I had no right to take things out on you the way I did. Jack winked at Rebecca. No need to apologize, Anita. You'd had a bad shock or understandably upset. Regardless, you were there for me. Just as your system was there for Morningside, I feel dreadful about it. It's forgotten, he said while Rebecca mimed, strangling herself and gagging. I'm on my way back to Morningside right now, he began. Pants on fire, Rebecca whispered and got a light bop on the head. I'm going over the system personally. I've already called in my best tech to do an analysis. We'll both be there within the hour. Whatever vulnerabilities allowed the system to be breached as far as it was will be corrected. You have my word. I know I can count on you. I'll meet you there if you don't mind. I'd feel better knowing more of what's involved. I'll take you through it. I'm so grateful, Jack. I wonder if you've had any time to work on that other matter we discussed. Cleo Tolliver, right? He gave Rebecca the thumbs-up sign. As a matter of fact, I got some data just last night. I intended to write up a report for you today. Slipped my mind with the trouble this morning. Oh, I don't need anything as formal as a written report. Anything you can tell me. I'll fill you in when I see you. How's that? I'm glad you're sounding more yourself, Anita. I'll see you at Morningside. He clicked off before she could answer. Butter wouldn't melt, he commented, and pulled Rebecca into his lap. What do you want to bet she's figured out a way to scam the insurance claim? I don't take sucker bets. She touched her lips to his, then just sank in. We gotta go, he murmured. Hmm, I think we've gotten caught in terrible traffic. His hand slid under her shirt. It's a jungle out there, he agreed. What's five more minutes? It was fifteen, but he wasn't counting. By the time Anita arrived, he had Rebecca suited up in coveralls and a gimme cap, 
running a system check with a few finesses. He'd measured and ordered the replacement glass for the window and was outside on the sidewalk studying the delivery entrance. My assistant said you'd be out here. She looked delicately pale. I thought the staff would be nervous, she began, but they seemed to be more excited. A lot of people react that way, especially when it's not their property that's been violated. How are you holding up? I'm fine now, really. I've got so much paperwork to do over this, it'll keep my mind busy. Why are you out here? Wanted to take a look. I have to figure they did a study of the building, the neighborhood. Traffic patterns, patrols, angle of vision from residential buildings nearby. And they picked the best spot, upper window. Calculated risk that would be most vulnerable. A replacement glass will be installed by five, guaranteed. Thank you, Jack. She laid a hand on his arm. Morningside was Paul's life. She let out a shaky breath, and he entrusted it to me. I couldn't bear letting him down. Spare me, Jack thought, but laid a hand over hers. We'll take care of it for him. That's a promise. I feel better knowing that. Let's walk around to the front. I could use the time to clear my head a bit more. Fine, I'll go over the system with you. My tech's in there now. If there's a hole, we'll plug it. I know. Paul considered you the best. So do I. I trust you, Jack. That's why I asked for your help regarding this Tolliver woman. You said you found out something? It was tricky. He gave her hand a quick squeeze. But I don't like to disappoint a client. Or a friend. He ran through basic information he was sure she already knew. Listened to her feigned surprise as he mentioned Cleo's parents' names. For heaven's sake, I know Andrew Tolliver. Slightly, strictly socially, but... This woman who threatened me is his daughter? What a world. Classic black sheep troublemaker, he added, knowing Cleo would grin wickedly at the rundown. Problems in school, minor brushes with juvie. Hasn't had much luck landing permanent jobs as a dancer. Looks like she's just back in New York from Eastern Europe. I'm still digging into that. It's not a simple matter to get information from that area. I appreciate your trying. Did you find an address for her? A address on records the apartment she had before she took off for Europe. Moved out about eight months ago. She's not living there now. In fact, she's not in New York at all. Anita stopped, dead. What do you mean she's not in New York? She has to be. She contacted me. I met her here. That was then. This is now. Cleopatra Tolliver, the one who matches your description and the passport number I was able to finesse, left for Greece this morning, Athens. Athens? She turned and her fingers dug into his arm. You're sure about that? I've got the airline, flight, and ticket number back at my place. Since I figured you'd want to know, I called and confirmed the flight after I talked to you this morning. She's been in the air about an hour. He reached for the door of Morningside. She's headed several thousand miles away, Anita. You don't have to worry about her now. What? She pulled herself back. Yes, I suppose you're right. Athens, Anita repeated. She's gone to Athens. Twenty-five. With her feet propped on the counter while she paged through one of a stack of computer magazines she'd stockpiled, Rebecca Mann, the listening post... She paused in the middle of an article, ears pricking as she heard Anita's voice snapping out orders. Smiling, Rebecca swiveled the chair, picked up the phone. The rat's taken the cheese, she said. Tell Tia she's on. Then somebody come relieve me. I'm bored half to death. We'll be along. Malachi hung up the secured line. It's your cue, darling, he said to Tia. Are you set? I didn't think she'd move so fast. Tia pressed a hand to her nervous stomach and felt the soft nap of her new red sweater. I'm set. I'll meet you all back at Jack's. I could go with you as far as the police station. No, I'm fine. Being a little nervous will just make it all the more credible. She slipped on a jacket, then for an extra boost, draped the boldly patterned scarf she'd bought on one of her new shopping sprees over her shoulders. I think I'm getting good at all this. Sweetheart. He wrapped his fingers around the scarf and used it to tug her to him for a kiss. You're a natural. She held on to that, the confidence and the kiss, all the way into the detective's bureau at the 61st precinct. 
She asked for Detective Robbins, stood twisting the strap of her handbag, then managed a shy smile when he came to get her. Dr. Marsh. Detective Robbins, thanks so much for seeing me. I feel so foolish coming in here bothering you. Don't give it a thought. His face remained polite and blank as he studied her. I saw you outside Anita Gay's office, Morningside Antiquities? Yes. She tried a slightly embarrassed, slightly fuddled look in response. I got so flustered when I heard your name and recognized it. I couldn't think how to introduce myself in front of Anita without it all being so awkward and complicated. And I didn't think you'd remember the name from when I called you about Jack Burdett. I remembered. You and Ms. Gay friends? Oh, no. She flushed now. Not really what you'd call friends. We did have lunch once, and I invited her to lunch again at her convenience, but she... Well... This is all very complicated, after all. You want some coffee? Well, I... I could use some. He gestured, then led her into the tiny break area. Cream, sugar? Do you have decaf? Sorry, strictly high test around here. Oh, well, actually, if I could just have some water. No problem. He poured a cup from the spigot of a tiny sink, and Tia tried not to think of the horrors of city tap water. Now... What can I do for you? It's probably nothing. She lifted the cup, but couldn't quite make herself risk a sip. I feel like an idiot. She glanced around the boxy coffee room with its cluttered counters, crowded corkboard, and water-stained ceiling. Just tell me what's on your mind. He brought his coffee to the table, sat across from her. All right. Well, I thought of you, Detective, because I'd written down your information when Mr. Burdett came to see me that day. That was the oddest thing. He gave her an encouraging nod. Jack has a talent for odd things. She bit her lip. You... you did vouch for him, right? I mean, you know him and believe he's honest and responsible. Absolutely. Jack and I go way back. He's unorthodox at times, Dr. Marsh, but you can trust him right down the line. Good. That's good. I feel more confident knowing that. It's just that... that day when he told me my phones were tapped... Did he? Shifted in his seat, straightened. Yes, didn't he mention that to you? You see, he tried to call me about something, apparently, and when he did, he detected something about the line. I don't really understand how all that works, and I have to admit, Detective, even with you reassuring me about him, I didn't believe him. Why should my phones be tapped, after all? That's just silly, don't you think? Any reason you can think of why anyone would want to listen to your phone calls? None at all. I live a very quiet sort of life. Most of my calls involve my research or my family. Nothing of particular interest to anyone but another mythologist. But it did unnerve me a little. Even so, I more or less dismissed it until... Do you know anything about the three fates? Can't say I do. They're characters in Greek myth, three sisters who spin, measure, and cut the thread of life. They're also statues. Small, precious, silver statues. Another kind of myth in antique and art circles. One of my ancestors owned one, and it was lost with him and his wife on the Lusitania. The other two... She spread her hands. Who can say? They're reasonably valuable separately, but would be priceless as a complete set. Mr. Burdett contacted me because he's a collector, and he'd learned of the connection with my family. My father owns Wiley's, the antique and auction house... Okay, so Jack was hoping for a line on these statues through you? That's right. In any case, I told him what little I knew about the art pieces, but the conversation sparked an idea for another book. I started researching, phone calls, she said, collecting data and so on. Then the other day, I was talking to someone, someone I know primarily through my family. I was surprised when she seemed eager to spend some time with me, and I admit, flattered. Tia lowered her eyes to her glass turned it around and around with her fingertips. I didn't think she'd be bothered with me socially. It wasn't until I got back home again, after we'd talked, that I'd realized she'd not only brought up the fates, but... She breathed deeply, looked at him again. Detective Robbins, there were a couple of things she said that related directly to my research, to phone calls I've made and conversations I've had. I know it's probably just a coincidence, but it seems very odd. Otter, when I put it all together with her inviting me to lunch, with her steering the conversation toward the statues and knowing things 
she shouldn't have known about my research. And I learned she'd asked both my parents about Clotho. Who's Clotho? Oh, sorry. The first fate. The statue my ancestor owned was of Clotho. I don't know what to think. She even let it slip about the third fate. That would be Atropus, being in Athens. Greece. Yes, I'd only just tracked down that rumor myself the day before we had lunch. Had discussed it with a colleague in a phone conversation. I suppose she could be following the same trail as I am, but it just feels so strange. And when I think of what Mr. Burdett said about my phones, I'm very uneasy. Why don't we have someone take a look at your phones? Could you? She sent him a thankful look. I'd be so grateful. It really would relieve my mind. I'll take care of it. The woman you mentioned, Dr. Marsh. Would that be Anita Gay? Tia gasped. Hoped it wasn't overdone. How did you guess? Just one of the tricks they teach us in cop school. Detective Robbins, I feel so odd about all this. I don't want to get Anita in any trouble if I'm just imagining things, and I probably am. I probably am because I'm not the type of person this sort of thing happens to. You won't tell her I said anything, will you? I'd be horribly embarrassed if she knew I'd spoken to the police about her, and my parents will keep your name out of it. Like you said, it's probably coincidence. You're right. She beamed a relieved smile. It's probably just coincidence. It was a lot like planting seeds, Tia imagined. Not that she'd ever literally planted seeds, but it just seemed much the same. You stirred up the ground a bit, scattered around what you wanted to grow, then gave it a little boost of fertilizer, or in this case, bullshit. She liked the fact that her team trusted her enough to do so much of the planting. If, as expected, those seeds sprouted quickly, there was a great deal to do in a short amount of time. She swung into Wiley's with a spring in her step and the clock ticking in her head. Before she could ask if her father was available, she heard her mother's voice. Tia winced and hated herself for it. Guilt had her moving through the showroom to where Alma was haranguing a clerk. Mother, I didn't expect to see you here. She laid her lips lightly on Alma's cheek. What a gorgeous vase, she commented, studying the delicate pansy motif on the vase the clerk was guarding. Gruby? Yes. The clerk slanted Alma a dubious look. Circa 1905. It's a particularly fine piece. I want it boxed up, gift-wrapped, and messengered to my home. Mrs. Marsh, the clerk began. I don't want to hear any more about it. Alma waved the protest aside. Ellen Foster's daughter Magda is getting married next month, she said to Tia. I asked your father repeatedly to bring home an appropriate wedding gift, but has he bothered? No. So I'm forced to come all the way down here to take care of it myself. The man's in here every day. The least he could do is take care of one little thing for me. I'm sure he... And now, Alma continued, rolling over Tia, this young woman refuses to do what she's told. Mr. Marsh has given the staff very specific instructions. We aren't permitted to allow you to take any merchandise valued at more than $1,000. This piece is priced at 6000 Mrs. Marsh. I never heard such nonsense. I'm getting palpitations. I'm sure my blood pressure is spiking. Mother! Tia's voice, sharper than either of them expected, had Alma blinking. This vase isn't an appropriate gift for the daughter of an acquaintance. Ellen is a dear friend whom you see perhaps six times a year at social functions. Tia finished briskly. Your taste, as always, is impeccable, but this isn't the right gift. Would you mind telling my father we're here? She asked the clerk. Not at all. Obviously relieved to have reinforcements, the clerk left them alone. I don't know what's gotten into you. Alma's pretty face shifted from angry to unhappy lines. You're so unsympathetic, so harsh. I don't mean to be. It's that man you're involved with, that foreigner. No, it's not. You've let yourself get upset over nothing. Nothing? That woman was only doing her job. Mother, you can't come into Wiley's and pluck something off a shelf because it's pretty. Now I'm going to help you find just the right wedding present. I have a headache. You'll feel better when we take care of your errand. She put an arm over her mother's stiff shoulders and guided her away. Look at this lovely teapot. I want a vase. 
Alma said stubbornly. All right. She led Alma along, and though she was tempted to signal another clerk for help, ordered herself to tough it out. Oh, this is beautiful. She spotted a footed vase and prayed her shaky expertise was in gear. If she missed and picked out something even more valuable, the ordeal would snowball. It's so stunning and classic. I think it's Storbridge. Carefully, she angled it, tipped it so she could check the tiny price tag, and breathed a quiet sigh of relief. What a wonderful gift this would be, she went on quickly as she saw the sulk folding into her mother's face. You know, if you gave the other as a gift, they wouldn't know what they had, so they wouldn't appreciate the gesture for what it was worth. But something as gorgeous as this, at just the right price, will get full marks. Well, why don't I take care of having it boxed and wrapped for you? Then we'll see if Father has time to have some tea. It's been a long time since we've been in Wiley's together. I suppose. Alma studied the vase more carefully. It is very elegant. Gorgeous, Tia said, thinking, and at less than four hundred, right in the ballpark. You always had good taste, Tia. I never had to worry about that. You don't have to worry about me at all. Then what would I do with my time? Alma said, with just a hint of petulance. We'll think of something. I love you. Even as Alma teared up, Tia heard her father's footsteps, and saw he looked very harassed, very displeased. Without thinking, she instinctively stepped between him and her flustered mother. You've been invaded, Tia said cheerfully. I dropped by to see you and got the bonus of running into mother. She needs the footed storage vase boxed and wrapped as a wedding gift. Which? His gaze narrowed as he followed Tia's gesture. After a brief study of the selection, he nodded. I'll take care of it. Alma, I've told you to check with me before you pick out anything. She didn't want to bother you. Determined, Tia kept her voice bright. But I couldn't resist. Are you terribly busy? As a matter of fact, it's been a distressing morning. Morningside Antiquities was broken into last night. Alma pressed a hand on her heart. Burglarized? I live in fear of that happening here. I won't get a wink of sleep tonight worrying about it. Alma, it didn't happen here. It's only a matter of time, she predicted. Crime is running rampant. Why a person isn't safe walking out of her own home? She isn't safe in her home. Thank goodness, Father Seen, you have such excellent security here and at home, Tia commented. Mother, you should sit down, catch your breath. I know, with your empathic nature, hearing of someone else's misfortune upsets you. What you need is a nice, calming cup of chamomile. Tia continued, soothing as she helped her mother to a chair across the showroom. She got her settled, asked a clerk to see to the tea, then went back to her father. When did you learn to do that? He wanted to know. Handle your mother. I don't know. I suppose I realize you could use a little help in that area, and I haven't been any. I haven't been a very good daughter to either of you. I'd like that to change. It seems to me a lot of things are changing. He touched her cheek in a rare outward gesture of affection. I don't know when I've seen you look better, Tia. Oh, it's a new sweater, and he kept his hand on her cheek. It's not just the sweater. No, and she did something she rarely did. She lifted her hand and covered his. It's not. Maybe it's time we took a break in routine. Why don't I take you and your mother out to lunch? I'd love that, but I can't today. I'm already running behind. Can I take a rain check? Of course. Well, uh, it's terrible about Morningside. Was anything stolen? I'm not sure. Apparently, they did get into the building, but only briefly, as the alarms went off. Anita hasn't completed her inventory check. Oh, you've spoken to her. I went over this morning to offer my help and concern, and he added with a faint smile, to see if I could pry out more details. It also seemed like the perfect opportunity to mention I'd heard rumors about one of the fates in Athens. She seemed very interested. So much so, I embellished and told her I remembered something vaguely, being passed down through the family about Henry Wiley planning on going to Athens after his trip to London. Oh, I didn't think of that. I wouldn't imagine. You've never been good at embellishment, though that too might have changed. I appreciate what you did, Tia said, evading. 
I know it was an odd request. I wonder why you agreed to do it. You've never asked me for anything before, he said simply. Then I'll ask for something else. Stay away from Anita Gay. She's not what she seems. I have to go. I'm very late. She brushed her lips over his cheek. I'll call you soon. She rushed off in such a hurry she all but collided with a tall, dark-suited man as he came in. She nearly overbalanced, flushed scarlet, then sidestepped clumsily. I'm so sorry. I wasn't watching where I was going. No problem. Marvin Jasper watched her dash down the sidewalk. He took a detour, backtracking until he was away from the entrance of Wally's. Keeping his eye on Tia's retreating back, he made a call on his cell phone. Jasper, just ran into the Marsh woman coming out of Wiley's. Alma? Uh, Marsh's wife? Anita demanded. No, the young one, the daughter, in a big hurry, look guilty. I can catch up and tail her if you want. No, she always looks guilty about something. Do what I told you to do and don't bother me again until you have something. With a shrug, Jasper pocketed the phone. He'd follow orders and keep the bitch happy. He knew she'd done Dabrowski, but it didn't worry him. Jasper figured he could handle himself and the gay woman better than his unfortunate former associate. So much better that when everything shook down, he'd arrange a little accident for the ice bitch. A fatal one. He'd probably have to take care of the Marsh woman, too, and her old man. But once the slate was clean, he'd be the one walking off with those three statues. Thinking Rio might be a nice retirement spot, he walked back to Wiley's to follow orders. Jack met Bob Robbins at the bar and grill two blocks from the station house. It was too early for the change or end of shifts, so there was only a scatter of cops and civilian customers. The place smelled of onions and coffee. In a few hours, the scent of beer and whiskey would predominate. Jack slid into the booth across from Bob. You called, he said. You buy. He ordered a Reuben, a side of fries, and a draft. What's up? You tell me. Morningside. Lou caught that. Tell me anyway. The B&E got through the first level of security, gained entrance to the target. Secondary kicked in as designed, and all hell broke loose. Word is the boys in blue responded within two minutes. That's good hustle. How'd they get through, Jack? We're doing a system check, a full analysis. He stretched out his legs. If you're thinking about hassling any of my people over this, you're wasting your time and you'll piss me off. If any of mine had turned on a client, they wouldn't have missed the second level, would have taken out what they went in for, and would even now be sunning themselves on a foreign beach where extradition wouldn't be a weighty issue. Maybe they did get what they went in for. Jack picked up his beer when it was served, watched Bob over the foam as he took his first sip, which would be... Again, you tell me. As far as I know, the client hasn't completed her inventory check. And I can tell you all my people are accounted for. Burdett hasn't earned its reputation by hiring thieves. You taking this over from Lou? No, I'm working something that might be connected. A couple of things just don't gel for me. Here's the big one. I go years without anyone saying the name Anita Gay to me. Now, within a short span of time, you drop it on me in connection with some two-bit muscle who ends up dead in Jersey. I hear it from Lou when he catches a burglary attempt at her place of business, which involves your security. And I get it tossed in my lap again today from a woman who knows you. Jack leaned back as his lunch slid in front of him. I know a lot of women. Tia Marsh says you told her that her phones are tapped. They are. Yeah, they are. Bob nodded, picked up his burger. I just checked it out. Question is, why are they? My guess is somebody wants to know who she's talking to and about what. Yeah, Ella fucking mentory, Watson. She thinks it might be Anita Gay. Jack set his beer down, carefully. Tia Marsh tell you that? What's going on, Jack? I've got nothing solid, but let me tell you this. He leaned forward, lowered his voice. Whoever got into that building knew enough about the system to get in, and not enough to stay in and finish. I always see to it the client knows as much as he wants to know about the operation. In this case, with this client... She knew the basics. She wants something out of her own place. Why doesn't she just walk out with it? How the hell do I know? Five minutes, Bob. 
The primary was down for five maximum before secondary kicked the alarms. Your guys responded in two. Coming in from that section, I can't see how they got squat out of there in under seven minutes. Even if the thing ran smooth as silk while they were inside, they couldn't have gotten much. I'd be real interested to see what she files on her insurance claim. Doesn't sound to me you like your client, Jack. Can't say I do. He went back to his sandwich. That's personal. On another level, I've got nothing on her but speculation. How do you connect her to Dabrowski? Roundabout. He moved his shoulders. Another client told me how Anita was hassling her about a certain art piece. Enough high pressure that this client was uneasy and tells me how she's seen this guy following her. Described him to me, I described him to you, and you tell me he's stiff. She ID'd him from the picture you slipped me. I want a name. Not without her okay. You know I can't, Bob. Besides, all she knows is Anita spooked her. This guy tailed her, and now he's dead. What about the art piece? Pieces, actually. They're called the Three Fates, Bob finished, and Jack registered surprise. You are a detective. Got the Dakota ring to prove it. What do these statues have to do with you? I just happen to have one. Bob's gaze narrowed like pinpoints. Which one? Atropus. Third fate. Came through the family, the Brit side of it. Anita doesn't know that, and I want to keep it that way. She wanted me to get some information on them for her, which got me to thinking and led me to Tia Marsh and my other client. Why'd she come to you if she didn't know you had one? She knows I'm a collector, and she knows I've got connections. Okay. Satisfied, Bob dipped into Jack's fries. Keep going. The Marsh woman's phones are tapped. My client, who's the lead to Lachesis, or fate number two, is being tailed. And Anita's been pressuring them both. You do the math. Plugging a guy full of bullets is a long way from trying to finesse a couple of statues. You talk to her. What do you think? Bob said nothing for a moment. What I think is I'm going to dig deeper. While you're at it, look into a homicide on West 53rd a few weeks ago. Black guy, dancer. Beat to death in his apartment. God damn it, Jack. If you know something about an open homicide, I'm giving you information, Jack said evenly. Check the witness descriptions of the guy who went in and out of the building. It's going to match the hired fist you got from New Jersey. Find a way to get a warrant for Gay's private line. I bet you'll find some interesting calls on it. I've got to go. Stay out of the police work, Jack. Happy to. I've got a hot date with a gorgeous Irish redhead. The one you brought into the station? Rebecca? Bob remembered. She your client? Nope. She's the woman I'm going to marry. In your dreams. There, too. He dug in his pocket, pulled out a box, and flipped it open. What do you think? Bob's jaw dropped, nearly bounced off the table as he stared at the ring. Holy shit, Burdette, you're serious. First time around, I went to Tiffany's. But Rebecca, she'll like the heirloom thing. This was my great-great-grandmother's. Well, hell. Bob climbed out of the booth and gave Jack a one-armed hug. Congratulations. How the hell am I supposed to be pissed off at you? You'll find a way. You want to give me a wedding present? Take Anita Gay down. 26. When he was parked, sitting behind the wheel of Jack's SUV, Gideon was happy enough with his assignment. It was just when he actually had to drive that he cursed his luck. It was bad enough to be swallowed up by the intrinsic anger of New York City traffic and its seemingly mad competition between cars, cabs, the ubiquitous delivery trucks, the kamikaze bike messengers, and the always-in-a-damn-hurry pedestrians. But he had to contend with it all from the wrong bloody side of the road. He'd practiced, even managed to negotiate the viciously jammed cross streets, the wide avenues where everyone drove as if they were on a raceway without killing anyone. And so had been elected for this task. As he sat brooding a half-block from Anita's posh house, he wondered if any of them had considered that driving around with a coach and driving alone with the express purpose of following a car to the airport were vastly different matters. Still, he'd been drafted for it as he and Rebecca were the only ones whose faces Anita wasn't personally familiar with. And Rebecca was needed at the keyboard. 
He'd have felt better if Cleo had been there with him. Egging him on, or giving him grief, or just being there. He'd become entirely too used to having her around. They'd have to work out what they intended to do about that once they dealt with the fates. With Anita. They'd have to work out the single fact that he couldn't live in New York and stay sane. Visit, certainly, but live in a place so crowded you could barely draw one clean breath? No, not even for her. Christ, he wanted the sea again, and the quiet rain. He wanted the hills and the sound of cathedral bells. Most of all, he wanted to wake up in a place where he knew if he walked down to the quay or to the boatyard, or just wandered the steep streets, he would come across people who knew him, knew his family, who were family. She'd probably hate it in Cove, he thought, and tapped his fingers restlessly on the wheel. The very things that sustained him would probably drive her mad. Why should two people who came from such different places, who wanted such different things, have fallen in love? One of fate's little jokes, he supposed. In the end, she'd probably go her way and he his, so the rest of the thread of their lives would spin out with an ocean between them. The thought already depressed him. He was so busy chewing over his own misery that he nearly didn't register the long black limo that glided up in front of Anita's townhouse. He tucked away his personal troubles and clicked into gear. Well now, he said aloud, travel in style, don't you? He watched the uniformed driver get out, walk to the front door and ring the bell. Gideon was too far away to see who answered, but there was a brief conversation. Then the driver returned to the car. They both waited a full ten minutes by Gideon's watch before another man, the butler, Gideon assumed, came out carrying two large suitcases. A young woman trailed behind him, rolling another, smaller case. While the three of them loaded the trunk, Gideon pressed the buttons of the car phone. They're loading the car, he told his brother. A limo big as a whale, and enough luggage for a modeling troupe. He got his first in-person look at Anita when she stepped through the door. Her hair was copper bright and sleekly styled around a face that looked to be soft to the touch. Her body, and he could easily see what had appealed to his brother there, was very female with its generous curves. He wondered, studying her, what had twisted inside her to make her what she was. He wondered, too, why others couldn't see how out of place she was with her polish and gloss in that fine, dignified old house. Perhaps she saw it, Gideon mused, whenever she looked in the mirror. That might be one more thing that drove her and he'd leave the philosophizing to Tia. Here's the woman of the hour just coming out. Remember, if you lose them, you've just got to go to the airport and pick her up again there. I'm not going to lose them. I can drive better on the wrong side of the road than most of the people in this city can on the right side. They're pulling away now. I'll get back to you from the airport. Malachi hung up, turned to Tia. They're moving. I feel a little queasy. She pressed a hand to her stomach. But I'm starting to like it. I don't know what I'm going to do when my life gets back to normal. He took her hand, pressed his lips to her fingers. We'll have to see it doesn't. Flustered, Tia pressed the intercom and contacted the garage. She's on her way to the airport. Gideon's behind her. Then let's move out. Jack clicked off. Tia pushed away from the console. Rose. Steady, Malachi asked her. Steady enough. Have you ever planted anything? Like a tree? He stepped into the elevator with her. I was thinking more like seeds. Different seeds in different places. She took a deep breath. It's going to be a very interesting garden when we're done. Any regrets? Not so far. And I don't intend to have any. She stepped out into the garage looked over to where Cleo, Rebecca, and Jack were already beside the van. These people, she thought, these fascinating people, were her friends. No, she didn't have any regrets. Let's rock and roll, Cleo said. On this leg, Tia manned the keyboard and Maliki communication. With Jack and Rebecca in the cab, Cleo chilled out with Queen blasting through her headphones. I don't know how she can do that, Tia commented. Relax that way. Malachi flipped a glance over his shoulder to where Cleo sat back, body swaying to her music, 
storing energy. She'll need plenty of it later. He hit a switch and spoke to Rebecca on her two-way. Gideon says there's heavy traffic on something called the Van Wick. He still has them, but they're moving slowly just now. That's fine. We're nearly at the parking lot. You be careful, darling. Oh, I'll be better than careful. I'll be good. Over and out. Rebecca tucked the two-way back into the holster on her belt. She stored energy her own way as Jack pulled the van into the parking lot. She went over every step of her assignment in her head. When she got out of the van, walked around to Jack, he held out a hand. Holding hands as we return to the scene of the crime, she gave an exaggerated sigh. It's so bloody romantic. Nervous, he said as they walked. More revved up, I'd say. That's a good thing. Don't rush. We want to move through this stage quickly, but we've got the time to do it right. Do your part, I'll do mine. Together they walked directly to the front entrance of Morningside. Casually, Jack keyed in the new code he'd programmed into his palm converter, then took out the keys he'd had made as the security system shut down. We're clear, he said softly, then unlocked the door. After they slipped inside, he relocked the door, re-engaged the outer alarms. And we're in. Go, he ordered, but Rebecca was already dashing for the stairs. Guided by the beam of her flashlight, she raced up to Anita's office. She took the key out of her pocket and, trusting she and Jack had succeeded in realigning the security, unlocked the door. After closing the drapes over the window facing Madison, she switched on the desk light, then sat down at Anita's computer, and rubbed her hands together. All right, handsome, let's make love. Downstairs, Jack reconfigured the security system. It would go back online, complete and better than ever, after he and Rebecca were clear. While he worked, he listened to Malachi through the headset. They're at the airport. She's been dropped off at the curb. Gideon's finding a place to park. He'll pick her up again inside the terminal. What's your status there? Coming along. Put Tia on. I want to run the first checklist. You're up. Malachi handed her a headset. Jack? I'm giving you the first encryption. Key it in. Behind her, Cleo yawned. She lifted one earpiece so the muffled sound of bass and drums beat into the air. Everything cool? At the keyboard, Rebecca hacked her way through Anita's computer security. It was, she thought with some glee, pathetic. No more than a simple password lock and easily dispatched. She found the insurance file in her first document search. Opening it, she searched out the inventory list and claim form Anita had generated that day. Padded the claim already, didn't you? But so conservatively. We're going to improve on that. Out of her pocket, she took the short list Jack and Tia had made and got to work. As she doctored the claim form, she heard her brother's voice in her ear. He's caught off with her. She's just walked into the first-class lounge. There is an hour and fifteen before her flight. I'm into the file. I wonder what the devil the Nara period is, and why some plaque from it's worth so much flame and money. Jack, you can check that piece and the chipperous figure. Are you going to get to the earbobs? I'll get them. Log them in. Don't forget the bugs Tia planted. Working on it. Be quiet. Tia, set to run next encryption. Within fifty minutes, Rebecca finished listing and detailing the items Tia had selected on her wanderings through Morningside, had adjusted the computer's date and time to stamp the work for earlier in the day. At a time, thanks to the little mic under the chair, they knew Anita had been alone in her office. After printing out the claim, she wiggled her fingers, then signed the bottom of the form with a fine, if she did say so herself, forgery, of Anita's signature. She dated it then typed up a detailed instruction list for the assistant. She had the clock reset, the computer shut down, the mic Tia had put under the chair in her bag, and the drapes open again when she heard Jack coming up the stairs. We're set here. Check again, he ordered. Yes, Mr. Anal Retentive, sir. Drapes, computer, lamp, flashlight, mic and articles suitable for framing, she added, waving the file in her hand. She relocked the office door before strolling over to lay the file on Anita's assistant's desk. Being an efficient soul, the girl will likely have this sent off first thing in the morning. 
I should tell you she'd already added a couple of things to the claim. Some sort of plate that's apparently worth some 28,000 American dollars. Added to this, Jack tapped the bag on his shoulder. That takes her claim over two million. She'll sure have a lot of explaining to do. Security's reset. We'll bring it back online when we're clear. Then our work here is done. Let's go. There's one more thing. He dug in his pocket, took out the ring box. When he flipped open the top, Rebecca leaned in to study it in the beam of her flashlight. That's a lovely sparkler. Did you steal that from here? No. I brought it in with me. Want it? She looked back up at him, cocked her head. You're asking me to marry you here in a building we've burglarized? I've already asked you to marry me, he reminded her. I'm giving you the ring here, in a building we've technically burglarized. It belonged to my great-great-grandmother. She was wearing it when your great-great-grandfather saved her life. That's lovely. That's all around lovely, Jack. I'll take it. She tugged off her glove, held out her hand. And you. He slid it onto her finger, dipped his head for a kiss to seal the bargain. That's a very sweet moment, Malachy said through the headpieces. Congratulations and best wishes to you both. Now would you mind getting your asses out of there? Oh, stuff it, Mal. Rebecca leaned up for one more kiss. We're on our way. When they got back to the van, Cleo slid the partition open so she and Rebecca could change places. Let's see the bauble, Cleo demanded. Impatient, she tugged off Rebecca's glove. Whoa, some rock. Save the girl stuff for later, Jack strapped into his seat. Bring the system online. Now that we're engaged, he's full of orders. Rebecca stepped through and took over the controls from Tia. Booting it up. As she worked, Malachy bent over her, pressed his lips to the top of her head, and made her smile. I'm going to get all gooey and sentimental in just a bit. Me too. It's a beautiful ring. Unable to resist, Tia leaned down to get a closer look. The diamond flashed as Rebecca's fingers raced over the keyboard. I'm so happy for you. We'll have a party tonight, won't we? For all sorts of reasons. Primary's up. Back up booting, she announced. And there we are, all neat and tidy. She leaned back, took the bottle of water Malachy offered. We've done it. Time for act two. Cleo propped her feet on the dash. We got time to grab a pizza? Gideon sat in Kennedy Airport, reading a paperback copy of Bradbury's Something Wicked. He'd settled into a gate area where he could easily observe the first-class lounge. The flight to Athens was on time and had already started to board. He was beginning to feel a bit twitchy, mourned for a cigarette. He shifted in his seat, turned a page without reading as Anita strolled out of the lounge. He let her get another gate down before he rose and wandered after her. Like dozens of other travelers, he pulled out a cell phone. She's queuing up to board, he said quietly. Flight's on schedule. Let us know when it and she are in the air. Oh, by the way, Becca and Jack got engaged. Did they? Though he kept his attention on the back of Anita's head, Gideon grinned at his brother's news. Official and all. She's wearing a ring with a diamond fit to blind you. We're heading toward the second target now. If all goes well, we'll meet you back at base on schedule. You can see it for yourself. Good thing I've got me sunglasses. She's just going down the jetway, 30 minutes to take off. I'm sitting down here, going back to my book. I'll call you back. They parked three blocks away and waited. Say, I told you we had time for pizza. Jack slanted Cleo a look. Why aren't you fat as a cow? Metabolism. She took a Hershey's big block out of her bag, unwrapped one end. It's the one useful thing my mother passed on to me. So, are you and Rebecca going to live here or over on the Emerald Isle? Some of both, I imagine, and here and there. We'll work it out. Yeah, it's handy you've got a gig where you bounce around a lot. What about you? You going back to dancing when this is over? With your cut, you could buy a chunk of the Rockettes. Dunno, probably hang loose a while. She munched on chocolate. Maybe I'll open my own club or a dance school, something that doesn't keep me hauling butt from audition to audition. Right now, I can't think farther than making Anita pay for Mikey. We've got a good start on that. 
Man, he gets such a rush out of all this shit. Jack? Yeah? What if it's not in there? What if she took it with her or something? Then we go to plan B. What's plan B? I'll let you know when we get there. He looked at her as Malachi's signal came through the headset. She's in the air. Curtain up, Cleo said, and stepped nimbly out of the van. You want to go over anything again? Floor plan, hand signals? No, I got it. We've got two people in the building this time, he reminded her. Two live-in servants. We have to do this quietly. I'm a fucking cat. Don't worry. Do you think this is some kind of record? What's that? Breaking into two places for a total of three B&Es in 24 hours without actually stealing anything. We're taking the fate. Yeah, but it already belongs to Mal and Tia, I guess. So that doesn't count. I think we could get into the Guinness Guy's record book for this. A lifelong dream of mine. They walked by the house once. The lights were off on the second floor. Looks like they've settled in for the evening. Servants' quarters there, south corner of the house. Housekeeper and butler, check. You think they get it on while the boss is away? Jack scratched his jaw. I'd rather not get that image stuck in my head just now. We go up the east side to the bedroom terrace. We'll be exposed about 15 seconds. Takes more than that to shake a former stripper, pal. Maybe you could do a number for my bachelor party. He grinned as Rebecca's pithy comment came through his headphones. Or maybe not. Love of my life, shut down the alarms. He ignored the stream of cabs that drove by and the radio car. At Rebecca's signal, he clamped a hand on Cleo's and pulled her off the sidewalk and into the shadows of the house. They hooked lines to harnesses and were rising up the side of the building, rolling over the stone rail and crouched on the terrace before another word was spoken. He gestured for Cleo to stow the gear while he crab-walked to the terrace doors. Take out the locks, East Terrace, second level, he said quietly into his headphones. He waited until he heard them snick then rose, exposing himself again to deal with the manual locks. From his jacket pocket, he pulled out a small case, chose his lockpick from it. Bet they didn't teach you that in security school, Cleo mentioned in a low voice. You'd be surprised. He dealt with a dead bolt, then, easing the door open, waited for Cleo to slip inside before he relocked it. A good crime scene investigator would spot the job he knew but he didn't think that was going to come up. Obsession. Cleo sniffed the air. Her perfume. Fits, doesn't it? Lock the doors. Hallway, straight ahead. Master bath on the left. She moved through the shadowed light to oblige and continued to whisper. Should I ask how come you know so much about her bedroom setup? Professional knowledge only. When the doors were locked, he moved directly to the closet. Holy shit, this is bigger than my old apartment. She fingered the sleeve of a jacket as she moved inside. Not bad, either. Think she'd notice if I copped a couple of things? I'm rebuilding my wardrobe. We're not here to shop. Hey, shopping's the only merit badge I ever earned. She snagged one of a pair of snakeskin pumps off a wall of shelves. My size, it's fate. You've got a job to do here, Cleo. Okay, okay but she stuffed the shoes into her bag before she crouched to unroll his tools. Jack opened the panel to the safe and exposed the security pad. He interfaced his portable computer, engaged the search. Sooner or later, she's bound to figure out you're the only one who could pull this off, Cleo commented. She's going to be really pissed off at you. Yeah, I'm shaking. He watched the readout as the first two numbers of the combination of seven locked into place. What's our time? Four minutes, twenty seconds. We're skating right along. While she waited, Cleo pushed through a rack of suits. I don't go for the lady suit look, but hey, this one's cashmere. Bet it'll look sharp on Tia. She rolled it up, added it to her booty. Combinations locked, Jack told her. Cross your fingers, gorgeous. She did, on both hands, then stepped behind him. Son of a bitch! She breathed out audibly when he opened the door. Clotho glinted like a star. There she is. You copy that, you guys? We've got her. She held out the padded bag for Jack. Rebecca, I'm giving your man a big sloppy kiss, so deal with it. 
When she was done, she reached for her bag again. Don't close it yet, Jack. I got a little present for Anita. We don't leave anything behind, he began, then stared at what Cleo pulled out of her bag. What is that? Is that Barbie? Yeah, to replace the statue. I picked out the wardrobe on a quick trip to F.A.O. Schwartz. Gently, Cleo stood the black leather-clad, buxom blonde doll in the safe. I call her Cat Burglar Barbie. See, she's got a little goodie bag. It's got lockpicks in it. I made out of little safety pins, and this tiny plastic doll pretty much to scale, I painted silver to represent the fate. Cleo, you're a regular Martha Stewart. I got hidden talents, all right. Bye-bye, Barbie, she added, and blew a kiss as Jack closed the safe. They shut the panel, gathered the tools. Okay, once we leave this room, no talking. Hand signals only. Out the door to the right, down the steps to the left. Stay close. I'm practically riding piggyback. This part's trickier, he reminded her. We get caught in here, it's all for nothing. Just lead the way. They slipped out of the bedroom. As they couldn't risk flashlights now, they waited for their eyes to adjust to the dark of the second-level hallway. The house was silent, so silent, Cleo could hear the ticking of her own heart and wondered how it had managed to rise up into her throat. At Jack's signal, they moved forward, footsteps soft over the Karisten runner. At the base of the stairs, Cleo began to think the place was more tomb than house. The air was cool, the room soundless, and the street sounds muffled by drape-covered windows. Then she heard it, the instant before Jack froze and she bumped into his back. The sound of a door opening, a spill of light from the far end of the first-floor hallway, and the shuffle of footsteps. She and Jack moved as one into the cover of the first doorway. There were distant voices, almost a tunnel effect. It took her several sweaty seconds to realize the house wasn't full of people. Television, she decided, then had to swallow a nervous chuckle when she recognized the obnoxious, thrumming music from Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. Perfect, she thought, dead on perfect. When the light went off again, a door closed. She counted to ten until she felt Jack relax beside her. Just as she counted the steps they took down the hall, in case she had to make a dash back to cover. They melted like shadows into the library and secured the door at their backs. They moved fast now and without words. Pen lights guided them to the glass-fronted bookshelves. There was a quiet rattle and creak that sounded like cannon fire in the silence as he opened a case. He cleared a section, passing her volume after volume of a leather-bound collection of Shakespeare. When the safe was exposed, he drew out his portable. He tapped his watch. Cleo flashed the twenty-minute sign before she crouched, unzipped his bag, and carefully took out the items chosen for Morningside. He placed them in the far reaches of the small vault— behind an impressive stack of fifties, leather files, and numerous jewelry cases. When the safe was closed again, they changed places, with Cleo reshelving the books and Jack stowing all gear. They both jumped like rabbits when the phone rang. He gave her the hurry-up sign, then bolted to the door to unlock it, crack it open. Cleo was breathing down his neck when light flooded the hallway. With one bag clutched at her breast like a baby— Cleo dived behind a hunter-green leather wing-back chair. With another bag slung over his shoulder, Jack angled himself behind the door and tried not to breathe as the footsteps came briskly down the hall. One thing, then another, an irritated female voice uttered, as if I've got nothing better to do this time of night than take messages. She shoved open the door. Jack caught the knob with his hand before it slammed into his crotch, and held it there as he pressed himself into the shielding triangle. Light poured into the room when the woman hit the switch for the overheads. Rebecca spoke into his ear, warning him that they were going overtime. He heard the housekeeper march to the desk, slap something on the polished wood. Hope she stays away for a month. Give us some breathing room. Footsteps shuffling now, headed back to the door. There was a pause, a soft snort, that might have been approval or derision. Then the lights went out. Jack stayed just as he was, willed Cleo to do the same as the footsteps retreated. 
He didn't move an inch until he heard the quick slam of a door from down the hallway. Gently, very gently, he nudged the door open. In the shadowy light, he saw Cleo still huddled behind the chair. Her eyes gleamed in the dark as they met his. She rolled them wildly, then eased to her feet. They crept out of the library, slipped silently down the hall to the foyer, and walked right out the front door. So I'm playing rabbit behind this chair, and there's Jack doing his Claude Rains impression behind the door, and all I can see are her feet. She's got on fuzzy slippers, pink ones, and all I can think is I'm going to get busted by some woman wearing fuzzy pink slippers. It's mortifying. Because she'd wanted to get horizontal as soon as possible, Cleo had given Rebecca back the shotgun position and was stretched out as best as possible on the floor of the van. Man, man, I need to take some alcohol internally really soon. You are great, Jack glanced in the rearview mirror. Nerves of steel. Yeah, nerves of jelly for a moment there. Oh, hey. She rolled herself over, eased up to a crouched position. I got you a present, dear. A present? Yeah. She dug into her bag and pulled out the balled-up suit. Great color for you. Sort of eggplant, I think. Good texture. Cashmere. Is this... is this hers? So what? Have it clean, fumigated, whatever. Cleo shrugged as she dug in the bag again. It'll look better on you anyway. Just like these shoes are going to look better on me. She set them aside, dug in again. Snagged you this little evening purse, Rebecca. Judith Lieber, it's not bad. How the hell did you get all that stuff? Jack demanded. Leftover skill from my shoplifting days. I'm not proud of it, but I was 16 and rebellious. It's a cry for attention, right, Tia? Well, don't you think she'll notice this is missing? Hell, she's got half the stock from Bergdorf's in there. What's one outfit? Besides, she's going to be too busy to do a wardrobe check once she gets back and our shit hits her fan. You've got such a way with words. Malachi reached down, patted her head. Tell me. And she felt the last of the residual tension fade when they drove into the garage and she saw Jack's SUV. Gideon was back, and all was right with her world. So, we can order pizza now, right? 27. There they are. Tia circled the table again. On it, the three silver fates, linked at their bases, glinted in the late morning sunlight. It almost seemed like a dream, she said quietly. Like a dream, last night and everything that led up to it? Or a play I somehow stumbled into. But there they are. You never stumbled, Tia. Standing behind her, Malachi laid his hands on her shoulders. You've been rock steady, through and through. That's a dream in itself. They haven't been together for a century. Perhaps two. We united them. That means something. Eternal and secure, that's what's said about them in mythology. We have to see that these symbols of them are just that, secure. They won't be divided again. Spin, measure, cut. She touched each, lightly in turn. What's in a life and what it touches? These are more than art, Malachi, and more than the dollars anyone would pay to own them. That They're of responsibility. She shifted the base, lifted Clotho, and thought of Henry W. Wiley. He'd held it the same way had sought the others and died in the seeking. My blood and yours are twined in this. I wonder if they understood, even a little, what a long thread she wove for them. It wasn't cut off at their deaths. It spun out to you and me and the rest of us, even Anita. Still holding the fate, she turned to him, thread spinning out, two men from opposite arcs of life starting a circle with this between them. The circle widens with Cleo and Jack, Rebecca and Gideon, and the threads spin on. If we take what these three images represent, if we allow ourselves to believe it, Anita's part in it was meant to be. So we give her no responsibility for what she's done, he demanded. For the blood she spilled for nothing more than greed. No. The good and bad, the flaws and virtues are woven into the threads. The choices, the responsibilities are hers. And fate always demands payment. Carefully, Tia set Clotho with her sisters. 
and eventually always collects. I suppose I'm saying she may not be the only one to pay a price. You shouldn't be sad today of all days. He drew her into his arms, stroked his fingers through her sunny cap of hair. We've done most of what we set out to do, and we'll finish it. I'm not sad, but I am wondering what happens when we do finish it. When we do, the pattern changes again, he said. He rubbed his cheek over the top of her head. There's something I should have told you before, something I should have made clear. She braced, shut her eyes, and the elevator doors opened. Okay, break it up. We've got supplies. Cleo, arms loaded with marketing bags, strode into the loft just ahead of Gideon. Jack and Rebecca are on their way up. He's got word on Anita. She arrived on schedule, Jack relayed, and was driven to the home of Stefan Nikos. Stefan was a friend and client of Paul Morningside, and both he and his wife are known for their art and antique collection, their charitable works, and their hospitality. It's olive oil, isn't it? Rebecca plucked one of the olives from her plate and studied it. I've read of him in Money Magazine and Time and so on. He's swimming in olive oil. Ah,、oh, that's such a homely little thing. Could make anyone so rich. Olive groves, Jack agreed, and vineyards and the various byproducts from both. He has homes in Athens, on Corfu, a pied de terre in Paris, and a chateau in the Swiss Alps. He plucked one of the olives from Rebecca's plate, popped it into his mouth, and security by Burdette in each location. You have a long reach, Jack, Malachy commented. Long enough. I spoke to Stefan last week. After Tia planted the Athens seed, you might have told the rest of us. Rebecca retorted, "Didn't know if the seed would sprout. Like I said, he was a friend of Morningside. He's not so fond of the widow." Me, he added with a slow grin. He likes just fine, fine enough to do me a favor. He's amused at the idea of stringing a needle along. He'll keep her busy for a couple of days with rumors of Lachesis and the tall, sexy brunette who's hunting for the statue. Yeah, how am I liking Greece? You're getting around," Jack told Cleo. "Not much time for sightseeing. There's always next time. We'll have a week at the outside," Malachy calculated, "for the wheels to turn, to put everything else into play." He paused, scanned the faces around him. "It has to be said, though, and may as well be said now. We could stop where we are. We have the fates." Cleo surged up from her slouch. She hasn't paid. Wait now, hear me out. We have what she wants, what she stole, what she's killed for, and we hurt no one. Added to that, we've complicated her life considerably with the insurance claim and in moving those pieces from Morningside into her personal safe. She'd already committed insurance fraud, Gideon commented. We just upped the stakes. There's no guarantee that she won't slither out of it. He laid a hand on Cleo's thigh, felt the muscles vibrating. There's no guarantee of anything," Malachy returned. "But we can be sure she won't slither easily, not with those pieces tucked away in her library safe. And Jack's put a bug in the ear of his police friend about her. There's a good chance if we sit back, the system will work. Lou will bulldog it. Jack forked up some pasta salad. Security tapes will show the pieces on her claim form were still in place after the break-in. Her life won't be a picnic while he's on her. The insurance investigator is going to take a really dim view of a claim in excess of two million when the client still has the merchandise. Maybe she pays a fine, does some community service. I, Jack held up his fork to interrupt Cleo's rant. Just getting a visual of Anita in a soup kitchen. It's not bad. Doesn't play either. Not for seven-figure fraud. Still, if we want her going all the way down, Bob has to tie her to Dabrowski. If he can't connect her. He can't tie her to the murder or to Cleo's friend, and she'd skate. Cleo said bitterly, "Yeah, but she could skate anyway. That's where Mal's coming from. With what we did, she gets hit with insurance fraud, does a little time, and her glossy society widow image ends up smeared." Sometimes, Tia said, as everyone looked at her, that sort of notoriety adds a sheen of its own. Good point, Jack agreed. If we follow through with the rest. We skin her financially, and maybe, Jack said again, we push her into making a mistake that locks it all down. There's a lot of ifs in there. 
Moving forward puts it all back in the mix. Um, Tia lifted a hand, then let it fall. The Miri, the Fates, prophesied when he was only a week old that Meliasier would die when a brand on his mother's hearth burned out. They sang his fate, Clotho that he would be noble, Lachesis that he'd be brave, and Atropus looking at the infant that he would live only as long as that brand was not consumed. I don't get this, Cleo began. Let her finish, Gideon told her. Well, you see, Meliager's mother, desperate to protect her baby, hid the brand away in a chest. If it didn't burn out, he'd be safe. So her son grew up, and as a man, Meliager killed his mother's brothers. In anger and grief at the slaughter, she took the brand out of the chest and burned it. So Meliager died, avenging her brothers. She'd lost her son. Fine. Mikey stands for my brother, but that bitch sure as hell doesn't stand for my kid, so what? The point is, Tia said gently, revenge is never free, and it never brings back what was lost. If we move forward only for revenge, the price may be too high. Cleo got up. As Tia had done earlier, she walked over, circled the tables where the fate stood. Mikey was my friend. Gideon barely knew him. The rest of you didn't know him at all. We know you, Cleo, Rebecca said quietly. Yeah, well, I'm not going to stand here and pretend I don't want revenge, and I'm willing to pay the fright for it. What I said before, the first time we all got together at Tia's, that still holds. I want justice more, so we've got these, and we're rich. Big fucking deal. She turned her back on them. If people just step back from what's right, don't stand up for a friend when it gets tough. What's the damn point? Any one of you doesn't want to get dragged into this. That's cool. No harm, no foul, especially after all this. But I'm not done. I'm not done till she's sitting in a cell cursing my name. Malachi looked at his brother, nodded. Then he laid a hand over Tia's. The story you told, darling. There's another meaning to it. Yes, choice determines destiny. She rose, walked to Cleo. Lives circle around, intersect, touch and bounce off each other. All we can do is our best and follow the thread to the end. I don't suppose justice is free either. We'll just have to make it worth the price. Okay. Cleo's vision blurred with tears. I've got a. She gave a helpless shrug, then walked quickly out of the room. No, let me. Tia said as Gideon started to rise. I could use a little crying jive myself. As Tia hurried after Cleo, Malachi reached for his beer. Now that's settled, and we're all on the same page, more or less. I'm going to bring up other business of a more personal sort. He took a deep drink to wet his throat. The second part of the conversation we had before, he said to Jack. Well then, as head of the family. Head of the family. Rebecca gave a shout of laughter. My arse, Ma's head of the family. She's not here, is she? Malachi said evenly and bristled at having his rhythm broken. And I'm the oldest. So it falls to me to address the matter of this engagement. It's my engagement and none of your concern. Shut your mouth for five flaming minutes. I'm getting another beer. Gideon decided. This should be entertaining. Don't you tell me to shut my mouth, you puffed-up pea-brain monkey. I could have done this out of your presence, Malachi reminded her, and the cool tone warned of rising temper, and saved myself the insults and abuse. And now I'm talking to Jack. Oh, talking to Jack, are you? And I'm to sit here with my hands folded and my head demurely bowed. She threw a pillow at him. You wouldn't know demure if it crawled down your throat and tickled your tonsils. He threw the pillow back, bouncing it off her head. And after I say my piece, you can say your own. But by God, I'm saying it. Rebecca, Jack spoke as she bared her teeth. Why don't you wait until he's finished before you get pissed off? Thank you, Jack. And first, I'll say. You have all the pity in my heart for the life you'll lead with this ill-mannered, bad-tempered, violent-natured female. Malachi narrowed his eyes as she made a grab for the jade bowl on the coffee table, and Jack clamped a hand on her wrist. Han Dynasty, stick with the pillows. As I was saying, Malachi continued, I'm aware money isn't an issue with you, but I want to clear my sister doesn't come to you with empty pockets. She's a quarter interest in our business, which does well enough. Whether or not she decides to continue to work actively in that business, 
The quarter interest remains hers, and she's also entitled to her share of whatever comes out of this enterprise of ours. The money doesn't matter. It matters to us, Malachy corrected. And it matters to Rebecca. He lifted a brow at his sister. Maybe you aren't a complete pea brain. And she smiled at him. I've seen how things are between you, and I'm glad of it. For all her faults, and they are legion, we love her and we want her happy. As far as the Sullivan business is concerned, you're welcome to be as much a part of that as suits you. Nicely done, Mal. Gideon sat on the arm of his brother's chair, lifted his glass, and toast. Da would have been pleased with that. And so, Jack, welcome to the family. Thanks. I don't know much about boats. Wouldn't mind learning more. Well, now, Rebecca grinned at her brothers. I'm just the one to teach you. We'll talk about that. He gave her knee a friendly pat before getting to his feet. I've got one or two errands to run. I could use a hand, he said to the other men. If the three of you are going gallivanting, so am I. I'm going to drag Cleo and Tia out to look at wedding dresses. Did I mention I'm wanting a big white wedding? That stopped him. Define big. Don't waste your breath, Gideon advised him. She's got that gleam in her eye. It was still there three hours later when she came back loaded down with brides' magazines, a wedding planner book Tia bought her as an engagement gift, and the sexy little nightgown that had been Cleo's gift. I still say lilies will make beautiful centerpieces for the reception. Right, Cleo winked at Tia. They're not just for funerals anymore. The wildflower nosegays were so charming, Tia put in. I can't believe I spent all that time in a flower shop and my sinuses stayed clear. I've had an allergy breakthrough. What are all those red spots on your face? Cleo asked her, then roared as Tia made a dash for the Adam mirror in Jack's living area and did a thorough inspection for rashes or hives. I don't think that's funny. Not one bit. You know how she likes to joke. Rebecca commented, then glanced over toward the archway leading to the bedroom. The bags she held fell to the floor, and she was flying. Ma! There's my girl. Eileen caught her, hugged her hard. There's my pretty girl. Ma, what are you doing here? How did you get here? Oh, I missed you. What I'm doing is unpacking my things, and I got here on a plane. I missed you, too. Just let me look at you. Eileen pulled her back. Studied her face. Happy, are you? I am, yes, very happy. I knew he was for you when you brought him home for tea. She sighed, pressed her lips to Rebecca's brow while all the years whizzed by in her head. Now introduce me to your friends here, whom I've already heard so much about from my boys. Tia and Cleo, my mother, Eileen Sullivan. It's lovely to meet you, Mrs. Sullivan. Malachy's mother, Tia thought, panicked. I hope you had a pleasant flight. I felt like a queen, lolling about in first class. Yeah, well, it's a long one, though. Uneasy, Cleo tugged on Tia's sleeve. We'll split and let you rest up, catch up, all that. Indeed you won't. Eileen's smile was friendly, and her mind made up. We'll have a nice cozy pot of tea and a chat. The boys are down below doing some devious thing or the other, so we'll take advantage of the time. Such a fine, big flat this is, she added, glancing around. There must be the makings for tea somewhere in it. I'll make it, Tia said quickly. I'll help. Cleo nipped at her heels all the way into the kitchen. What are we supposed to talk to her about? She hissed. Oh, hi, Mrs. Sullivan. We really enjoy sex with your sons while we're not out breaking into buildings. Oh, God. Oh, God. Tia put her head in her hands. What did we come in here for? Tea. Right, I forgot. Okay. She opened two cupboards before she remembered where she herself had stored the tea. Well, she has to know. Oh, God. Tia opened the fridge, found an open bottle of wine. She pulled out the stopper and took a pull straight from the bottle. She has to know something about the other. Either Malachi or Gideon would call her regularly. We know she knows about the fates and Anita and at least some portion of the plans. As for the other... Tia tried to calm down as she measured out tea. They're grown men, and she seems like a reasonable woman. Easy for you. She's probably going to be all right with the idea of her firstborn cozied up with a published author with a Ph.D. in an apartment on the Upper East Side. But I don't see her doing cheers when she finds out her baby boy is doing it with a stripper. 
That's insulting. Well, Jesus, Tia, who could blame her? I... No, not to Mrs. Sullivan, to you. With the tea canister still in hand, Tia turned. You're insulting a friend of mine, and I don't like it. You're brave and loyal and smart, and you have nothing to be ashamed of, nothing to apologize for. That was well said, Tia. Eileen stepped into the kitchen and watched both women blanch. I can see why Malachi's so taken with you. And as for you, she said to Cleo, it happens I trust my baby boy's judgment and have always admired his taste, and Mal's as well. I'll start there with the both of you and we'll see how we get on. See that water boils full before you pour it, she added. Most Yanks never can get a decent pot of tea made. When Jack came into the apartment thirty minutes later, he noted three things simultaneously. Tia was flustered, Cleo was stiff, and Rebecca was glowing. It was Rebecca who rose, slowly, walked to him. She wrapped her arms around his neck, brought her mouth to his for a long, lingering kiss. Thanks, she said. You're welcome. He kept an arm around her waist as he looked over at her mother. Settling in all right, Eileen? Couldn't be more comfortable, thank you, Jack. Now I'm hearing from the three girls here that you've all got more plans for this woman who's after hurting my family. I hope we can sit down and find a way I might help you out with them. I'm sure we'll think of something. According to my contact, the woman is even now combing Athens in search of a certain silver lady and a brunette. He came over, sat across from Cleo. She bought a gun. It was the first thing she did. It's clear she's hoping to track you down, and when she does, she plans to play for keeps. She's going to be disappointed, isn't she? And we're going to keep her that way. Gideon came in. Malachi behind him, and there was fury in his eyes. Whatever plans are from this point, we're keeping you well away from her. Hey, listen, Slick. The hell I will. She's not planning on having a chat with you. She's planning on getting what she's after, then killing you. Did you tell her where she got the gun? Black market, Jack provided. Unregistered Glock. She was careful. She didn't try to get a weapon through customs. Odds are she's not planning on bringing it back through either. She hopes to get her money's worth out of it, then ditch it. Like I said, she's going to be disappointed. And you're on background duty from here out, Gideon told her. You help Rebecca with tech, Tia with research. And you stay in this flat, or Tia's. You don't go out alone for any reason, and if you argue with me, I'll lock you in a closet until it's done. Cleo, before you cosh my son, which I'm sure he deserves for any number of reasons, I'd like to say something. Eileen sat comfortably, as she often did at her own kitchen table. I've had a different view of things, as I haven't been in the center of it. There's a weak spot and a kiddie's heel, you could say. That'd be apt, wouldn't it? Eileen said to Tia. This woman knows your face, Cleo. She believes you're holding something she's already killed for. She's focused on you now. That'll change and shift a bit after she comes back here. But you're the one thing she's sure of. If she manages to get to you, she gets to all. Would that be the case, Mal? It would, in a nutshell. We won't risk losing you, Cleo, for your own sake. And I don't think you'll risk the whole of the matter just for the chance to thumb your nose in her face. Okay, point taken. I'm a risk. So I stay covered. And next time, Gideon, Eileen said, you might ask reasonably instead of tossing orders about. You make a fine cup of tea for a yank to you. Thank you, Mrs. Sullivan. Let's just make it Eileen, why don't we? From what I gather here, you're a clever girl in other areas. Not really, I'm just good at following directions. Modesty's very becoming. Eileen poured another half cup of tea from the pot. But when it's misplaced or untrue, then it's just foolishness. You found a way to get this woman's financial information. Actually, it was my friend who... Yes... Tia amended at Eileen's lifted eyebrows. I found a way. And so you know how much to demand from her for the fates. We haven't decided exactly, but I thought... Does the girl always worry about speaking her mind? Eileen asked Malachi. Not as much as she did. You're making her nervous. Though color rose into her cheeks, Tia straightened her shoulders. She can liquidate up to fifteen million... Twenty, really, but that adds considerable time and complications, so fifteen's better. So I thought we should ask for ten and give her a buffer. The fates are worth a great deal more. 
She'll know that with a little work and research, she can sell them to the right collector for at least double her investment. My father verified that he, as a dealer, would offer ten. As a businesswoman, she'd think the same way. Very sensible, Eileen said with a nod. Now all you have to do is figure out how to have her turn over that kind of money without giving her the fates. Have her charged with the insurance fraud and end it all with her being arrested for murder. With that done, we can get down to planning a wedding and get back to running Sullivan Tours. Your cousins are doing a fine job with the day-to-day -day of it, she told Malachy. But we need to have our hands back in it again. It'll hold a bit longer, Ma, Malachy assured her. If I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be here. Just as I believe the lot of you will come up with the solution to the whole of it. You've gotten this far after all, and speaking of that, isn't it time someone offered to show me the fates? I like your mother. Malachy's lips twitched as he watched Tia neatly turn down the bed. She terrifies you. Just a little. Out of habit, she switched on the white noisemaker on the bedside table. When she moved away to adjust her bedroom air filter, Malachy switched it back off as he did every night. She never noticed. Rebecca was so happy to see her. It was a lovely thing for Jack to do bringing her here. Restless, Tia walked into the bath, carefully removed her hypoallergenic makeup with hypoallergenic cleanser. A nice surprise for you, too, she added, when Malachy came to the doorway. I'm sure you've missed her. I have very much. He loved to watch her this way, the tidiness of her, the pretty sweetness of her face, without any trace of cosmetics. You know what they say about Irish men? No, what do they say? They may be drunks or rebels, brawlers or poets, but to a man, they love their mothers. She laughed a little, stood there opening and closing the top of her moisturizer. You're not any of those things. What an insult. I can drink and brawl with the best of them. Sure, I've got some rebel in me. Um, do you want poetry to you? I don't know. I've never had any. Do you want it quoted or made up? She wanted to smile, was sure she could, but it collapsed on her. Don't do this. What? Baffled and a little alarmed, he stepped to her, and she stepped away. I'm not going to make it difficult for you. That's good to know, he said carefully. Why are you crying? I'm not crying, she sniffed. I won't cry. I'll be reasonable and understanding, just like I always am, she said, and set the moisturizer on the counter with a snap. Maybe you should tell me what you're going to be reasonable and understanding about. Don't laugh at me. Knowing people laugh at me doesn't make it any less horrible. I'm not laughing at you, sweetheart. He reached out for her, and she smacked his hand aside. Don't call me that, and don't touch me, she added as she pushed by him and strode back into the bedroom. Don't call you sweetheart, don't touch you. You won't cry, and you'll be reasonable and understanding. His head began to throb. Give me a clue here. We're almost done, I know it, and I'll finish it out. This is the only important thing I've done in my life, and I won't leave it unfinished. It's not the only important thing you've done. Don't placate me, Malachy. Damned if I'm placating you, and bloody hell if I'm going to stand here arguing without any idea what I'm arguing about. Christ, I'm getting one of your headaches. He scrubbed his hands roughly over his face. Tia, what is it? You said you should have told me before. Maybe you should. Maybe even though I knew, it would have been better that way. Told you. Ah. Oh. And he remembered what he'd been about to say before Cleo had interrupted them that morning. He frowned, jammed his hands into his pockets. You know, and it pisses you off. I'm not allowed to have feelings, she tossed back. I'm not allowed to be angry, just grateful. Grateful that we've had these weeks together? Well, I am grateful, and I'm angry. I'll be furious if I want. She glanced around. God, there must be something to throw. Don't think about it, he advised. Just grab the first thing and let it fly. She snatched up her hairbrush, heaved it. It cracked solidly against the jewel-toned shade of her bedside lamp. Damn it, 
Damn it. That was Tiffany. Can I even have a successful temper tantrum? You should have thrown it at me. He grabbed her arms before she could go clean up the mess she'd made. Just let me go. I'm not going to do that. I'm stupid. The fight went out of her. All I've done is embarrass myself and break a beautiful lampshade. I should have taken a Xanax. Well, you didn't, and I prefer fighting with a woman who's not hazy on some tranquilizer. These are real feelings, Tia, and you'll have to deal with them. Whether you want mine or not, you'll have to deal with them. I've been dealing with them. She shoved at him. I've been dealing with them all along, and it's not fair. I don't care that life doesn't have to be fair, because this is my life. And I can't make it easy on you, no matter how often I told myself I would. I want you to go stay at Jack's. You can't be here with me. It's too much. You're tossing me out. Before I go, I'll know why, he said and grabbed her. It's too much, I said. I'll finish what we started, and I won't let the others down, but I won't. I will not be the quiet, unassuming lover who makes it convenient for you when it's over and you walk away, when you go back to Ireland and pick up your life where you left it off, where you leave me off. For once, I'm doing the ending, and I'm telling you to go. Have I ever asked you to be quiet or unassuming? No. You changed my life, thank you very much. There. She tried to twist away and was hauled back. You want more? Fine. It's very considerate of you to be honest enough to tell me it's all temporary. Lives bumping together and moving on. You've got a home and a business to run in Ireland, so good luck. You're a confusing woman, Tia, and a great deal of work. I'm a very simple woman, and extremely low maintenance. Bollocks, you're a maze, and constantly fascinating to me. Let's just back all this up for clarity's sake. In your opinion, I was about to tell you this morning that, that it's been nice, it's been fun, and very pleasurable as well. I'd probably add that I'm quite fond of you and knowing you to be a quiet, unassuming woman, ha ha. I'm sure you'll understand that when this business is done, then so are we. The image of him was hazed through tears. For the first time, she wished, viciously, that he was ordinary to look at, to speak with, to make love with. It doesn't matter what you would have said, because I'm saying it now. Oh, it matters, he disagreed. I'm thinking it matters, so I'll tell you what it is I realized I should have told you before. I love you. That's what I should have told you before. What do you think of that? I don't know. A tear spilled over now, but she didn't notice. Do you mean it? Of course not. He laughed as her mouth fell open, then scooped her off her feet. What, I'm a liar now as well? I love you, Tia, and if I changed your life, you changed mine right back. If you think I can pick up where I left off before you, then you are stupid. Nobody ever said that to me before. That you're stupid? No. She touched his face as he sat on the side of the bed with her in his lap. I love you. No one's ever said that to me. Then you'll have to make do with me telling you, until you're tired of hearing it. She shook her head as her heart swelled. No one's ever said it to me so I never had the chance to say it back. Now I do. I love you. I love you, Malachi. Spinning threads, she thought as she pressed her lips to his, spinning them into yet another pattern. If her thread was cut short, she could look back at this moment and have no regrets. 28. She was close. She knew it. She'd spent hours combing trinket shops, more paying calls on antique and art houses, with the pretense of doing business. She'd had endless and so far fruitless conversations with local collectors she'd tagged, thanks to Stefan. To reward herself, Anita enjoyed a long, cold drink at a shady table by the sparkling pool beside the Nikos' guest house. Despite his introductions to collectors, Stefan wasn't being as helpful as she'd hoped. Hospitable enough, she mused, as she sipped her frothy mimosa. He and his dull wife had welcomed her with open arms. Another time she'd have relished the time in the spectacular white house flowing over the hills above Athens, 
with its acres of gardens, its army of servants, and its cool, fragrant courtyards. It was very satisfying to stretch out here on thick cushions beside a shimmering pool fed by a fountain depicting Aphrodite, to scan the sheltering trees and flowers under a hot blue sky, and know she had only to lift a finger and anything, anything her appetites craved would be brought to her. That was the silken shelter of true wealth, true privilege, where there was no need to concern yourself with anything beyond your own immediate desires. And that was her life's ambition. In fact, she thought it was time she looked into similar accommodations for herself. Once she had the other statues, and she would have them, she might consider a partial retirement. After all, she'd be hard-pressed to top the coup of acquiring and selling the three fates. Morningside would have outlived its purpose for her. Italy might be more her style, she mused. Some elegant villa in Tuscany, where she would live in staggering, expatriate style. Of course, she'd keep the house in New York. She'd spend a few months there every year, shopping, socializing, entertaining, and gathering the envy of others like rose petals. She'd grant interviews, but after the initial flurry of media, she'd slip away. That veil of mystery would be thin, and when she lifted it on her own whim, they'd run, scrambling for her. She would put Morningside up for sale, regretfully, and would reap all the profits due her after the investment of twelve tedious years of marriage. It was the life she'd been meant for, Anita decided, as she eased back on the chaise. One of indulgence, fame, and great, great wealth. God knew she'd earned it. She'd find that infuriating Cleo Tolliver and remove that obstacle from her path. It was only a matter of time. She couldn't hide forever. At least Stefan had been of some help interpreting in a few of the shops, inquiring for her about the brunette and a small silver statue. The Tolliver woman was certainly getting around. And twice now, according to the shopkeepers, Anita had missed her by less than an hour. It only meant she was closing in, Anita assured herself. Imagine that slut believing she could outwit Anita Gay. It was going to be a very costly mistake for Cleo Tolliver. Anita! Still floating on the current of her fantasies, Anita tipped down her shaded glasses and looked at Stefan. Hello, beautiful out here, isn't it? Perfect. I thought you might enjoy a fresh drink, some refreshment. He gestured to the trays of fruit and cheese a servant arranged on the table, then handed her another mimosa. I'd adore it, thanks. I hope you're going to join me. I will. His silver hair glinted in the sun as he took the chair beside her. His arms were tanned and muscled, his body fit, and his face interestingly craggy. He was worth, at conservative estimates, a hundred and twenty million. If she'd been in the market for another husband, he'd have been a top contender. I want to thank you, Stefan, again for being my guide and liaison. It's bad enough I'm taking advantage of your hospitality by coming into your home on hardly a moment's notice. But I'm taking up so much of your time. I know how busy a man of your stature and position is. Please. He gestured her words away as he picked up his own drink. It's nothing but a pleasure, and exciting as well with this uh, treasure hunt. Such things make me feel young again. Oh, as if you're not. She leaned toward him, offering him a deliberate view of lush breasts barely contained by her thin bikini. She may not have been in the market for a husband, but lovers were always a consideration. You're an attractive, vital man in the prime. Why, if it wasn't for your wife... She trailed off, tapped a finger on the back of his hand in a flirtatious manner. I'd make a play for you myself. You flatter me. Calculating and pitifully obvious woman, he thought, and felt another twinge for his good friend who hadn't seen this creature for what she was. Not in the least. Like wine, I prefer men with a certain age and body to their credit. I hope one day I'll be able to repay you for your kindness. What I do, he said, I do for Paul. And, of course, for you, Anita. You deserve all I can do for you and more. 
As it happens, I fear I have not been successful in helping you with your treasure hunt. Naturally, as a collector, my interest isn't uh, completely altruistic. What a prize it would be to add the Miri to my collection. I trust when the time comes we can do business. How could it be otherwise? She tapped her glass against his. To future dealings, business and personal. I look forward to it more than I can say. I should tell you that on the other front, I have had some small success. He paused, studied the fruit, and sliced off a branch of fat purple grapes. Will you not sample some from our own arbors? Thank you. She took the branch from him. You were saying? Eh? Oh, yes, yes. He took his time, selected a branch of grapes for himself. Yes, some small success on the matter of the woman you seek, the name of the hotel where she was booked. You found her. Anita swung her legs over the chaise, so that her feet smacked against the tiles. Why didn't you say so? Where is this place? In an area of the city I would never recommend for a lady of your delicacies. She's... I need a car and drive her. She snapped. Immediately. Of course, all is at your disposal. He cut a thin slice of cheese, added it to the small plate that held the grapes she'd yet to taste. Ah, but you think to go to this hotel to see her. She is not there. What are you talking about? Obvious, Stefan thought again. Yes, she was obvious. And now the cat peeked out behind the mask, showing its nasty little fangs and ugly temper. She was booked, he explained, but has checked out only today. Where did she go? Where the hell is she? Alas, I was unable to learn this. The clerk said only that she checked out shortly after meeting with a young man, uh, British or Irish. The clerk wasn't certain. They left together. The color that temper and excitement had thrown into her cheeks slid away until her face was white as bone, hard as stone. That can't be. Naturally, there could be some mistake or confusion, but the clerk seemed cooperative enough and very certain. I can arrange for you to speak with him yourself tomorrow if you like. He has no English, but I will be happy to interpret. Still, I must insist you meet him away from this area. I could not, in good conscience, take you there. I need to talk to him now. I need to find her now, before... She paced the hot white tiles around the pool and thought murderously of Malachy Sullivan. Calm yourself, Anita. His tone all comfort. Stefan got to his feet. A servant approached and apologized for the interruption. Stefan took the envelope the servant held out, then dismissed him. Anita, you have a telegram. She whirled back, the heels of her sandals clicking on the tile. Ordinarily, he would have excused himself to give a guest privacy, but he refused to miss the moment and stood nearby, watching, as she ripped open the telegram and read. Anita, sorry I didn't have time to come round in person and give you my regards. Strangers in a strange land, and so on. But I finished my business in Athens rather quickly, and am, by the time you read this, escorting some rather attractive ladies to New York. I suggest you get yourself back there as soon as possible, if you're interested in a fateful reunion. I'll be in touch. Malachy Sullivan. Stefan had the pleasure of hearing her strangled scream as she bawled the telegram in her fist. I hope this is not bad news. I have to get to New York, right away. The color was back in her face and raging. Of course, I'll make the arrangements for you if there's anything I can do. I'll do it, she said between her teeth. You'd better believe I'll do it. He waited until she'd stormed away rushing in the direction of the house. Then he sat, picked up his drink, took out his cell phone. He enjoyed a grape while he made the call. Jack, I'll have a very angry woman on my private jet within two hours. No, no, he said, chuckling as he chose another grape. It's been, my friend, and continues to be my very great pleasure. She got home to a pile of messages, many of which were from the police and only served to irritate her. She'd spent the hours in the air devising ways she would dispose of Malachy, 
all of which ended in his bloody, painful death. As satisfying as all of them were, Anita was smart enough and still controlled enough to know it was essential to find the right time, the right place, and the right method. She wanted him dead, but she wanted the fates even more. She ordered her servants out of the house. She wanted the place empty. She showered, changed, then contacted Jasper. She broke one of her own cardinal rules by ordering him to come to her home. She was dissatisfied with his work and considered disposing of him. It would, she imagined, be simple enough to make it look like a break-in attempt, mock up signs of a struggle. With her clothes torn a bit, a few handy bruises, no one would question her, a woman alone, defending her home and her person, with one of her dead husband's guns. Remembering how it had felt to pull a trigger, to see Dabrowski stumble, fall, die, she knew the act would be a great stress reliever. But she'd had enough of the police for a while, and, added to that, Jasper might yet come in handy. She couldn't afford the luxury of cutting him loose quite yet. He came, as instructed, to the rear entrance. She gestured him in, then walked directly to the library. Appreciating the value of position, she sat behind the desk. Close the door, she said coolly. When his back was turned, she took the gun she'd placed in the drawer and set it in her lap, just in case. I'm not pleased with your work, Mr. Jasper. She held up a finger before he could speak. Nor am I interested in your excuses. I've paid you, and paid you well, for your particular skills and talents. In my opinion, they've been sadly lacking. You haven't given me a hell of a lot to go on. She sat back. After the long flight, it was energizing to feel the fury, the violence pumping out of him. Better, she thought, than drugs. He believed he was stronger, more dangerous, and had no idea he was only one finger twitch away from death. Are you criticizing me, Mr. Jasper? Look, you don't think I'm doing the job, fire me. Oh, I've considered that. She stroked a fingertip over the cold steel of the nine millimeter in her lap. I'm a businesswoman. And when an employee does unsatisfactory work, that employee is terminated. No skin off my nose. She saw his body shift. She knew he carried a gun under his suit jacket. Was he considering using it on her, she wondered? To intimidate? To rob? Perhaps to rape? Thinking she'd be helpless against him and unable to go to the police, the idea was absolutely thrilling. However, as a businesswoman, I also believe in giving employees certain incentives in the hopes their work will improve. I'm going to offer you an incentive. Yeah? He relaxed his gun arm. Such as? A $25,000 bonus if you find and deliver to me a man named Malachi Sullivan. He's in the city, possibly in the company of Cleo Tolliver. You remember Cleo, don't you, Mr. Jasper? She purred it. She's managed to slip through your fingers a number of times. If you deliver both of them, I'll double that bonus. I don't care what kind of shape they're in, as long as they're alive. I want to be very clear on that point. They must be alive. Your former associate didn't understand that distinction, which is why he was terminated. Fifty for the man, a hundred if I get them both. She angled her head, then used a finger to nudge a large manila envelope over the desk. There's a picture of him in here and two thousand for expenses. I will not give you more than two thousand, she said, until I have some results. There's an apartment building on West 18th, between 9th and 10th. The address is also in the envelope, along with keys. That building is being renovated. Renovations will be put on hold as of today. When you have Mr. Sullivan and hopefully Miss Tolliver, you're to take them there. Use the basement facilities. Employ whatever means necessary to restrain them. Then contact me at the number I've already given you. Is that all very clear? I got it. You get me the man and the woman? And you'll get the money you've asked for. After that, I don't want to ever see or hear from you again. He took the envelope. Figure you want to know. Taps are off the Marsh woman's phone. Anita pursed her lips. Doesn't matter, 
she decided. She doesn't interest me any longer. Her old man got real talky when I went in his place and asked about those statues. Sounded like he'd like to get his hands on them. Yes, I'm sure he would. I assume he told you nothing particularly helpful. Said something about he heard maybe one of them was in Greece. Athens. But said it was just a rumor and there were others. Athens. Well, that was yesterday. Tried getting information out of me, acting like he was just shooting the breeze, but he was digging. I'm no longer concerned with that. Get me Malachy Sullivan. You can leave the way you came in. She figured he didn't have a brain, Jasper decided, as he walked out. Figured he didn't have the smarts to find out what was what. He'd find the Sullivan guy all right, and the woman. But he'd be fucked if he turned them over for a lousy hundred grand. If they were the connection to those statues, they'd tell him about it. And when he had the fates, Anita Gay would pay and pay deeply. Then maybe he'd do her, just the way he figured she'd done that asshole, Dabrowski, right before he hopped a plane to Rio. Anita stayed at her desk, going through messages. To entertain herself, she tore those pertaining to the police into small pieces. Investigations of homicides and burglaries weren't her job, after all. She intended to contact the insurance agent very shortly. She expected them to deliver a check for her claim promptly. If they needed to be reminded, she could easily take her hefty annual premiums elsewhere. She would be happy to do so. The doorbell rang. Twice. She cursed her miserably inefficient and grossly overpaid staff before remembering she'd dismiss them for the remainder of the day. Sighing over the annoyance of having to do everything herself, she went to the door. She wasn't pleased to see the two detectives standing on her stoop, but after weighing the pros and cons of ignoring them, she opened the door. Detectives, you just caught me. Lou Gilbert nodded. Miss Gay, may we come in? This really isn't a good time. I've just returned from an overseas trip. I'm very tired. But you're on your way out. You said we just caught you. Just caught me before I lay down, she said sweetly. We'll make it quick, then. Very well. She stepped back to let them in. I didn't realize you were working with... I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name. Detective Robbins. Of course, I didn't realize you were working with Detective Robbins on the burglary, Detective Gilbert. Sometimes cases overlap. I imagine... Of course, I'm delighted to have two of New York's finest looking into my problem. Please sit down. I'm afraid I sent the servants off as I wanted the house to myself. But I'm sure I can manage coffee if you'd like. Oh, thanks. Just the same. Lou sat down, started the rhythm. You said you'd just gotten back from a trip. Something you planned before the break-in? Something that came up unexpectedly. Overseas? Yes. She crossed her legs smoothly. Athens. Must be something, all those old temples. What's that drink? Ouzo. Had some once at a wedding, some kick. So I'm told. I'm afraid this trip was business, and I didn't have time for temples and ouzo. Tough on you, having to take off like that right after the burglary. Bob put in. You usually do the business travel? Depending. She didn't care for his tone, not one bit. When this was over, she was going to have a few choice words on the subject with his superiors. Excuse me, but if we could get to the point. We've been trying to contact you. It hampers the investigation when the victim's incommunicado. As I said, it was necessary and unexpected. In any case, I gave Detective Gilbert all the information I had. I assumed you and the insurance company would handle the rest of it. You filed your claim. I left the paperwork with my assistant before I left. She assured me it was messengered to my agent. Do you have any leads on my property or, or who broke into my building? The investigation's ongoing. Miss Gay, do you know anything about the three fates? For a moment, all she could do was stare. Of course, they're a legend in my line of work and my field of interest. Why? A tip that maybe that's what the thieves were after. But you didn't list any silver statue or statues on your claim form. A tip from whom? Anonymous, but we intend to follow up, 
any and all leads in this case. I didn't see anything that matches the description of any of these statues on your inventory list. You wouldn't, as I don't have one. If I did, Detective, you can be sure I would have had it locked in a vault. The fates are extremely valuable. Unfortunately, one was certainly lost with its owner on the Lusitania. As for the other two, no one can substantiate their existence. So, you don't have one of these statues? The anger, the insult of being questioned, edged into her voice. I believe I've already answered that question. If I did own one of the fates, you can be sure I'd announce it loud and clear. The publicity would be very beneficial to Morningside. Well, anonymous tips usually turn out to be dead ends. Lou took the apologetic route. Just as well. Something like that wouldn't go through the usual channels and fences. Since you weren't available, we got photographs and descriptions of the stolen property from the insurance company. We've been checking all those, uh, you know, usual avenues. Jack Burdett's cooperated regarding those security, but I'm going to be honest, Ms. Gay. We're coming up empty so far. It's very upsetting. I'm trying to be grateful we were fully insured. Though, of course, I hope to have the property restored. But it's very upsetting to know that Morningside was vulnerable. You'll have to excuse me. She got to her feet. I'm really very tired. We'll keep you updated. Bob rose. Oh, on the other matter. That homicide in the warehouse you used to own. Not just a few choice words, Anita decided. She would see to it this man was fired. Really, detective, I think we've established I know nothing about it. Just wanted you to know that we've ID'd a suspect. A man the, the victim was purported to be working with most recently. Pulled a photo out of his inside pocket. You recognize this man? Anita stared at the photograph of Jasper and wasn't sure if she wanted to laugh or scream. No, I don't. Didn't think you would, but we've got to follow up the angles. Thanks for your time, Ms. Gay. As they walked back to their car, the cops exchanged one brief look. She's dirty, Lou said. Oh, yeah, up to a swan-like neck. The minute the car pulled away from the curb, Cleo pulled out her phone. She's primed, she said. Make the call. Then she tucked the phone away and turned to Gideon in the driver's seat. Let's just hang a few minutes. I bet we'll be able to hear her scream all the way out here. We could do that. He passed her back the oversweet soft drink she'd brought for them to share during the stakeout. And after... I think we could take a little detour to Tia's. No one's there at the moment. Oh. Cleo tucked her tongue in her cheek. What did you have in mind? Tearing your clothes off. Tossing you down on the first handy flat surface and having at you. Sounds good to me. Inside the house, Anita stormed up the stairs. She should have killed Jasper. Killed him when she'd had the chance, then hired fresh muscle, one with a brain, to track down Malachi. Now she would have to find a way to do it anyway, and before the police found him. It had to have been Malachi who'd called the cops about the fates. Who else could it be? But why? Had he been the one who tried to break into Morningside? She balled her hands into fists as she paced her bedroom. How could some tour captain circumvent that layer of security? He could have hired someone, she supposed. But the man wasn't rolling in money. It had to go back to him, all of it, and oh, oh, would she make him suffer for it. She snatched up the phone on the first ring and snarled into the receiver. What? Rough day, darling. She bit back the curses on her tongue and all but cooed. Well, well, Malachi, isn't this a surprise? The first of many. How did you find Athens? I turned left at Italy. Good one. I don't recall you being quick with a joke, but it's nice to see you've your good humor in place. You'll need it. Guess what I'm looking at? Lovely silver ladies. A little birdie told me you were working very hard to find them. Looks as if I beat you to it. You want a deal, will deal. Where are you? I prefer discussing this face to face. I just bet you would. We'll deal, Anita. Indeed, we will. I'll be in touch with you about the when and the where, but I want to give you time to recover from the shock. You don't shock me. 
Why don't you go see how your own little silver lady fared while you were turning left at Italy? And stick around the house, won't you? I'll ring you back in thirty minutes. You should be conscious again by then. When the phone clicked in her ear, she slammed the receiver down. He wasn't going to shake her. So, he had two to her one, but that was all right. All he'd done was save her the trouble of getting them through customs and smuggling them back to New York herself. She glanced toward the closet and, unable to resist, walked over and inside. Her fingers trembled with fury as she opened the panel, opened the safe. Cleo was right. At that distance and that angle, they could just hear the scream. 29. Now that she was naked, face down on the floor and trying to get her breath back, Cleo figured letting Gideon have at her had been worth the rug burn, in spades. And since she'd had at him right back, she didn't think she'd hear any complaints from him either. They had, she thought, a really fine rhythm going between them, the kind she could dance to endlessly. Doing okay there? he asked her. I think some of my brains might have leaked out my ears, but I've got more. How about you? Well, I can't see yet, but I'm hopeful the blindness is temporary. Still, ending up blind and brain damage doesn't seem like such a high price to pay. You sure are a cutie slick. At such a time, a man prefers being called a tiger or some other sort of wild beast, rather than a cutie. Okay, you're a regular mastodon. That'll have to do. We should get up, put ourselves back together. Yeah, we should. And they lay as they were, a tangled and sweaty heap, with clothes scattered around them. I heard through the grapevine that you're thinking of opening a club or a school or some such. She managed to move one shoulder in what passed for a shrug. I'm thinking about it. So, you're not set on going back to dancing, spinning around on Broadway and that sort of thing. I ne never did a hell of a lot of spinning on Broadway anyway. I think you're a wonderful dancer. I'm not bad. She turned her head, rested her cheek on the rug the rug. But you've got to know when to move on, or you end up a blown-out gypsy being bounced from audition to audition. So you're more in mind to stay put, you could say. He trailed his finger up her spine, down again. She had such a lovely long back. You know, they have clubs and dance schools in Ireland. No kidding. And here I thought all they had were shamrocks and little green fairies. You forgot the beer. She ran her tongue around her teeth. Could use one right now. I'll get us both one when I can feel my legs again. Cove's not so big and crowded as New York. Thank the Lord, he thought. But it's a good-sized village, and we get lots of tourists. It's not such a ways from Cork City if there's a need for the urban sort of crowds and traffic. We're very big on dancing in Ireland, whether it's the doing it or the learning it. You know, a dancer is a kind of artist, and we hold our artists as national treasures. Is that so? She could feel her heart begin to thud, but stayed very still. Maybe I should check it out. I think you should. His hand began to rub light, lazy circles on her butt. So, do you want to get married? She closed her eyes a moment. Let the honey of it, warm and sweet, slide through her. Then she turned her head, looked him in the eye. Sure. Their grins spread, and, laughing, they reached for each other just as the front door opened. Oh, mother of God, my eyes! Malachi slammed his shut, covered Tia's with his hand. Is it so hard to find the bed in this place? We were in a hurry. Gideon grabbed for jeans and had them nearly to his knees before he realized they were Cleo's. Just hold on. Cackling with laughter now, Cleo tossed Gideon his pants, then snagged his shirt for herself. It's okay, we're getting married. Married? Tia shoved Malachi's hand aside and, caught up in the thrill, rushed over to hug Cleo. This is wonderful. It's just wonderful. Oh, oh, you can have a double wedding. You and Gideon and Rebecca and Jack, a double wedding. Wouldn't that be fabulous? It's a thought. 
Cleo peeked around Tia at Malachi, who was staring hard at the ceiling. Aren't you going to congratulate me, welcome me to the bosom of the Sullivans and all that jazz? This isn't the time to mention bosoms. Put some clothes on. I can't come over there when you're naked. I'm only mostly naked. With Gideon's shirt skimming her thighs, Cleo got up, walked to him. Is this cool with you, Mr. Head of the Family? He looked down and, relieved the shirt was buttoned, took her face in his hands, kissed both her cheeks. I couldn't have chosen better for him myself. Now I'm begging you, put some pants on. Thanks, and I will. I really need to talk to Tia a minute. We've got a lot to tell you about Anita and what's about to happen. Just five minutes, she whispered. Please, take Slick up on the roof for a smoke, a man-to-man -man or something. Five minutes, he agreed. It's all in the timing now. He signaled his brother. Up on the roof. I need my shirt. Well, you're not having the one she's wearing and sending me into another heart attack. Your jacket's good enough. Obliging. Gideon pulled his jacket over his bare chest. I haven't kissed her yet. So he did, warmly enough to have Malachi looking at the ceiling again. I'll be back. I'm counting on it. When the door shut behind them, Cleo sighed. Wow, who'd have thought? She walked back to Tia, dropped down on the floor. Have a seat. Curious, Tia sat on the rug facing her. Is anything wrong? No, definitely not. Don't cry, okay, because I'll get all choked up. I just want to say, okay, I'm going to get choked up anyway, so... She took a deep, cleansing breath. I've been thinking about stuff. Takes some longer than you to get down there. You're the brainy one. No, I'm not. Sure you are. Tia, you're like deep. I am? You get stuff. You see the connections and the layers and... Hell, all that neat shit. That's part of what I was thinking about. If it wasn't for the fates, you and me, we wouldn't be sitting here on the floor together right now. We didn't exactly circle the same wheel. Anyway, I think about what happened to Mikey, and that's hard. Part of me feels lousy because I'm so fucking happy. I know, that's stupid, she said, even before Tia could speak. I'm working on it. Anyway, it's like the things I've heard you say. Threads and... What is it, lots? The apportioning of lots. Lachesis. Yeah, that one was mine. I never figured this would be my lot, you know? Having a friend like you, having somebody like Gideon love me, and the rest of them like a family. I, I never figured that kind of thing was in the cards for me. I'm not going to screw it up. Of course you're not. I've screwed up plenty before. I guess I could figure I was meant to. It's weird, thinking that I swiped a pair of Levi's when I was 16 or tanked a history test so I could get here, mostly naked on your living room floor, sniveling because there's this great man up on the roof who loves me. She shoved her hair behind her shoulders, swallowed back the tears. I guess I'd better get my pants on before Malachi comes back in and goes ballistic. She reached for her jeans, stopped. There is one more thing. I was wondering if you'd stand up for me, like the maid of honor deal when we get married. Oh, Cleo. Tia threw her arms around her, hugged tight, and blubbered. I'd love to. I'm so happy. I'm so happy for you. Jeez. Sniffling, Cleo hugged back. I feel like such a girl. At precisely 7.30... Anita walked into Jean-Georges. Though she had dressed with meticulous care and in Valentino, she didn't bother with the ploy of keeping her date waiting. She turned toward the bar, noted that Jasper was in place, and enjoyed the idea of this being Malachi Sullivan's last meal. The bastard thought he had her by the throat, ordering her to meet him in this upscale and very public restaurant so that he could lay out the terms of the deal. She'd play him through to coffee and dessert. Then he was going to find out who held the cards. She was greeted by name and showed to the window table where Malachi was already waiting. He was wise, she noted, to sit with his back to the wall. Not that it would help him. He got to his feet, 
took her hand and brought it to within an inch of his lips. Anita, you look very well for a hissing viper. And you clean up decently for a second-rate tour guide with delusions of grandeur. Well, now that the pleasantries are over. He took his seat, gestured so that the waiter poured the champagne waiting on ice. It seems appropriate that we have this meeting in pleasant surroundings. No need for business dealings to be uncomfortable after all. You didn't bring your little tart. He sampled the wine, approved it. Which little tart would that be? Cleo Tolliver, I'm surprised at you. I credited you with more taste than that. She's nothing but a professional slut. Don't be jealous, darling. In the slut department, she can't hold a candle to you. The waiter cleared his throat and continued to pretend he'd been born deaf. Would you care to hear about this evening's specials? Absolutely. Malachy leaned back. He listened and, before the waiter could slip away to give them time to consider, ordered grandly for both of them. You take a great deal for granted, Anita said coldly, when they were alone again. True enough. You broke into my house. Someone broke into your house? He feigned surprise. Well, then, call the Garda. I should say police. And what, I wonder, would you tell them was taken? While she steamed, he reached down and lifted an attaché case. I thought you might like to see all the pretty silver ladies in a row. He handed her a large color printout of a digital photo his sister had taken only hours before. Beautiful, aren't they? Rage wanted to choke her. Greed trembled straight down to her fingertips. What do you want? Oh, a great many things. A long, healthy life, a fine, faithful dog, and an embarrassing amount of money. But we don't want to discuss that on an empty stomach. I've individual photos as well for you to study. I want you to rest assured you'll get what you pay for. She studied each photo, and at every new angle she increased the pain level she'd make him suffer before she killed him. She laid the photographs in her lap when their appetizers were served. How did you get into my house, into my personal safe? You're giving a lot of credit to a, what was it, second-way tour guide. And I must take exception to that estimation, Anita, as you've yet to take a Sullivan tour. We're quite justifiably proud of our little family business. Anita speared a sautéed mushroom. Maybe I should have gone after your mother. Though his blood ran cold, Malachy kept his calm. She'd fry you up for breakfast, and serve the leftovers to the neighbor's cat. But let's not get personal. You were asking me a question. You want to know how it happened I recovered what it was you stole from me. I don't believe you called the police, either. I made it easy for you, no mistake there. Foolish of me, believing you to be a reputable businesswoman, and handing the fate over to you for, yes, testing and appraisal it was. Lessons learned... He sampled a bite of crab meat. You judged that one correctly. How could I go to the authorities accusing the respected owner of the renowned Morningside Antiquities of stealing from a client, and stealing what, by all accounts, was at the bottom of the Atlantic? And now, he said, while the waiter moved in silently to top off their wine glasses, it seems you're in a similar fix. Tough to make a public complaint about losing what should never have been in your possession in the first place. You couldn't have gotten in, not to Morningside or my house, without help. Puzzle that one out, he said, and you'll know I'm not without friends. By the way, Cleo sends her regards, her very low regards. Just think, if you'd paid her price, made a legitimate deal at that point, our positions might be reversed now. He leaned closer, and all his fake humor was gone. The man you had killed... Michael Hicks was his name, and his friends called him Mikey. She grieves for him. You're fortunate, Anita, that I can convince her to deal with you now. Anita nudged her appetizer aside, picked up her wine. My employee, former employee, was under instructions to extract information. He got carried away. It's hard to get competent help in some areas. And did you get carried away when you put the bullets into your former employee... 
No. She watched him over the sparkling edge of the crystal flute. I pulled the trigger with a steady, easy hand. You'd be wise to remember that and to understand how I deal with people who disappoint me. She picked up the attaché case, slid the photos in as the waiter returned with the salad course. May I keep this? Of course. I'll tell you what I understand. You don't consider two lives too high a price to pay for what you want. I'm sure you won't find the price I ask out of your reach either, and that would be ten million cash. Anita gave a sour laugh, even as her pulse jumped. So little, she thought. The man was a complete fool. At auction, she could command double that, more considerably more with the right publicity. Do you actually think I'm going to pay you ten million dollars? I do, yes. Three for each lady and one for good measure. So you see, the price Cleo asked for Lachesis before you had her friend beaten to death was a rare bargain that won't come round again. Oh, and here's the topper. Malachy broke apart a roll. He knew Mikey did, where the fate was being kept, and had the means to get it. What does that say to you, Anita? She laid a hand on her purse. Imagine pulling out the pistol she'd put inside it, just in case, and emptying it into Malachy Sullivan's smug face. It says to me that Mr. Dubrowski deserved what he got. I'll be handling my own negotiations from now on. Then I should tell you straight off our asking price isn't negotiable. So let's not spoil this lovely meal with wrangling. We considered asking for a great deal more, letting you counter and doing the back and forth business. But really, we've come too far for such petty behaviour, haven't we? You want them? I have them. That's the price. He bit into the roll he'd buttered. You'll parlay them for a tidy profit, reap considerable glory on Morningside and yourself. Everyone wins, even if I agree to the price that much in cash. Cash is the currency, or I should say, electronic cash. Simpler all around, very little paperwork to contend with. I'll give you two days to make the arrangements. Two days? That's time enough for a canny woman like you. Thursday, eleven o'clock. You transfer the funds to the account I'll give you at that time. Once it's done, I give you Clotho, Lachesis, and Atropus. And I'm supposed to trust you to hold up your end, really, Malachy? He pursed his lips. That's a problem, isn't it? Still. I'm trusting you to make the arrangements and not have a couple of Rottweilers standing by to tear out my throat and take the prize from my cold dead hand. That's why we'll make the exchange in a public and civilized arena, the New York Public Library. I'm sure you've heard of it, the one on Fifth Avenue and Fortieth Street. Grand marble lions out front. They have an extensive section on mythology. It seems quite apt to me. I need time to think about it. A way to contact you. You have till eleven on Thursday to think about it. As for contact to me, well, there's no need. Those are the terms. If they don't suit you, they're sure to suit someone else. Say Wiley's, the library, the main reading room on the third floor. Excuse me a minute, won't you, darling? I'm just going to make use of the facilities. He strolled out through the doors that led to the restrooms and the bar, and kept right on walking. Leaving Anita stuck with the check. That went well, he said into the mic fixed to the underside of his lapel. Well enough, his sister agreed. We're circling back around. We'll pick you up on the east corner. Cleo wants you to know she's very disappointed you didn't hang through it and bring back a doggy bag. He chuckled, headed toward the corner, then felt the honed point of a knife jab at his side, just along his kidney. Just keep walking, pal. Jasper's voice was low and even as he gripped Malachy's arm in his free hand. And keep in mind, I can jam this into you, slice out a good chunk, and nobody but me's going to know the difference. If you're after what's in my wallet, you're going to be very disappointed. We're going to get in a car half a block up and go to a nice quiet place I've got all ready for you. Have a nice quiet talk. Talking works for me. Why don't we find a bar and do it over a friendly drink? I said keep walking. Malachy bit back a hiss as the knife slid through jacket and shirt and into flesh. That's going to be hard to do if you keep jabbing at me with that pig sticker. 
Well, now, Gideon said pleasantly as he came up behind them, this is a dilemma. You push that knife into my brother and I shoot you dead. Hardly anyone's going to be happy with that eventuality. Shoot him anyway. He's fucked up my best suit. That doesn't seem quite fair. What do you think, Jack? Spill the guy's guts out over the sidewalk. City employees have to clean it up. That means higher taxes for me. He held out a hand. But if you don't take that knife out of my friend there and give it to me hilt first, I'm willing to pay. This time, when the tip of the steel slid out of his side, Malachy couldn't hold back the hiss. Fuck me! Did you have to take so bloody long? Let's have the hardware, too. Jack moved in, smiling cheerfully, and, in a move that looked like a friendly embrace, slid the gun from beneath Jasper's jacket and under his own. Are you all right, Mal? Oh, I'm fucking dandy. He pressed a hand to his bleeding side. What the hell were you going to shoot him dead with? Gideon held up Tia's inhaler behind Jasper's back. Oh, perfect. I owe my flaming life to hypochondria. He spotted the van, turned to Jasper, and showed his teeth in a sneering smile. We'll have that nice, quiet talk now. He wrenched open the cargo doors, hauled himself in. Tia leaped toward him, sobbing his name, but he held up a hand. One minute. First things first. As soon as they'd shoved Jasper in behind him, Malachy plowed a fist into his face. Oh, that's fine. That's good. Wincing, Malachy flexed his fingers. A broken hand will take my mind off the fact that I'm bleeding to death. Shocked steady, Tia eased him into a chair. Cleo, drive to Jack's. You keep that horrible man down at that end, she ordered Gideon. Jack, do you have a first aid kit in here? Glove box. Rebecca, I'm getting it. Despite the pain and the extra jolt of it when she tugged his jacket off, Malachy grinned up at her. You're a wonder, you are. Give us a kiss. Be quiet. Be still. Though her head spun sickly as she saw the blood spreading low on his shirt, she tore it open. She shot one fulminating look toward Jasper, now cuffed and gagged in the rear corner of the van. You should be ashamed of yourself. He should go to the hospital. He should really go see a doctor, don't you think? Pacing Jack's living room, Tia wrung her hands. The cut was awfully deep. If Jack and Gideon hadn't gotten there in time, if that man had gotten Malachy into the car, if a pig had two heads, he'd have two brains. Here now. Eileen held out a tumbler with three generous fingers of patties. Drink this. Oh, well, I don't really drink. And whiskey... Well, I used to, sometimes, take just a little sip of some before one of my lectures, but it's not... Tia, chill. At Cleo's order, Tia shuddered, nodded, then took the glass and downed every drop. That's a girl. Eileen approved. Now you sit down. I'm too frazzled to sit. Mrs. Sullivan... Eileen, don't you think he needs to be seen by a doctor? You patched him up just fine. The boys had worse wrestling with his brother. Here now, Rebecca's brought you a nice clean blouse. Clean. Baffled, Tia glanced down, saw the blood smeared over her shirt. Uh-oh, she managed as her eyes started to roll back. No, you don't. None of that now. Eileen spoke briskly and pushed her into a chair. No woman who can mop a man up in a moving van is going to faint away at the sight of a bit of second-hand blood. You're not so silly. Tia blinked to clear her vision. Really? You did great, Cleo told her. I mean, you kick serious ass. She was brilliant, Rebecca agreed. Here, change your shirt now, Tia darling. And we'll soak your nice blouse and see if we can get the blood out of it. Do you think they're going to beat him up? Tia wondered. Ugly mean guy? Cleo passed the stained blouse to Rebecca. Sure hope so. It was being debated downstairs with some heat, with Jasper in the unfortunate position of being tied to a chair and listening to the arguments pro and con. I say we kick his ass, break a few important bones, then talk to him. Jack shook his head, took the hammer Malachy was thumping rhythmically on the counter, set it aside. Three to one. Doesn't seem quite fair. Oh, we want fair, do we? Enjoying himself, 
Malachy stormed over and kicked Jasper's chair. And was he being fair, I'd like to know, when he fucking stabbed me right out on the street? Mal's got a point, Jack. Gideon popped cashews out of a bowl and into his mouth. Bastard stuck a knife in my brother who was unarmed at the time. That's just not right. Maybe we should let Mal stab him. Not fatally or anything such as that. Just one good jab to even the score, so to speak. Yeah, look at this. Mal lifted an arm, showing off the bandage riding just above his waistband. And what about my suit? That's another factor. The shirt, too. Big, gaping holes in both, as well as in my person. I know you're upset. Can't blame you. But the guy was just doing his job, isn't that right? Jack flipped open the wallet they'd taken off him, as if to check the name again. Marvin? Marvin let out a choked sound around his gag. Well, his flaming job stinks, Malachy ranted, and I'd think a good thrashing was just one of the employment risks in the field. Let's try this. Let's talk to the poor bastard first, see if he cooperates. If you're not satisfied, Jack gave Malachy a friendly pat on the back. We'll beat the shit out of him. I get first shot. I want to break the fingers on the hand he used to stab me one knuckle at a time. The men looked at each other, back at Jasper, whose eyes were bulging and were satisfied they'd played their parts well. Jack walked over, tugged down the gag. Okay, you got the picture. My associates here want to take some pieces out of you. Me, I'm a fan of democracy and majority rules. You want to avoid that vote, you'll cooperate. Otherwise, I turn them loose, and when we're done, we dump you on Anita's doorstep. She'll finish you off. Gid, play back that one part of the tape, you know, where she's telling Mao how she deals with unsatisfactory employees. Gideon walked over to the recorder, turned on the tape he'd already queued up. Anita's voice, cold as death, filled the room as she spoke about steadily, easily putting bullets into a man. We'll make sure she gets the opportunity with you, Jack told him. The three of us, we might cause you some pain, but we're not cold-blooded killers. We'll leave that part to the expert. What the hell do you want? You tell us everything you know. Don't spare the details. And when the time comes, you're going to tell the whole thing to a friend of mine who happens to be a cop. You think I'm going to talk to the cops? I've seen your sheet, Marvin. It won't be the first time. Nobody's got you on murder yet. You want her to give her the chance to twist it around so you can take the fall for Dabrowski for Michael Hicks? Jack waited a beat. That's what she'll do if you don't get there first and have us backing you up. Or we just step back and let her do to you what she did to Dabrowski. Better prison than the morgue, Malachy put in. You should know we've got our little dance on the sidewalk on tape as well. So we can turn it and you over to the police now and be done with it. And you don't have the edge of going in with... What is it, Jack? Remorse. Remorse and cooperation. You won't have that opening with the police. With Anita still free and with money at her fingertips, how long do you think it would take her to hire someone to terminate your employment on a permanent basis when you're behind bars? I want a deal. Jasper licked his lips. I want immunity. You'll have to take that up with my friend with the badge, Jack told him. I'm sure he'll be happy to take your wants and needs into consideration. Now, Jack signaled Gideon to turn on the video recorder. Let's talk about what it's like to work for Anita Gay. Anita soaked in the tub, bubbles up to her chin. She imagined, even now, Malachy was being softened up. In the morning, when he'd had plenty of time to think and to suffer, she'd stop by and see him. He'd tell her exactly where he was keeping the fates, exactly where to find Cleo Tolliver, and he'd confirm if her conclusions were correct, and it had been Jack or someone working up her debt who'd help him get through her security. Then she'd deal with all of them personally. The candlelight glowed soothingly over her closed lids, and she picked up the phone she'd set on the ledge of the tub and answered her private line. Yes... I felt I should apologize for leaving so abruptly. The sound of Malachy's voice had her sitting straight up in the tub. Water and bubbles gushed over the rim and ran a river over the tiles. It was very rude of me, he went on. But I had what you might call a pressing engagement. In any case, I'm looking forward to seeing you Thursday. 
Eleven o'clock, remember. Oh, and one other thing. Mr. Jasper asked me to tell you he quits. When the click sounded in her ear, Anita let out a roar of frustration. She heaved the phone across the room where it smashed into the mirror. In the morning when the maid came in to tidy up, she would cluck her tongue and think of seven years' bad luck. Thirty. It would be, at its core, like any sort of play, largely dependent on staging, costumes, props, and the actor's zest for their roles. Since Cleo was the team expert on stage work, she took over as director. With Eileen standing in for Anita, Cleo rehearsed her cast mercilessly. Timing, people, it's all about the timing. Jack, cue. He mimed making the phone call that would set the ball rolling, then walked with Gideon to the elevator. I don't see why we have to go down again. We could just pretend to go down. Look, Slick, I'm directing this show. Get moving. He stepped into the elevator with Jack. Good luck, Tia called out and shrugged. Well, that's what I'd say to them if this was real. See? Cleo folded her arms. Tia knows how to rehearse. Okay, Cleo began. We figure it's 8.15 and time passes. Two of the three prongs are being set. The rest of us wait here, enjoying a nutritious breakfast, until Gideon gets back. Clock's ticking, clock's ticking, and where the hell is he? We'd all be pacing around like cats in a cage and drinking too much coffee, Rebecca put in as she flipped a page in one of her bridal magazines. Oh, Ma, look at this dress. This may be the one. She's not your mother. She's the dreaded and dastardly Anita Gay. Stay in character, Cleo insisted, then turned as Gideon opened the elevator doors again. You're late, we were worried, blah, blah, and you tell us everything's aces. I would if you'd give me the chance. Actors are such children. She grabbed his shirt, jerked him forward for a kiss. Scene change, she announced. Library, interior, time, 10.30. Places, people. It was raining hard when Malachi stepped out of the cab in front of the New York Public Library. The sheets of wet and the traffic it snarled had put them slightly behind schedule. The weather gave him a little pang of homesickness. It was nearly over now, he thought, as he climbed up the stairs between the lions known as patience and fortitude. Nearly time to go home again and pick up the threads of his life, the old and the new. He wondered what pattern they would make together. He stepped inside, into the cathedral-like grandeur and quiet. It was his second visit, as a dress rehearsal sort of business had been demanded of him. He still wondered at the fact that such a huge and stately library should have no books in its entranceway. He scooped a hand through his hair, scattering wet, then, as planned, took the stairs instead of the elevator to the third floor. No one seemed to take any particular notice of him. There were those who sat at table studying or simply browsing through books. Some tapped away at laptops, others scrawled notes on pads. Still others roamed the stacks. As planned, he filled out a call sheet for the book Tia had deemed most appropriate and took it to the proper reference desk. He liked the smell of the place, of books and wood, and people come in out of the rain. Another time he'd have enjoyed just the being there. And though Gideon was the keenest reader in the family, Malachi would have found pleasure in simply choosing a book and settling down with it in this palace of literature. He walked by where Gideon was, even now, sitting with his nose in a copy of To Kill a Mockingbird. Gideon turned a page in Scout's lyrical narrative, signaling the go-ahead. They'd considered the fact that Anita would have had enough time to hire a replacement for Jasper, and that her temper might have pushed her to find someone willing to kill an unarmed man in a library. The odds were small enough, as she'd lose her best chance for the fates. And though it was a risk Malachi was willing to take, the back of his neck prickled as he walked through the stacks. He found a quiet table, glanced idly around the area, his gaze passing over Rebecca's head as she bent over her laptop nearby. Within twenty minutes, a pretty young page delivered his requested book. Then Malachi settled down to wait. At Morningside... 
having spent an hour reviewing security tapes provided by Burdett. Detective Lou Gilbert was already interviewing clerks regarding three particular items of inventory that had gone missing. Downtown, Jasper was angling for a deal with the D.A. At the wheel of a van chugging through the rain and pissy traffic on Fifth, Cleo tapped her fingers to the bare-naked ladies and waited to give Tia her cue. Malachi heard the click of heels, caught the whiff of expensive scent, and looked up from his book. Hello, Anita. I've just been reading about my ladies. Fascinating females. Did you know they sing their prophecies? A kind of mythological girl group. Where are they? Oh, safe and sound. I beg your pardon, where are my manners? He rose, pulled out a chair. Sit down, won't you? Such a wet day out. It makes a grand place like this almost cozy. I want to see them. But she sat, crossed her legs, folded her hands. It would be business, she reminded herself, for now. You can hardly think I'd pay your exorbitant fee without first examining the merchandise. You examined one of them before, and look where that got us, right? You sent some very impolite men after my brother. I'm very fond of my brother. I only regret I didn't send them after you with less restrained orders. Well, live and learn. There was no need to have that friend of Cleo's killed. He wasn't involved. She involved him. It was business, Malachi, just business. This isn't the Godfather. Business, Anita, would have been meeting Cleo's price for her fate. If you had dealt squarely, you'd have had it in your hand right now, and perhaps even the third one. As it is, you've blood on your hands. Spare me the lecture. If you dealt squarely with me, he continued, instead of letting greed get in the way of good judgment, you'd have all three for a fraction of what you'll pay me now. You started this thread, Anita, when you stole from me and my family. You wanted to get laid. I let you fuck me, then I fucked you over. No point in whining about it. Right you are. I'm just explaining to you why we're sitting here as we are. Ten million. Have you made the arrangements? You'll get the money. But not until I've seen the fates. The transfer is ready to go. Once I verify you have what you claim to have, I'll call and put it through to your account. One more item of business before we start. Should you, after we complete the transaction, feel compelled to get some of your own back by bringing harm to any member of my family, to Cleo, to me for that matter, take into consideration that I've documented everything, everything, Anita, and have that documentation in a safe place in the event of my untimely death. She gave a short laugh. How trite. Trite, but true. You'll get what you earn for the money. And that will be that. Agreed. A woman who had spent a dozen years married to a man who'd revolted her in bed and bored her out of it knew how to be patient. Patient enough, she thought, to wait years if need be, to implement just the right sort of tragic accident. I'm here, aren't I? Let me see them. He sat back and, keeping his eyes on hers, lifted a hand. Gideon walked over to the table, set a black briefcase between them. I don't believe you've actually met my brother. Gideon, Anita Gay. Anita laid a hand on the case, looked up. So you get to be gopher, she said in a silky tone. Tell me, don't you mind sharing your whore with your brother? We're very big on sharing in my family. Just as well Mal didn't get around to sharing you with me. You're a bit old for my taste. Now, now, let's mind our manners. Malachi gestured at the case. This is too public for an examination. Here or not at all. In a bad-tempered move, Anita tried to open the case. It's locked. So it is. Gideon's tone was cheerful. Combination is 7-5-15. The date... The Lusitania sank. Anita set the combination, clicked the lock, opened the lid. Nestled in foam padding, the fates looked up placidly. Lifting the first, Anita examined it. She remembered well the feel, the weight, the shape of Clotho. 
the satin texture of her silver skirt, the complicated coil of her hair over her shoulder, the delicacy of the spindle in her hand. She replaced it and lifted Lachesis. There were subtle differences. This dress had a different drape, leaving the curve of one shoulder bare. The gleaming hair was done up in a kind of crown. Her right hand held the end of a tape pulled out of the measuring rule she held in her left. There were notches and Greek numerals etched on the tape. Anita's heart began to thud as she set the second fate back in its bed and took out the third. Atropus was slightly, very slightly shorter than her sister's, and so agreed the legend. Her face was softer, somehow kinder. She held her tiny scissors in clasped hands between her breasts. She wore sandals, the strap of the left crisscrossing twice before disappearing under the flow of her skirts. Every detail agreed with documented descriptions. The workmanship was magnificent. And more, much more, there was a sense of power that pulsed from them. A kind of quiet underbeat that seemed to echo in Anita's head. She would, at that moment, have paid anything, done anything to have them. Satisfied? Malachi asked her. A visual exam is hardly satisfactory. She continued to hold Atropus. Certain tests need to be— Malachi plucked the fate from her fingers— Set it inside the case with the sisters. We've gone that route once. Take it or leave it here and now. He closed the case, even as she tried to reach out and stop him, and locked it. You can hardly expect me to pay you ten million after a two-minute look. He kept his voice hushed, as hers was. Reasonable, as hers was. It's all you had when first I showed you Clotho. And you knew, just as you know now. Transfer the money, and you can walk out with them. He took the case off the table as he spoke, put it on the floor at his feet. Or don't, and I walk out with them and sell them elsewhere. I've a suspicion Wiley's would pay the price, and happily. She opened her purse. Malachi closed a hand over her wrist as she reached inside. Slowly, darling and his hand stayed on her wrist until she'd pulled out her phone. Do you really think I'd take out a gun and shoot you in cold blood in a public place? Everything but the public place fits you as perfectly as that lovely suit you're wearing. He closed her handbag himself, then eased back. If you think I'm that ruthless, I'm surprised you didn't go to Wiley's in the first place. I figure there's fewer questions and explanations, some of which might be sticky between you and me. Tell your brother to stop hulking over me. She snapped and punched in a number when Gideon faded back. This is Anita Gay. I'm ready to transfer the funds. Malachi took a folded piece of paper from his pocket, spread it on the table in front of her. She relayed the information on it. No, she said. I'll call you back. She laid the phone on the table. The transfer's being done. I want the fates. And you'll have them. He nudged the case farther out of her reach. When I verified the money's in my account. From a nearby table, Rebecca answered an email from Jack, sent another to Tia, then continued monitoring the numbered account. It's a lot of money, Malachi. What do you plan to do with it? We've all manner of plans. You'll have to come to Cove sometime, see for yourself just how we've put it to use. And you, what will you do? Start right up on turning a tidy profit, or take a bit of time off to enjoy your acquisition? Business first, always. Now, Gideon thought, as he watched his sister lower the screen of her laptop, it was all in the timing. They'd soon see how well Cleo had choreographed the scene. He tucked his thumbs in his belt loops, tapped his fingers on the front pockets of his jeans. On cue... Malachi glanced over. Well, for Christ's sake, he said and frowned at Anita. We've company. Let me handle her. Who? Tia. Malachi let the warmth pour into his voice as he got to his feet. What a happy coincidence. M Malachi. She stuttered a little 
and it was the excitement of the moment as much as the part she was playing that brought the flush to her cheeks. I didn't know you were back in New York. Only just. I was going to ring you later today. Now you've saved me the price of the call. He leaned in, pressed his cheek to hers, and lifted his brows at Anita. I just came in to do some research on my book. She clutched her briefcase to her breasts. I never expected to. Tia trailed off, looked startled. Anita? Of course, you know each other. Malachi's voice lifted, with just enough of a frantic edge to have heads turning irritably in their direction. I asked Miss Gay to meet me here to discuss, uh, to discuss a potential purchase for my offices. Oh, I, I see. She looked from one face to the other, her eyes wide and hurt, as if she did see, and very well. Well, I, I, I don't mean to interrupt. As I said, I was just. Oh, are you reading about the fates? She leaned over a bit clumsily to turn the book and effectively blocked Anita's view. Rebecca strolled up, switched cases smoothly, and continued by the table. She spared a quick wink for Gideon, gripped firmly the handle of the briefcase that held the fates, and walked out of the reading room toward the stairs and down. Just passing the time. Malachi tapped Anita's phone when he saw the call light blinking. I think you've a call coming in, Anita. Excuse me. She picked up the phone. Anita Gay. I uh should get back to work. Tia stepped back. It was nice to see you again, Malachi. It, it was well goodbye. Shattered her maiden's dreams, laughing lightly. Anita disconnected the call. The transfer's complete, so she reached down for the case, and for the second time, Malachi closed a hand over her wrist. Not quite so fast, darling. I'll just verify that for myself. He took out his own phone and, as if to confirm what Rebecca had already verified, called Cleo in the van. I need to confirm an electronic transfer of funds, he stated curtly. Yes, I'll wait. Rebecca's just getting in the van. Jack should be at Anita's with Detective Gilbert. They got the search warrant. Yes, thank you. I'll give you the account number. Mal, Rebecca, Jack emailed me from his Palm Pilot. His friend Detective Robbins is going to bring Anita in for questioning on the murders. He should be at Morningside by now. With the other cop at her house, she's nowhere to go. And here's Tia now, just coming out of the library. Excellent. Thank you very much. He tucked his phone back in his pocket. That seems to be that. He got to his feet, handing her the briefcase. I can't say it's been a pleasure. You're a fool, Malachi. Anita rose. Worse, you're a fool who thinks small. I'll turn what's in this case into the biggest story in a decade, hell, in a century. Enjoy your ten million. Before I'm done, that'll be petty cash. A nasty piece, that one. Gideon commented as she clipped away. Oh well, ever since that house fell on her sister, she's been out of sorts. Let's give her a minute or two to start up her broomstick before we go see all our girls. The broomstick might have been a New York City cab, but Anita was very near cackling. Everything she wanted—money, power, position, fame, respect—was tucked in the briefcase beside her. It was Paul's money that had brought her this far. But it would be hers that took her the rest of the way. She was now as far away from that row house in Queens as she had ever been. Inspired, she flipped out her phone to call her butler and arrange for champagne and caviar to be waiting for her in their sitting room. Good afternoon, Morningside residents. This is Miss Gay. Haven't I told you Stipes or Fitzhugh is to answer the telephone? Yes, Miss Gay. I'm sorry, Miss Gay, but both Mr. Stipes and Mrs. Fitzhugh are with the police. What do you mean with the police? The police are here, ma'am. They brought a search warrant. Have you lost your mind? Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. I heard them say something about an insurance claim and some items from Morningside. The excitement in the girl's voice was palpable. Anita couldn't know the internal war being waged between admitting to listening at the door and risking being fired or passing on the information. 
What are they doing? Where are they? In the library, ma'am. They went into your safe and they found things. Things that were supposed to be stolen from the store. That's ridiculous. That's impossible. That's. And the pieces began to fall, to shuffle into place. The son of a bitch. The son of a bitch. She tossed the phone aside and, with trembling fingers, unlocked the briefcase. Inside were three puppets. Even through the haze of fury, she recognized Mo, Larry, and Curly. She won't appreciate the full irony of the Three Stooges. Gideon reached over and stole the slice of pizza out of Cleo's hand. It's a pie in the face. The point's clear enough, even to her. I never understood the humor. I'm sorry, Tia said when all three men stared at her. All that eye poking and head bashing. It's a guy thing, Jack told her. They should have her downtown by now, he added, checking his watch. Her lawyers can dance till they drop, but they're not going to tap their way around the insurance fraud. And Mikey? Jack looked back at Cleo. Jasper gave them chapter and verse. The courts may look dubiously on a guy with his sheet, but the phone records will back up the connection. Start welding those links together. You've got a hell of a chain to wrap around her neck. She's accessory before and after the fact. She'll pay for Mikey. She'll pay for it all. Thinking of her in that really ugly orange jumpsuit, nasty color with her hair, brightens my day. Cleo lifted her beer. Here's to us. It was a hell of a party. Gideon rose, rolled his shoulders. I've got to go out. Where are we going? You're not invited. He leaned down to tap Cleo's nose. I'm taking Mal and Ma so I can have both male and female advice on a proper ring. You're getting me a ring? Aw, oh, you traditional sap. She leaped to her feet to kiss him. Then I'm going too. I should pick it out since I'm the one who's going to wear it. You're not going, and I'm picking it out as I'm the one giving it to you. That's pretty strict, but I think I can live with it. We'll walk down with you. Jack took Rebecca's hand. We'll head downtown, see what we can wheedle out of Bob on the status. He might be able to resist me, but he won't be able to resist Irish face to face. A fine idea. Rebecca snagged her jacket. When we're done, we'll make reservations at some hideously expensive restaurant. We'll have the mother of all celebration dinners. We'll just help Tia clean this mess up. No, that's all right. I'd rather know what's going on quicker, and I want to see Cleo's ring. Me too. Cleo stretched on the sofa. Enough that I'll help clean up. Don't be afraid to go for gaudy. She told Gideon, "I can live with it." When she was alone with Tia, Cleo rolled over on her stomach, crossed her legs in the air. "Sit down a minute. Those pizza boxes aren't in a hurry. If I keep busy, it won't seem like so long before everyone's back. You know, I've eaten more pizza in the past month than I have in my whole life. Stick with me, and you'll discover all the joys of fast food. I never thought I'd enjoy having crowds of people in my apartment, but I do." It never seems quite right when they're not around. I was just wondering if you and Mal were going to go for it too. Go for what? She looked at the three fates, even now standing among empty bottles and pizza boxes. We've already gone for it, haven't we? No, I mean, you know, till death do you part. Oh, we haven't talked about it. I imagine he's anxious to get home to get back to the family business. To figure out what to do with his share of things, maybe after, maybe in time he'll feel more settled, and we'll talk about it. Time's part of it, isn't it? Cleo lifted Clotho. Seems to me, for all the fate and destiny stuff, sometimes you have to do the job yourself. Why don't you ask him? Him to what? To, to marry me? I couldn't. He's supposed to ask me. Why? Because he's the man. Yeah, yeah. So what? You love him. You want him. So you ask him. Then we can plan a triple wedding. Strikes me like that's how all this was meant to shake down. Ask him. The idea rolled around in Tia's brain before she shook her head. I'd never have the nerve. When the phone rang, she carried empty boxes into the kitchen and picked up the nested portable on the counter. Hello. Doing research, you bitch. 
A whip snap of ice slapped up Tia's spine. Excuse me? What did he promise you? True love, devotion? You won't get it. I don't understand. She walked quickly back into the living room, signaled Cleo. Is this Anita? Don't play dumb with me. Game's over. I want the fates. I don't know what you're talking about. She tipped the phone so Cleo could bump heads with her and listen. If you don't, it's going to be very sad about your mother. My mother? Tia jolted up straight, instinctively gripping Cleo's hand. What about my mother? She's not feeling well, not well at all, are you, Alma? Tia! The voice was weak and thick with tears. Tia, what's happening? Tell her what I'm doing right now, Alma, dear. She's... Tia, she's holding a gun to my head. I think, I think she shot Tilly. Oh, God. Oh, my God, I can't breathe. Anita, don't hurt her. She doesn't know anything. She's not involved in this. Everyone's involved. Is he there with you? No, Malachi's not here. I swear to you, he's not here. I'm alone. Then come alone to your mommy's house. We'll have a nice cozy chat. You've got five minutes, so you'd better run. Five minutes, Tia, or I shoot her. Don't, please. I'll do anything you want. You're wasting time, and she doesn't have much. Even as the phone clicked in her ear, Tia was tossing it aside. I have to go now. I have to hurry. Jesus Christ, Tia, you can't go over there. You can't go by yourself. I have to. There's no time. We'll call Gideon. Malachi, we'll call Jack. Cleo muscled Tia away from the door. Think, damn it, think. You can't go rushing over there. We need the cops. I have to. She's my mother. She's terrified. Maybe already hurt. Five minutes. I only have five minutes. She's my mother. Tia repeated, pushing Cleo aside. Stall her. Cleo rushed out the door behind Tia. Stall her. I'll get help. Tia called out her mother's address and ran. She hadn't known she could run that fast, that she could streak through the rain like a snake through water. Drenched, terrified, and chilled to the bone, She hurled herself up the steps to her parents' door and, desperate, lifted a hand to beat on the wood. Her fist pounding, she pushed the door, already slightly ajar, open. Mother! We're up here, Tia! Anita's voice floated downstairs. Close and lock the door behind you. You just made it, you know. Thirty seconds to spare. Mother! She hesitated at the base of the stairs. Are you all right? She struck me. Alma began to weep. My face, Tia. Don't come up. Don't come upstairs. Run. Don't hurt her again. I'm coming. Tia gripped the banister hard and started up the steps. At the top, she turned and saw Tilly lying in the hallway, blood seeping into the rug beneath her. Oh, God, no. She rushed forward, threw herself down to check for a pulse. Alive, she thought, nearly weeping. Still alive. But for how long? If she stalled Anita long enough for help to come, Tilly might bleed to death. You're on your own, she thought. She ordered herself to get to her feet. And you will do whatever needs to be done. Tilly is badly hurt. Then your father will just have to call the agency and find another housekeeper. Get in here, Tia, before I start splattering your mother's blood in this overly rococo bedroom. Without taking time for one last prayer, Tia stepped into the doorway. She saw her mother tied in a chair, and behind her, Anita holding a gun to her already bruised temple. Hold your hands up, Anita ordered. Turn a slow circle. Look at this, she continued when Tia obeyed. She didn't even take time for a raincoat. Such daughterly devotion. I don't have a gun. I wouldn't know how to use one if I did. I can see that. Soaked to the skin. Come all the way inside. Tilly needs an ambulance. Anita lifted her brows, pushed the barrel of the gun more firmly against Alma's temple. Want to make it, too? No, please. She came to the door. Alma sobbed. Tilly let her in. She was coming up to tell me, and I heard that terrible sound. She shot poor Tilly, Tia. 
Then she came in here. She struck me. She tied me up. I used Hermes scarves, didn't I? Stop complaining, Alma. I don't know how you can stand this woman, Anita said to Tia. Seriously, I should put a bullet in her brain and do you a favor. If you hurt her, I won't have any reason to help you. Apparently, I judged you right on some level. She rubbed the barrel of the gun against Alma's bloodless cheek. I never would have figured you to lie, cheat, steal. Like you? Exactly. I want the fates. They won't help you. The police are at your house, at your business. They have warrants. Do you think I don't know that? Anita's voice pitched up like a child's about to throw herself into a tantrum. You think you're so clever, planting stolen merchandise in my safe. You think I'm worried about a little insurance fraud? They know you killed that man. First degree murder. They know you were paying him when he killed Mikey. Accessory to murder. Tia moved forward as she spoke. The fates won't help you with that. You get them and I'll worry about the rest. I want the statues and the money. Call that Irish prick and get them back or I kill her. Then you. She'll kill us all for them, Tia thought. Even if she were to hand them over to Anita now, she would still kill them all. And maybe, somehow, find some hole to hide in. He doesn't have them, I do, she said quickly, when Anita jerked her mother's head back with the barrel of the gun. My father wanted them. You know what a coup it would be. I wanted Malachi, so we tricked you out of the money. My father would buy them, I get Malachi, and Wiley's gets the fates. Not anymore. No. I don't want you to hurt my mother. I'll get you the fates and my share of the money. I'll try to get the rest. I'll get you the fates right now if you stop pointing the gun at my mother. You don't like it? How's this? Anita shifted her aim so the gun was pointed at Tia's heart. And seeing the gun aimed at her daughter, Alma began to scream. In an absent gesture, Anita wrapped the side of her fist against Alma's temple. Shut the fuck up, or I'll shoot both of you for the hell of it. Don't, don't hurt my Tia. You don't have to hurt anyone. I'll get them for you. Moving slowly, Tia eased toward her mother's dressing table. Do you think I'm stupid enough to believe they're in there? I need the key. Mother keeps the key to the lockbox in there. Tia. Mother. Tia shook her head. There's no use pretending anymore. She knows they're not worth dying for. Tia opened the drawer. Hold it. Step back. Gesturing with the gun, Anita moved forward as Tia stood by the open drawer. If there's a gun in there, I'm putting a bullet in Alma's kneecap. Please. As if staggering, Tia laid a hand on the vanity for balance and palmed a small bottle. Please don't. There's no gun. Anita used her free hand to riffle through the drawer. There's no key either. It's in there, right? She slammed the drawer on Anita's hand, then tossed the contents of the bottle in her face. The gun went off, plowing a hole in the wall an inch from Tia's head. Through the screams, her mother's, Anita's, her own, Tia leaped. The collision with Anita knocked the breath out of her, but flying on adrenaline, she didn't notice. But she felt, with a kind of primeval thrill, her own nails rake the flesh of Anita's wrist, and she scented blood. The gun spurted out of Anita's hand, skidded over the floor. They grappled for it, Anita clawing blindly as the smelling salts Tia had flung at her stung her eyes. A fist glanced off her cheek and made her ears ring. Her knee plowed into Anita's stomach more by accident than design. When their hands closed over the gun at the same time, when they rolled over the floor in a fierce, sweaty tangle, Tia did the only thing that came to mind— she got a handful of Anita's hair and yanked viciously. She didn't hear the glass shattering as they rammed into a table. She didn't hear the shouts from downstairs or the pounding of feet. All she heard was the blood roaring in her own head, the fury and elemental violence of it. For the first time in her life, she caused someone physical pain and wanted to cause more. You hit my mother! She gasped it out and, using Anita's hair as a rope, 
slammed her head over and over against the floor. Then someone was pulling her away. Teeth bared, hands fisted. Tia struggled as she stared down, watching Anita's bloodshot eyes roll back in her head. Gideon stepped over, picked up the gun, and Malachi turned the still-struggling Tia into his arms. Are you hurt? Jesus, Tia, there's blood on you. She kicked her ass. Cleo sniffled her way through a grin. Can't you see? She kicked her fat, sorry ass. Tilly! The adrenaline dumped out of her system and left her limbs feeling like water. Her voice was weak now, her head starting to spin. Ma's with her. She's ringing an ambulance. Here now, here now, darling. You're going to sit down. Gideon, help Mrs. Marsh there. I'll do it. She's frightened. Holding on, Tia stayed on her feet. Her knees wanted to buckle, her legs to give, but she took the first step. The second was easier. Get her out of here, please. Get Anita out of here. I'll take care of my mother. Stepping around, the unconscious Anita, Tia hurried over to untie her mother. You're not going to be hysterical, Tia ordered, pressing a kiss to her mother's bruised face as she dealt with the knots. You're going to lie down. I'm going to make you some tea. I thought she would kill you. I thought... She didn't. I'm perfectly fine, and so are you. Tilly, she's dead. She's not, I promise. Gently, Tia helped Alma to her feet. An ambulance is coming. Lie down now. Everything's going to be fine. That horrible woman. I never liked her. My head hurts. I know. Tia brushed Alma's hair back from her bruised temple, kissed it. I'll get you something for it. Tilly. Alma gripped Tia's hand. She's going to be all right. Tia leaned down, put her arms around her mother. Everything's going to be all right. You were very brave. I didn't know you could be so brave. Neither did I. To Tia's surprise, her mother insisted on going to the hospital with Tilly, and was just as forceful in sending Tia home again. She'll drive the doctors crazy, at least until my father gets there and calms her down. It shows a good heart. Eileen set a cup of tea in front of Tia. That she was more concerned with her friend than anything else. A good heart, she added, touching Tia's sore cheek, goes a long way. Drink your tea now so you're steady when you talk to those policemen. I will, thank you. She closed her eyes as Eileen left the room, then opened them and looked at Malachi. I never thought she could hurt you. I never thought she'd... I should have. It's no one's fault but hers. Look at you. He cupped her face gently. Bruises on your cheek and scratches as well. I wouldn't have had it, not for all the money in the world, not for the fates, not for justice. I wouldn't have had one mark on you. There are more on her, and I put them there. That you did. He lifted her to her feet to hold her. Smelling salts dead in the eyes. Who but you would think of it? It's done now, isn't it? All the way done? It is all the way done. Then, are you going to marry me? What? He eased away, slow and careful. What did you say? I asked if you're going to marry me or not. He let out a short laugh, raked a hand through his hair. I thought I would at being agreeable with you. As it happens, I was on the point of deciding on a ring when Cleo rang on Gideon's mobile. Go back and get it. Now. Tomorrow. She wrapped her arms around him and sighed. Tomorrow's just fine.
Epilogue Cove, Ireland, May 7, 2003 The deep water key at water's edge was unchanged from the time of the Lusitania, the Titanic, and the great grand ships that once plied the waters between America and Europe. Here, tenders from those ships had come to get mail and passengers from the Dublin train, which often arrived late. Though the quay still functioned as a train station, the Cove Heritage Center, with its displays and shops, ran through its main terminal. Recently, an addition had been added to serve as a small museum, with security by Burdett. The focal point of that museum were three silver statues known as the Three Fates. They gleamed behind their protective glass and looked out at the faces, perhaps the lives, of those who came to see and to study. They stood, united by their bases, on a marble pedestal, and in the pedestal was a brass plaque. The Three Fates On loan from the Sullivan Burdett Collection In memory of Henry W. and Edith Wiley Lorraine and Stephen Edward Cunningham III Felix and Margaret Greenfield Michael K. Hicks It's good. It's good that his name's on there. Cleo blinked back tears. It's good. Gideon draped his arm over her shoulders. It's right. We did what we could to make it right. I'm proud of you. Rebecca hooked her arm through Jack's. I'm proud to stand here beside you as your wife. You could have kept them. Nope. I got you. One goddess is enough for any man. A wise and true answer. It's time we went to the cemetery. Cleo. Yeah. She laid her fingers on the glass, just under Mikey's name. Let's go. We'll be right behind you, Malachi told them. Button up. He began doing up the buttons of Tia's jacket himself. It's windy out. You don't have to fuss. We're fine. Expectant fathers are allowed to fuss and fret. He laid a hand on her belly. Are you sure you want to walk? Yes, it's good for us. I can't sit in a bubble for the next six months, Malachi. Listen to her. Not a year ago you were barricaded against every germ known to man. That was then. She leaned her head on his shoulder. It's a tapestry. Threads woven in a life. I like the way my pattern's changing. I like standing here with you and seeing something we helped do shining in the light. You shine, Tia. Content. She laid her hand over his. We made justice. Anita's in prison probably for the rest of her life. The fates are together as they were meant to be. And so are we. So are we. She held out a hand and felt unreasonably strong when his linked with it. They caught up with the others and walked up the long hill in the May wind. We hope you have enjoyed our presentation of Three Fates by Nora Roberts. Copyright 2002 by Nora Roberts. Read by Bernadette Quigley. Performance Copyright 2002 by Brilliance Audio. All rights reserved. For further information concerning this program or other Brilliance Audio titles, please call the following toll-free number. 1-800-222-3225 or visit our website at www.brilliancaudio.com. No part of this recording may be played for an audience or reproduced in any form. It may not be streamed, downloaded, broadcast, or copied without written permission. Address all inquiries to Brilliance Audio, Post Office Box 887, Grand Haven, Michigan, 49417.